All right, so let's get started uh, in the interest of time. Okay, so let's get started. So welcome everyone to our tw uh, 2019 Data Science Symposium. Uh, this is going to be a two-day event, um, and I will tell you guys a few things about the logistics. Um, so you see the two mics there. When you ask questions, please do walk up to the mics, or we have, uh, and we will have one runner with one mic moving around the room. Uh, women's room outside this door, men's room outside that door. Um, so this is today's. Yeah. Um, right, so let me see. Yeah. So this is today's schedule. Oh, actually, tomorrow's. There, it's yeah. So, okay. So the schedule actually in, is in our program. <laughs> All right. So uh, first, uh, Dr. H. V. Jagadish will give the opening remarks. Uh, who is the director of Midas? and Professor of Computer Science and Eng Engineering. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Jing, and thank you all for coming. I wanted to uh, just take a few minutes to uh, tell you a little bit about Midas for uh, those of you who may not be familiar with it. So in terms of data science, this is a standard diagram to do Drew Conway. And the point I want to make is you've got data science methodology up top, which is statistics and computer science, and you've got disciplinary research at the bottom. And data science is at the intersection of these. But if you look at what this means in terms of uh, departments, uh, you'll, you'll find that you know, there are a number of topics that are part of data science methodology, um, but uh, there are far more things that uh, are of relevance in terms of application domains. And, and so if you map this to departments, you can see that the weight is all at the bottom. And, and so in terms of what we're trying to do at Midas, our mission statement, uh, I want to highlight the second yellow piece, which is a transformative use of data science in a wide range of disciplines. And so the methodologies might be drawn from statistics and, and computer science, information science, but the interesting stuff is when one applies this to various domains. And, um, and so with that as, as our basic uh, driving thing, we've uh, been uh, building a, a wide community of data scientists, uh, people interested in data science. And when we say we care about diversity, it's not just demographic diversity. There's, there's diversity in terms of how people interact with data science, what you're doing with it, what you're using it for, uh, how sophisticated or not your use of it is. Um, and I think irrespective of all of that, we want you to be part of, of Midas. As an example, we have a data science methods discussion board that we launched a couple of months ago. And this is, uh, this, think of it like a class bulletin board for somebody who's doing Python 100. Okay, so this is if you're just getting started, there's a support group. And, and, a, and a discussion board. And, and that's something that uh, it, is just easing people's paths into uh, using data science if they haven't been doing that. Uh, we have a number of events. We have our weekly seminar series that I, uh, I hope many of you are making use of. Uh, we have several symposia besides this big annual symposium. And uh, I encourage you to uh, participate in all those. Um, There are, we'll, we're, we're just going to post this thing on the web. I don't want you to read through all of the events that we have. Uh, if you're planning research around data science, there are a number of ways in which Midas can be of assistance uh, in terms of getting your uh, proposal uh, done, but also in terms of um, how you pursue your research and how you go on to the next uh, level beyond that. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about it, just, just talk to us. Um, 
Uh, one of the topics, we have been trying to do some focused topics of research, and one of the topics that we have is data science for music. And so as a post-symposium half day tomorrow afternoon is a, is a data science for music mini symposium that uh, I encourage you to come. Um, we are currently, uh, well, we've pretty much finished reviewing a bunch of proposals for our uh, small grants program. Um, and we got 65 proposals from all over campus and from Dearborn. And uh, we'll be announcing our awards tomorrow morning after the keynote. Um, there's one, one thing that we've started to do is to give people access to data sets that might otherwise be hard for people to arrange access to themselves. We have about a half a dozen data sets, and you could see from uh, right at the current time, and they're linked off of our website. Uh, one in particular that seems to be quite popular is uh, Twitter Decahose, which is one-tenth of all tweets that we are licensing from Twitter, and you will go through a simple sub-licensing process if you want to use that. Okay, it's a one-page form type thing. Um, we will shortly be doing some stuff on reproducible research, so watch out. There will be a competition in terms of, of helping us make research more, um, helping make research more reproducible. Um, I think I want to just keep moving. In terms of our educational programs, I want to recognize our data science fellows. We have a new program that we started this year. Our first cohort of fellows has just started. Um, there, are, there are a number of other things. Many, many of you are doing our graduate certificate program. Uh, we have a very active Michigan data science team, and there are other clubs like statistics in the community and so on. Today's uh, keynote is about data science for social good, and, and these teams actually have been remarkable in terms of the kind of things that they have been doing. Um, we are, we, we've been doing data challenges. There was one this month that is, again, just drawing to a close, uh, sponsored by these three companies that you see up there. And we'll be doing uh, another one in the winter term. And if you're here from industry, this is one good way to try to get a lot of students engaged in the kinds of things that you do. Um, I think uh, the, the ways in which industry is engaged is very different. Again, for those of you who are here from industry, uh, let's talk about what what's the best thing in terms of how Midas can be of benefit to you. Um, I want to talk about the, the other data science institutes. So there is a, there's a thing called the Academic Data Science Alliance that is just starting up across various uh, data science institutes in, in many institutions. Uh, we are associated with the symposium running a consortium of scholars, uh, PhD students and postdoctoral scholars from these data science institutes. We have 38 scholars who are here. Um, they, uh, will, they presented a talks at, at a pre-symposium thing yesterday. Today, they have posters, and so we have posters from data science uh, people across campus here, across Michigan, and uh, if you look at posters numbered in the in the 1000s, uh, those are posters from our visiting scholars uh, as part of the Data Science Consortium. I encourage you to seek them out. Uh, we are doing a bunch of things with nonprofit organizations. I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, we just mentioned that we have something with uh, the World Economic Forum, for instance, on Detroit uh, mobility. Uh, we have a strong push towards data equity, and, and, and we've had a number of grants in that direction. Um, we, we have a number of industry sponsors who have helped uh, put this program together and, and support Midas, and I want to thank them all for what uh, they do for us and with us. Um, and uh, for people who are not affiliated with Midas, uh, 
please connect. Uh, if, you're, if you're a Michigan person, go to the Midas website. There are buttons to click, and it's a very simple process. If you're a non-Michigan person, at the back of the program, there's, there's information on, um, you know, there's just an email. Just drop us an email. Uh, finally, I want to thank the people who made today's event possible. Uh, the staff here have really worked tirelessly over the past uh, several weeks to pull this off. And so actually, very few of them, I think, are in the room. Most of them are outside. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe we'll, at, at later in the symposium, when we can get more of them in the room, I'll, I'll thank them again. Um, and then I want to thank the program committee. I know several of the program committee members are here. And if you would just rise and be recognized for pulling this program together. Uh, Thank you. Um, and uh, at, at this point, I'd like to ask uh, Arvind Rao, one of the members of our program committee, to come up and introduce our uh, keynote speaker. Thanks, Jack. Um, so it is my, um, my name is Arvind. I'm a faculty member in the Michigan Medicine uh, School. I'm uh, a Midas co-faculty member as well. And it is my distinct pleasure and privilege this morning to introduce to you uh, Professor Raid Ghani. Uh, Raid uh, is a distinguished career professor in the machine learning department and the Heinz College of Public Policy Information Sciences at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, Raid has worn multiple hats in his uh, career, being chief scientist of the Obama campaign in 2012, uh, focusing on analytics, technology, and data. He was also senior research scientist and director of analytics research at Accenture, um, and most recently founded a director for the Center of Data Science and Public Policy at Chicago. He just moved to Carnegie Mellon two months ago, and he's been having a lot of fun setting things up there. Um, he's also a very strong supporter for the Data Science for Social Good initiative, and he's, he's done a lot of cool work in that space. So Raid's group is interested in answering the question, if I may paraphrase from your website, um, how do human AI collaborative systems, how can they be enabled to, to, to provide equitable and trustworthy uh, social and policy outcomes uh, for the kinds of applications they are brought into? And his work has really touched so many different aspects of uh, business and societal relevance, including, and I'm just listing from, from what I've read, health, criminal justice, education, public safety, workforce development, sustainability, transportation, social services, and economic development. And he's done this quite fluently and easily across the continuum from local to state to federal and even international, partnering with both um, governmental agencies and with NGOs. So we're extremely grateful to Raid for having accepted our invitation to give this keynote. And we hope you have a great time. So thank you for coming to the Midas Annual Symposium. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Raid. Let me do the obligatory, you know, open up the PowerPoint, make sure it works, all that stuff. Uh, uh, at least we're not doing video conference, so we can get started within five minutes as opposed to uh, the 20 minute. Uh, okay. Perfect. Um, I'm going to see if I can put this on so that I'm not hiding behind this, because I will fall asleep before you guys do. Uh, okay. Let me know if you can. Um, Can you guys hear me if I'm over here? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so thank you for the very, very kind introduction. I, I know it's, it's early morning, so I have to wake up before you guys wake up. I'm not a morning person. Um, feel free to jump in and stop me and ask questions. Um, again, for, for your sake <laughs> as much as mine, um, but I'm also around you know, the rest of the day, and, and feel free to contact me afterwards as well. What I really want to do today is um, give you guys a sort of flavor, examples of lots of projects that, that we've been doing, more to give you an idea of the intersection of um, all the buzzwords. So I, I, I've started putting all the buzzwords there, so if you're doing keyword searches, um, you find what you're looking for. Um, and I'm also starting putting buzzwords because, so I was giving a talk maybe a month, two months ago, for a bunch of government agencies. And I talked about a lot of projects that we're working on, 
Um, and I think it was titled something like Data Science for Social Good because that happened to be the buzzword that, that I picked a couple of years back. And after the end of my talk, this person raises his hand and says, well, it's interesting you're doing all this work. Why aren't you using machine learning? Um, and he says, so tell me what you mean by, by machine learning. He said, well, you know, um, I thought, you know, if you're saying you, you're, you're taking all this data and you have to do all this processing and all this work and model selection and all these things, like if you just use machine learning, you would just put data in and you would get answers. Uh, so why aren't you using that? Uh, and, and so I just started putting in a bunch of words, um, uh, buzzwords up front. Ideally, I want to sort of say, you know, all this star, whatever the next vendor will come up with the next word. Um, so, so I want to get people you know, talking about sort of these types of understanding these projects. But then I, it's, it's mostly a recruiting talk, right? I want all of you to get interested in these problems so you spend time on them um, rather than a lot of useless problems a lot of us ha have, have been working on, right? Um, and, and Jag's examples of the, the work that Midas is doing is wonderful, right? They're all really important problems, collaborations with, with, with governments, uh, collaborations, NGOs. I think, I think you get the same richness of problems as you're working on with industry, except you actually have real impact on real people, as opposed to getting your you know, food delivered three minutes faster. Um, you're saving people's lives, and, and that impact is, is very different. So that's kind of the, 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 the end goal for me, right? I want to motivate and, and hopefully recruit all of you guys to work on these types of projects doesn't matter where you are, academia, industry, government. Um, so so the, the challenge is that I have to depress you to get you interested. Right? That's, that's sort of the, the trade-off. Is it, It's you know, 8.45 in the morning, and I'm going to talk about a bunch of really depressing things right now. Um, and, and then I'm going to you know, hopefully ask you guys to help make them less depressing, and, and that will be your impact. Uh, so I, this is an old example. Some of you may have heard it. And some of you have heard it because you happen to be in Michigan for a different reason, right? So, so this is not the Flint example. This is pre-Flint. Um, and, and it turns out, you know, a, a lot of you know about lead poisoning because, one, either you're here and you heard about Flint, but, two, because you might have kids. Uh, and, and it turns out the, the water issue that the world is waking up to pipes and things is a problem. It's not as big of a problem as paint in walls and doors and windows. That's the biggest source of lead poisoning. Um, today um, in, in the U.S. You get millions of kids exposed to it. It's been going down. So every home that was built before 1977 um, has lead paint in there. Um, and it, it's, it's fine that the lead paint remains in there, but as the paint chips, homes get old, um, kids start crawling, they pick up lead dust, they put it in their mouth, and they get exposed to lead. And, and it has pretty horrible consequences, which we all know about. The, the worst of all of these things is that all of these are irreversible. Once you've been exposed to lead, there is no, there's no cure for it. Um, and any exposure is bad exposure. So the policy that most cities, so Chicago has 80% of the homes in Chicago were built before 1977, right? So there's a ton of lead inside. Um, now, a lot of them have been rehabbed and they've been fixing a lot of these homes. But the way they, their, their policy today is every kid before they go to school gets tested for lead poisoning. Um, and if they are found to be positive, then the city sends health inspectors over to the home to check for lead hazards. And guess what? They find lead hazards in about 90% of the homes because how else did the kid get poisoning? They then figure out how to fix those things. Right? But we know lead poisoning is irreversible. So fixing it after the fact is, is mostly useless, has some value for the future kids who are going to live in that the house. So, so we basically use kids as lead sensors to detect lead to help future kids. That's essentially our policy, which is horrible, but that's essentially what we're doing. Right? So um, that being said, you know, so a few years back, um, the, the city um, came to us and said, look, we know we're, we're, we're doing pretty horribly, uh, but we want to do better. Um, we don't have resources to fix every home, um, and how do we prioritize? Um, and so we worked with them over the years to, to do a few different things. One is to think, okay, it's a pretty simple change. So today, the lead poisoning test triggers an inspection, and it happens to be after the fact. What if we just move this inspection um, before, the, before they actually get lead poisoning, but can we now put a, a system that predicts which kids are at risk of lead poisoning? And so what we did was we, took, we got data from them for all the, the blood tests that they had done over the last 10, 15 years, all the home inspections they had done, um, and 
that, all that was sitting there, right? They'd been storing it for years, but they weren't doing anything with it, which is going to be the norm in a lot of these cases, that the data is often there, uh, at least in the government case. A lot of NGOs may not have the right data, but most governments, for compliance purposes, have stored a lot of this individual level data. Um, so they had the data, we put it together, and we built a system to basically, at, when a kid is two months, three months old, predict their risk of getting lead poisoning, living in that house, and if that's a high risk, we can then trigger an inspection, and then the, the health inspector can go in, check for lead hazards, and, and, and you know, do all the stuff. So it's just moving it from post-poisoning to pre-poisoning. Right? Um, so then, you know, ran a trial, and, and, and now, so that, now that system is sort of starting to get used. It took a few years to get it from, it's working to getting it, you know, trialed and implemented and all that sort of stuff. But what started happening is it also started thinking about other ways of, of using this, right? So they're, they're now in, um, starting a, a program with a hospital system that implements this into their EMR. So when a pregnant woman comes in for a checkup, they call the same API, it comes back and says high risk, um, and that triggers a notice to the health department who then now ha has time to plan sending the right inspection team and scheduling and all that stuff before the kid is even born. So you reduce the chances of exposure to, to pretty close to pretty close to zero. Um, so let's so that's that's kind of one another depressing example. Um, um, and this is again from a couple of years ago um, when we started this. So these things take you know many many years, right? So this depressing example is police departments, um, and these um, these are all the departments when when we used to have a Department of Justice. Um, these were all under um, what, what's called consent decrees. And the consent decrees are basically the, the Department of Justice as we're going to sue you, the police department, for civil rights violations. And then they settle on some things they have to fix in order to, to not get sued or to settle, right? Um, and this is, there are actually many more that have been there. But basically, all of these were for, you know, a lot of things were around um, racial injustice, a lot of them were around unjustified use of force, unjustified shootings. And, and it's not a local problem, and you know, Chicago is pretty bad, uh, but it's not a local problem, it's, it's all over the country. Um, the, the, the more depressing thing here is it turns out most major police departments have a system that they call early intervention system. What it's supposed to do is raise an alert when a police officer is at risk of doing one of these things. Most departments have spent a ton of money implementing and, and you know, buying these things, except nobody ever bothered to actually test how, if they work at all. Um, this was, even after this consent decree, we were talking to New Orleans a couple of years back, and they were getting ready to, to, to start a pilot of this, so the system they had built, I don't know, spent a few, couple million dollars, and we asked them about, so what, what are you measuring in this pilot? And they said, well, we're gonna measure, you know, um, how often can we log in? Uh, how often does the system come up? Uh, does it show something? Uh, so basically, you know, the, 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 can you install and run it is the metric of success for these people. Um, and so what we started doing is work with a few departments to see can we make it better. And before we wanted to do that, we wanted to see how well did they actually work. Um, and it turns out the way they were built were um, just like a lot of these types of government allocation systems are built. There's some people sitting around a table decided, let's use our experience to, to figure out what's what predicts somebody doing something bad? And they came up with, the, the, most of these systems had sort of two or three rules. That was pretty much it. So the first one was, if you've had um, six complaints against you in the last 180 days, raise an alert. If you've had three uses of force in the last 90 days, raise an alert. Uh, and we're in the US, so if you take more than two weeks of leave in the last 90 days, raise an alert. That's it, Those, that was the state of the art system. Um, and not surprisingly, we looked at this and we looked at the data and it turn, turns out that this wasn't working. Um, it turns out for the, so the first or, um, department we worked with was Charlotte in North Carolina. It, that system was flagging more than half of their police officers um, every quarter. Right? So already completely useless, nobody trusted it. Um, and, and two things were happening. One is because nobody trusted it, they almost started using it as a badge of honor. Like, hey, I'm on the system, which means I'm doing stuff. Um, the other set of people started gaming it, where, oh, I've had five complaints against me, uh, I have still have two weeks left, so I'm not gonna do anything for the next two weeks, because if I do stuff, I get above this, and then I have to explain why, what I was doing, and all this stuff, it's just easier if I don't do stuff. Um, and, and these were the things that, you know, 
many of them, well, we, know we all heard these things when we're doing ride-alongs with police officers asking them about these types of things. So, so this was not, you know, written somewhere. This was all people telling us. And if they're telling us, imagine how much worse it is in actually doing these things, right? So, so the step one was really to say, to figure out, again, how we know it doesn't work. Um, how do we make it better? Um, and, and the first step was, can we identify these officers more, more accurately? And can we identify them early enough to be able to influence them, right? If I, if I figure out two minutes before they're gonna do something, there's not, I can't press a button and, and zap them, right? So, so I have to do it early enough. Um, and it turns out that they had, again, a lot of this data is, you know, so, so we got data from this police department for everything they knew about an officer, their demographics, their HR history, all the stops they'd made, all the arrests, all the dispatches, all the internal affairs, complaints, investigations. Uh, and we could put it together to, again, see can I predict this officer's risk of doing one of these things in the next you know, six months, 12 months, um, and then provide this information to people who, are, who, are, who can figure out what the right intervention is to try to reduce that risk uh, of them doing things. Um, because again, the goal is not to predict and then watch them do something horrible. The goal is to, to prevent that and, and to couple that with, and it turns out when we're doing the analysis, we found that there were sort of some interesting predictors that, that were obvious in hindsight, but so things like um, repeated, that basically they were putting people temporarily at risk. So things like uh, repeated dispatches to suicide attempts um, or repeated dispatches to domestic abuse cases, especially involving kids. And if an officer was dispatched to a lot of those temporarily, the next few weeks they were high risk of, of of doing one of these things that we don't want them to do. So, so there were a set of people who had a long history of doing these, and, and, and in which case the interventions were, were very different, but then there were people who were temporarily in these situations, and the interventions might be counseling, might be downtime, might be trying to figure out, instead of sending them to another suicide attempt, can we send them somewhere else that doesn't increase the, increase the stress level and, and improves um, the, the outcomes for, for, for everyone. And so, Charlotte has now been, you know, we ran a trial with them and they've been, they've been kind of running it for a couple of years now and we're running evaluation sort of how well it's, it's working and reducing um, the, the number of incidents that, that have been happening. Um, and it's kind of been used in a, in a couple other places. So um, I'm gonna actually skip through, skip through this one. But if you notice sort of the, the first, you know, both the, the lead poisoning as well as, as the police, they're, they're both sort of these early warning systems, right? Where if we can predict something early and we have access to interventions that can, if we can predict something bad happening to somebody early and we have access to interventions that can reduce the risk of them happening, we can prevent that from happening in the first place. Um, and, and so here's another example of that early warning system. Right? This is for the criminal justice world, which we all should know but is totally broken right now in, in, in the US. Right? These are numbers for jails in the US. It doesn't include prisons, this is just jails. Um, 11 million people go through that. Uh, what's depressing is are the bottom three numbers, right? Two thirds of these people who are go through jails in the US have mental health issues, substance abuse disorders, chronic health issues. And a lot of this is, is happening um, before they end up in jail. So uh, 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 there's, a, there's a set of efforts that have been going on in this area. And so one of the projects we've been working on for the last few years is with a county in Kansas called Johnson County. They're kind of the border of Kansas and Missouri. They also, like a lot of other counties, have a high recidivism rate. And what they are interested in doing is, like everyone else, reducing it. But what their hypothesis was that a, a cause of a lot of this, men, uh, of this recidivism is mental health issues. And what they wanted to do, they came to us and said, well, we've got um, a team that goes out and talks to and gives kind of mental health services to people who have been in jail. And right now they do it sort of within 40 hours, 48 hours after their release. So every time somebody's released, they try to contact them in the next 48 hours to try to kind of figure out, do you need any help? And they said, but that doesn't really do, it's not really doing much because it's not the right time for them to necessarily intervene. And they said, can you help us figure out who should we prioritize for proactive mental health services um, with the goal of reducing recidivism? Um, and so there were two pieces there. One was, can we, identify people who are at risk of recidivism. Two, can we figure out which of them need mental health support? And three, can we put these things together to figure out who can benefit from this mental health support in order to reduce their risk of recidivism? And so step one 
was sort of a standard machine learning problem that we know how to solve, right? How, okay, we can take all these people, we can predict who's at risk of recidivism. We've done that enough. Now, I'll come back to, to the equity side and fairness side of that. Second piece was, can we identify whether they need mental health support? And we can do that. The third piece, so we did that and we found, you know, we can accurately identify the set of people. And now the question is, does this intervention, does mental health outreach, does it help them re reduce their risk of coming back? Um, and I don't know the answer yet. So we started a pilot in June where we're giving them a list of 150 people every month. They're going out and doing this mental health outreach. And then we're getting this data back to answer two questions. One is, is this intervention effective at reducing the risk of recidivism on these people? But the more important question is, how does it differ by different types of people? Um, because what we don't want to do is apply this intervention to the highest risk people and it doesn't do anything for them, which is both bad because it doesn't, it doesn't help them, but it's also an opportunity cost because we're missing out on other people who it could help. Um, and so what we were, we're trying to figure out two things. One is just the effectiveness of the program, but two is how do we allocate this program? Who are the people who are most likely to benefit from this intervention um, so that we can allocate that to them, but then we can take the people who are not benefiting and figure out and create new interventions for them, right? Because again, that's the goal. The goal is to reduce recidivism. The goal is not to build a bunch of machine learning models. And so how do we turn this around, right? And so that's something actively that are going, that's going on. It's gonna go on until next June. It's a 12 month um, experiment. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at the recidivism outcomes to see what we can do, well, what, the, what the results are. Um, so those, those are again, these early warning system problems, right? Detect early, intervene and hope and, 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 and t test and see if it works. There's a whole class of problem when you, when you sort of started, start working with um, these public policy and social impact problems, it's sort of what we've noticed in the last few years is they all break down into kind of six or seven templates, right? So the first one is this, can I detect who's going to get lead poisoning early, which is this early warning problem, or can I detect officers that, that are going to do horrible things early? Can I detect students who are gonna not graduate from um, from school in time early so I can do something about it. There's a second set of problems that are kind of these, I call them these inspection problems, um, which are slightly different. I am not predicting what's gonna happen early. So that example, so this is some, this is the examples, you know, we've worked with, again, this agency is used to be, used to be called the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then again, their goal was to, you know, protect the environment, obviously. Uh, and we work with them to help them figure out, so they, one of the things they have supposed to do is make sure that, um, you know, manufacturing plants, other sources, you know, other, other places that do any sort of hazardous waste disposal or disposing of this waste in a, in a, in a responsible way. They're complying with, you know, they're not throwing them on the, in, in the back, they're not um, putting them in the river. Um, and they have about 400,000 facilities they have to make sure that comply with this but they only have resources to inspect a thousand. So inspection is their tool to, to, for compliance. They can inspect a thousand, they have 400,000. How do they choose the thousand, right? And today it's sort of based on intuition and, and experience. Um, um, and, and, and so the idea was how do we help them target these thousand in order to reduce the rate of, of non-compliance on the larger set? Um, and the same thing was with you know, a, a similar agency in New York. Same kind of thing, we worked with uh, uh, Chile's labor department to inspect workplaces for health and safety violations. Our workplaces could be a place like a university or it could be a, uh, a mine uh, where people are working. So how do you prioritize uh, inspections in order to make sure that it, uh, you, know, you can get equal health and safety outcomes for every, all types of employees? Uh, another project was with Cincinnati to figure out how do we inspect homes to detect blight early and intervene to reduce um, instances of blight in different neighborhoods. Another project was in San Jose to figure out how do we inspect uh, rental homes for, again, health and safety violations when the landlord is not fixing things um, and, and, and the city has to make sure that they're compliant with all the health and safety policies. Another project was with New York to help them figure out, again, for renters, which tenants are going, who living in rent subsidized, rent controlled uh, apartments are going to be harassed by their landlords and don't know that they have access to legal support and not know what their rights are. So they've started this program with this team called Public Engagement Unit to go out and do proactive outreach to tell them what their rights are, connect them to legal services, 
but there are many more of them in the city than the, the, this unit has, has resources to go and do outreach to. So how do you order these to make sure that you're, you're getting out, um, you're not just being efficient, but you're also being equitable in terms of access to these types of things. So those are these inspection type problems, audit type problems that keep coming up as, as you look at these, you know, uh, as you work with these organizations. There's a third class, which is more agencies or nonprofits that have sort of mobile assets, right? Things that are moving around, ambulances, medics, fire trucks. And so this was another project with, this was with Cincinnati where they were looking at when a 911 call comes in, um, you have to kind of make a few different types of decisions. But essentially, for Cincinnati, the decisions were basically, am I sending something or not? Is this a real call? Um, and then once I've decided it's a real call, I really have one of two decisions I have to make. Am I sending a fire truck, or am I sending a fire truck and an ambulance? And the difference really is, if just medical help is needed, then a fire truck is enough, because every fire truck in their case has a medic on board. If they think that medical transportation is going to be needed, a fire truck cannot transport somebody to the hospital, then they send both. So that's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a binary classification problem. I'm predicting whether medical transportation is needed or not. If yes, send both. If not, send one. And you can imagine, you know, you can kind of make two types of error, right? You can oversend, and if you oversend, um, there's an opportunity cost. Somewhere else, you might have an ambulance that's needed, and then you have to send that ambulance farther away. If you undersend, it's pretty bad because if somebody actually needed transportation and now you have to call it in, say, hey, we were wrong, we need to, can you send me an ambulance? Those few minutes could be pretty costly in terms of human, human life, right? So, so they kind of had to figure out the right balance of, of doing these things and, and where do you route them, what do you send? And that's, again, a common problem with fire trucks, with ambulances, with medics, a lot of these types of things. Um, there's another sort of similar one which is routing things but not necessarily physical things, right? So the cost of sending something is very different because you're not sending it far away. This is some work with, with Mexico um, on routing citizen requests that are coming in about different types of questions that they have and needs. Um, another type of template is this, I'm trying to reduce X. Can you help me which policies to prioritize uh, modifying? So this was some work with Mexico where they're trying to reduce maternal mortality. And what they don't know is why is maternal mortality really high? And is it because people are, I mean, we know it's high, we just don't know how you fix it. Is it people are not going to the hospital or their doctors? Is it because the care they're getting is not correct? Is it because they don't know that they should be going when they have complications? Is it uh, compliance? Is it adherence? Is it transportation access? Is it insurance issues? Is it is the actual care issue? And so we work with them to kind of figure out, to narrow it down from sort of a bunch of things to a small number of things, and we found sort of working with them, it was people are not complying with their appointments, they're not going, um, uh, and based on their insurance, they're being treated differently. And so as a result of that, I sort of call it, like it's a policy hypothesis generation, right? So we generated this hypothesis based on data. We couldn't fit, get an answer, but now that we said it's one of these two or three, they then ran an experiment uh, to give out cell phones to, to these pregnant women to help remind them when an appointment is coming up and then ask them if they didn't go, what was the reason you didn't go? Um, and then they modified some of the insurance policies to see if that would result in, in changing, changing their outcomes. And then the law, I mean, I'm gonna skip through some of these things. Um, another really common, you know, if you're, if you're mostly, if you're sort of coming from the machine learning, data science, all the buzzword world, um, data is, is data. It can come in video and audio and, and text and, and, and rows and columns. But if you're a typical policy person, data comes in rows and columns. If it's not in row in a column form, it's not data. Um, and that's a problem because often a lot of the organizations we work with will come into us and say, we don't have data that can do this, right? Um, and so in this case, you know, a couple of these examples we're working with um, organizations that are trying to sort of, you know, reskill people in, in skills that are going to be in demand. And they said, well, we just don't have a list of people, list of skills that people have. Like, well, do you have their, their resume? Yeah. Do you, don't you think there's the skills in there? Yeah, but it's a resume. It's, it's in PDF form in the best case. Um, or uh, another example was we were working with, with um, uh, the, um, the traffic um, department in Jakarta in Indonesia. And they have 
a few thousand traffic deaths every year. Um, and to deal with that, they put in about, you know, every smart city, you know, they put in a bunch of cameras and then they watch those cameras and that makes them really smart. Uh, so they put in these 5,000 cameras and a few years later, they come back to us and say, well, we have these cameras. We don't really know what to do with them. Uh, can you help us, you know, collect some data? Said, well, you have the data, you just need to do something with it. So we ended up working with them. And so this is, this is, you know, this is Jakarta. And uh, yeah, so when, when you hear of, you know, traffic projects and things like Vision Zero in the US where uh, there are traffic issues, no, these are, these are traffic issues, right? Um, and, and so what they wanted to do was be able to detect, kind of turn their 5,000 cameras into a structured stream of what's happening so that they can start then correlating that to, to accidents, to deaths, and start finding the root cause. Is it because the right policies are not in place? Is it because the policy is there, but it's not being complied with? Um, so in this case, you know, like non-vehicles, they, they have food cart vendors that, have, that are going in. And that's just normal, right? That, that happens, I grew up in Pakistan, so that's, 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 this looks very normal. Uh, motors, and so the first challenge was, well, you know, they actually do, is how do we detect these types of things, right? And, and yes, there are a bunch of off-the-shelf detectors that are out there. Try applying those to any of this data, right? So motorcycles, right? None of them could recognize the motorcycles in Jakarta because motorcycles look like this, right? People have bags piled up because they're using them to transport a lot of stuff. Um, food card vendors is not a category uh, in, in, in most of these detectors. Even sort of, the, uh, we, we were doing a similar project in London last summer even London buses, right? the, the, the detector is very much based on, on, on the US buses. Um, and and, and it, so you have to kind of modify a lot of these things, retrain. Um, and, and you know, vehicles driving the wrong way. That's not really a category again. So the, the idea was, how do we go from these to, to detecting what the objects are, what the objects are doing, and where the objects are doing it? Right? Because that structured stream can then be turned into rows and columns and given to policy analysts who then know exactly what to do with it. They know how to do the analysis, they just don't have the rows and columns to, to, to deal with. Um, and so we ended up sort of generating these stream of things. So this is, these are the kind of some of the outliers we found, right? So that's a two-way street. Um, and, and it's pretty, and so the question, the question is, if we can figure out that these things are happening, can we then start correlating that to accidents happening in the future? Um, could that be a cause of these accidents? And then you can start putting in, if that was the cause, then can you start putting in barriers in the middle, which won't stop some things, but, but might improve certain things, right? So, so these are kind of some examples. There are many, many more. So all of these projects, there are more details, not as many as you would like. Um, and, and there are many other projects. But you know, the way I would think about it is like, these are the templates they all fall into. And so if you're thinking about doing these types of things when you work with governments or NGOs, or in this case even, unfortunately, companies, um, all of the problems kind of fall into one of these types of things. And it makes it easy to, to the, for them to figure out what they should be doing because each of these problems comes with a set of tools and a set of methodologies that you can then start looking at. Now, if you notice, you know, one of the things that was common across all of these is that they're all kind of under, underneath it, they all require the same type of underlying system, right? None of these are autonomous systems. They're all working with a human in the middle, right? They're all, so the, the lead poisoning, there's an inspector that has to go out and do something. Um, the recidivism example, there's mental health outreach team that we can tell them this person might be at risk of recidivism, but we can't tell them, at least today, what they should do about it. That's something they are trying to figure out what to do. Um, we can tell them um, certain things about it. So, so basically, in all of these things, what we're trying to do is trying to build these collaborative systems um, between machine learning, data science, AI, and, and, and people. Um, and we're making them so that they can actually do what we want them to do. And ideally, what we want them to do is achieve fair and equitable outcomes. Right? And, and the fair and equitable is important because one of the things that's been happening the last few years is when governments have started using all machine learning or even just data, their primary business case has been efficiency. We have very few resources. We want to make sure we help as many people as possible with those few resources. Um, and with that framing, one of the challenges that's hap that happens is if you only help the people who are easiest or cheapest to help, that's what leads to inequities. Right? Even if you're sort of, if you're well-meaning and you say, look, I can only help 100 people, I will help the 100 
that are cheapest to help, well, they might be just right near where you are, and that's the easiest thing to do. Or they're just at the border of you know, being okay, and you help them. That's great for those people, but a lot of other people got left behind because you were going with efficiency as your metric. Um, and, and if you turn around and we want equitable outcomes, it gets more challenging because one, you have to even think about what does it mean to achieve equitable outcomes? What does it mean to be, to be equitable? And, and, and that's one conversation that you know, I've had with many, 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 many government agencies and, and it's not something they've talked about. I mean, they use the word. They've never had to analytically define uh, what it means to achieve equitable outcomes. And so just having the conversation makes them like, think about, oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, so that's sort of the goal, right? And, and so what we're kind of moving towards is trying to think about what do we need to achieve these types of systems? Um, and my current sort of hypothesis is right, we kind of need three types of things right now, of four. Right? One is we need to train the next generation of students who are doing this work in these areas. Right? It's, it's not going to be sort of just people just, just working on it. We I mean, kind of need to change how we're doing training. Um, and, um, and train people in, in, in areas that are, that are really the intersection of a lot of the things that, you know, one Jag was talking about, but a lot of us are at these intersection points here, right? A lot of us um, are, are not in a single department that we traditionally used to be in, and I think that's a really good sign, right? The second thing is we, we actually need some new, we need, need new research, right? A lot of the stuff I talked about is somewhat off the shelf from the machine learning data science point of view. Like, I took a method and I applied it, and that's great, but what I didn't talk about was it wasn't extremely accurate. These things were better than today, which is the metric, because you want to implement that. But it didn't solve the problem. It's not accurate enough. We need to do better. And so we need a lot of new research that, 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 that's focused on these types of problems. And I think in order to really have that impact on, the, on governments and nonprofits, we actually need to turn the research into tools, right? because they're not generally capable of taking your paper um, and doing anything with it, except getting confused, um, <laughs> which is happening quite a bit right now, especially in the, the fairness and bias world where they're reading these papers like, oh, it's impossible to achieve fairness. I guess we should stop. Uh, as opposed to, no, it's a much more nuanced problem and we can actually do something. So, so I think from our side, we kind of need these areas, but we, but we also need collaborative projects with these organizations because that's really the, I think, that's really the only way to effectively train students to do research that's focused on these problems and then to turn them into tools. So I'm gonna to take a few minutes and gonna talk about what I think, you know, we, we, we need to do what we're trying to do in these, in these areas. Right, so one is on the training side. If you're a student, you should be really worried because we're gonna just expand the number of courses you have to take, right? You, you might have been, you know, Today you might be in, in, in a computer science department and, and kind of doing computer science and maybe you took some stats and ML classes, but you haven't done anything with experimental design. An experiment is not something we run on a computer overnight. Uh, experiment and, you know, involves a lot of work. You might not have taken ethics classes or law classes. Um, you might be getting problems that are extremely well formulated because you know, a lot, of our, a lot of us in academia are really lazy and we don't want to, you know, grade. And so if, if I give you great things that are hard to grade, so if we give you really structured problems, we can grade your, your, your answers really easily. It turns out all of those things are, you know, um, really important. We all need to understand, yes, we need machine learning and computer science. Um, yes, we need social science. As much as those two disciplines historically have said we are, each of us are self-sufficient to solve any problem, you know, uh, we aren't, right? So, so how do we, that's, we get that, but then we're also often trying to make really important um, value decisions when we're building these systems. And, and one, we shouldn't be making them ourselves, but we should at least have the training and exposure to figure out what conversations we should have, with whom, how do we bring in the right people when we need them. So when I'm sort of not, I'm not claiming, so one of the things when, when I talk about this to people in, in a single discipline, they start saying, well, we can't teach, we can't teach all of these things in the same, in the same program, right? The program would last an infinite number of years. And, and so the, the point is not that we should all be experts in all of them. The point is that we should be, one, working in teams, teams that, that have all of these expertise areas. And, and that gives us a, an opportunity to understand what the needs are, how I talk about it, about these things. And I'm aware of these things. But then it allows me to 
to then go collaborate with experts that have depth, right? So we're going to have depth in a couple of these areas, but we need to have exposure to, to a lot of them. And the good thing is that this is, this is happening, right? It's been happening for a few, few years um, in different, different universities. So we've got a lot of these programs. CMU has had a program in policy and, and machine learning for many, many, many years. Um, Chicago and a lot of master's programs have popped up, right? And Northeastern uh, has one, and, and CUSP at NYU, and, and Penn State has this really good PhD program that's kind of combining machine learning, computer science, and, and social sciences. And Georgetown started a master's program. I'm assuming Michigan has something uh, because they're coming, they're becoming more, more popular, but they're really hard to teach, right? In a university setting, across department teaching is it, you can give a course here and a course here, but to create a course that's actually integrated, it's really painful. Uh, and, and so a lot of these courses, this, this program at the beginning, have court, you're taking courses from a bunch of departments, but you're not taking courses that are designed for the joint program. Uh, and I think that's where we need to get to more and more, is people coming in from different disciplines uh, in the same classroom, but then courses that are designed, which makes it really hard to assume you know, prerequisites and, and all these different things, but that's important. Um, the second thing is there are a bunch of research topics that, that are really motivated by these problems, right? So um, one is new methods that we need that are, that are, um, that are motivated by, by the types of challenges I talked about. Um, and I'll, I'll mostly skip through that. I should give you a very quick, you know. Um, I should give you the, the, the one that I'm, I'm interested in, all of them. But, but this, is, this is sort of one that I hinted at when I was talking about the recidivism project, right? Right now, what we're really good at in machine learning is predicting an outcome, right? So we can predict who's going to go to return to jail. But I can't predict how this intervention, mental health intervention, will change your risk of going to jail. What the people on the ground in the field need is, is the latter. They want to know, if I apply this intervention, and that's, you know, it's, it's true in medicine, it's true in pretty much every policy area where what we want to know is, if I do this to you, will your risk go down? And then I can select the right intervention for the right people. The challenge is that I don't have data to do that work. So what we do is, we, as a proxy, we take, we build risk models, and then in the best case, we run trials or experiments to figure out the second piece. In the worst case, we assume risk is proportional to need, and then we start intervening from top to bottom. Um, so I think we need a bit, you know, we need a sort of more systematic way of combining experiments you're doing your machine learning, but then that's followed by an experiment that collects more data as a result of the experiment. And then it does more machine learning and more experimentation. It's sort of this iterative thing. Um, but that's hard if you don't have access to people who you can run experiments with and collaborate with, which is why we need the collaborations, right? So that's just one example. Um, second, anyway, let's get through that. Second area that's, that's been, um, I know, I'm, I'm glad it's been getting sort of more and more importance is explainability, interpretability. And, and that's an important, especially because those systems we're building are not autonomous systems. They're humans involved. Um, and our systems are, are useless if the human isn't gonna change what they're doing based on our system, right? And so we need interpretability, one, for ourselves. Like when I'm building machine learning systems, I wanna have an intuition of, is it, is it doing the right thing? And if I can't interpret them, I'm not, if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm, I, I'm, I'm passing it on to my collaborators who I really trust, but I'm not giving it to anybody else if I don't understand it. But the second thing is, you know, if, if it's not, a lot of these, the, 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 the intervention problem, right? So a lot of these cases, if I'm telling somebody who's at a homeless shelter, this person who's just come in is really high risk of certain, certain outcomes, they have to figure out what to do about it, right? They have to figure out do they need, um, uh, tra they have transportation issues, or they have health issues, or they have employment issues. So they have access to a bunch of these interventions. So right now we're running a pilot in Portugal with their unemployment office. And the, these, the, when a person goes in to file for unemployment, the counselor there, um, one tries to figure out, is this person going to be unemployed for a long time? And based on what their estimates are, they then assign them one of you know, 200 different programs that, that they get enrolled in to try to get them back into, into the workforce. And so the job, their job is not to predict risk of unemployment. Their job is to help them figure out which interventions do I allocate to you that improve your employment outcomes. Um, 
And so the explanation is not just a tool to, to convince them that the prediction was right. The explanation is a tool to help them figure out what to do about it. Um, and then there's sort of legal reasons for legal, legal resource, right? And so I think the, the, a lot of the work that's been happening in explainability is taking a slightly different approach, right? It's, it's saying, look, I know my computer, my machine learning model is correct. I just have to convince this human that it's correct. And the explanation that best convinces the human is the best explanation, or the explanation that the human likes the most is the best explanation. Who cares if the human likes the explanation? Who cares if it convinces? We want the explanation, in, in a lot of the projects that we're talking about, we want the explanation to improve the decision making of the overall system, right? So if you think about kind of, and I skipped through a bunch of these things, right? If you think about sort of this is what's happening today is we have a machine learning model uh, that pretends to be a brain, and it gives it to the human decision maker, and they're, it's right some percent of the time. What we ideally want is this explanation module in the middle ideally improves the decision maker's capabilities. And so ideally the explanation helps the human override the bad predictions, the bad decisions, and reinforce the correct ones. And in a lot of the things we're talking about, like the most examples I gave, the precision of our models is, you know, 30%, 40%. And that's good because it's better than, you know, in, the, in most of these cases, the priors, they're pretty horrible things happening to people. So the priors are 3%, 4%, 2%. And so we're doing much better than, than random or much better than people in most cases. But they're still mostly wrong. Most of these predictions are wrong. And so we want the overriding to happen as much as possible. So we're doing some work where we're testing out a lot of these explanation um, algorithms um, of different types to see which ones are better at increasing the, the, the decision-making uh, outcomes that we care about for the, for the system. Um, the last piece I want to sort of touch on is, is really important, and, I, and, and, and you know, Tanya's gonna, uh, Tina's going to talk more about that later, and I think there's a lot of work going on in the bias and fairness world. We're sort of taking, um, again, a, a, a view of the overall system, right? Um, so we're, we're less, it's always good for everything to be fair. I think it's good to your machine learning model to be fair. It's always good for your data to be correct. And everything should be good in your entire pipeline. But we're more concerned about making sure that the outcomes of the system are fair. Just like for interpretability, we want the overall, we care about the overall outcomes. Because it, it's important for everything to be, to, be, to be correct, but it's critical for the outcome. So let's say you're using horrible data. But let's say you can deal with that at the end based on your interventions. Or let's say you have perfectly perfect data, perfect models, and then you intervene, and your interventions are unfair. Um, they only work well for, so, so here's um, an example of like diabetes is, is, a, is a, there are these guidelines for screening for diabetes uh, that this organization, US Preventative Services Task Force came up with, and it's based on BMI and, 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 and age. And if you actually look at people who get, I know, it, it's, it's horribly biased based on white people. So it's horribly biased against a lot of minorities. And what it does is it just under, under screens them. Um, and so you're, they have good data, and their analysis was good, but then basically they set up these guidelines where the interventions work more effectively for white people than non-white people. And so what we've been kind of focusing on is how do we make these systems um, overall fair, which first means understanding where some of the bias comes from. And I'm just going to skip through all of that. Uh, in your overall system, right? Like, instead of focusing on just the modeling part, maybe your 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 record linkage was was bad um, when you were combining data sources and you you mislinked. Maybe that's where the bias actually came from, or maybe the bias came from the intervention, or maybe the bias came from when you were doing your imputation and you just did mean imputation and 80% of your data was males, so maybe you made all females look more like males in the data. Uh, and you didn't notice that because we just kept going and, and, and didn't, really, didn't really worry about that. So what we're kind of working on is methods for, one, not a, that's not a technical thing, one that's like how do we even help governments just figure out what, what definition of equity should they be using, right? And because one of the things that's happening is um, when they're reading a lot of the academic papers, and especially about, oh, well, there are these trade-offs, you can't achieve fairness, the, 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 what they're taking it to mean is, well, we can't achieve fairness, so should we do something or not? Should we just not use any machine learning because it can't be fair? 
And what we're sort of telling them is, no, there is a theoretical notion of, of fairness, and then there's a very practical notion of what you're trying to do. So for example, if you are trying to intervene with people and your interventions are assistive, like the ones I've, all the ones I've talked about, um, they're trying to help somebody. And in that case, disproportionate false negatives are much, 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 much worse than disproportionate false positives. Because if you are, have a false negative, you miss somebody. If you miss somebody, you hurt them. If you're doing horrible things like predictive policing and your interventions are actually punitive, um, which one you shouldn't do, uh, but um, if you are, then your disproportionate false positives is much worse than disproportionate false negatives. So then you might want parity in false positives um, as opposed to parity in, in false negatives. If you're intervening with a small number of people, um, if you intervene with you know 100 people out of 3 million, then you care about um, uh, parity in recall and not necessarily uh, false positives. So helping them think through, so we ended up kind of building this this, this is I'm not supposed to be readable. It's it's um, it's on our you know website and stuff. But we ended up making them making this fairness tree that helps government agencies think about if you're doing this, this is the metric you care about. If you're doing this, this is the metric you care about. Um, as opposed to telling them you should make sure that all of these metrics are fair, because that's one not achievable, two not not actionable, and is just more 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 confusing than anything else. Um, so, and then we ended up kind of building this this toolkit that helps them. Um, that helps them audit, you know, so again, there was, a, there was a lot of work on papers, but that was leading to paralysis. They weren't really sure, is this fair or not? So we ended up building a toolkit, which really initially was for ourselves. When we worked, to every project we worked on, we would run a bias and fairness audit to make, to at least make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're being careful. But then we wanted governments that we work with to also do the same thing for everything they do, whether they work with researchers, vendors, um, any collaborators, before they deploy a machine learning model, they have to run it against this tool and make the outcomes, make this audit report public um, to, to make sure that you know, they're, being, they're going through the, the, the process and making sure. So this tool basically kind of asks them, what is the, the metric you care about, shows them that tree to help them figure out the metric, then shows them what, what attributes you, are, are sensitive attributes, and then it runs this audit and says, this is biased in this way, this is biased in this way. We're not at the point where we're sort of helping them correct that bias through this tool, where that's a separate project. Um, um, I want to sort of end with just giving you a few examples of this sort of how a lot of governments are thinking about bias and fairness, right? So, so this is kind of, this is illustrative. This is, today this is what we do, right? We, we pick our, our, our favorite metric, AUC, precision, recall, something, and we pick the model that's the best. And then we often sort of find that they might, might not be these types of things. Now this is illustrative and it's theoretical. In practice, you don't always get this. So here's a real project. Um, and this is by this disparity in false discovery rate right, for, for, by, for gender. And in this case, if we only looked at the x-axis, you know, we might pick one of these two. And most likely, we would just pick them at random, right? Half the people, like it, they look the same to us, so we'll just pick one. But if we had the other one, we know exactly what we would pick. But if we cared about fairness more, we might want to come back on and, and reduce precision. But the same problem, if my interventions were, these are, these are punitive interventions. So the, I don't, you know, this is false discovery rate. If I now wanted to, to look at false emission rates, so false negatives, I don't have that trade-off. In order for, for me to be fair, which is going to be, you know, fairness is basically the, over here. I'm, I can't get there. I'm going to have to basically go to 0% precision in order to get fairness. Um, and so the question becomes, when you get to this stage, what do you do? Um, and, and those are the trade-offs. So here's another, let me give you a different example. So this is, this is that diabetes example. This is working with a hospital that's, that's moving from that, um, that biased diabetes screening system to a much more data-driven one. And so when we built that system, this is what they do today, right? This is the false emission rate, so higher is worse. So their current system is pretty bad for what they changed to today. Pretty bad for older people, 40 to 70, 70 plus. It's bad for Native Americans and, and Native Hawaiians, and it's kind of equal in male and female. So when we built our machine learning model, we said, okay, let's optimize for overall performance. 
precision at the number of people they can intervene on. It resulted, so the current one is orange, our machine learning one that's optimized for kind of best overall is blue. And blue is better for everyone than orange. Right? For every group, blue does better. Except it's it, it's increasing inequities, right? So so now orange was same for was bad for both 40 to 70 and 70 plus, but blue is much worse for 70 plus. Um, same over here. If you now see, you know, it's it's doing better for everyone, but it's doing more better for some people than others. And so what this leads to the question of what do we want in society? Do we want overall diabetes rate to come down? Or do we want the diabetes rate to be, you know, if we continue um, doing this, what might happen is diabetes rates go down for everyone, but they go down much faster for certain people than others. And then we get to a point in five or 10 years where you have very disproportionate diabetes rates, um, which is actually already happening, right? They're already there, but that some of it is through for different reasons. Um, but that question is not a machine learning question, right? That's a values question of what is the world you want to create? You want to create a world where, where we have, everybody has diabetes, uh, which is fair, but not just, right? Uh, or do you want a world where, where you can, where you can sort of try to, try to be a little bit more, you know, you can do better for certain people, but other people get left behind. How do we decide that? Right? How do we, what conversations do we have? Who should be deciding it? Who should be involved in those conversations? A lot of this work involves these conversations. I'll give you, I'll skip through this to give you a different example. This is some work, last example before I finish. Um, this is some work with Los Angeles, where this is with their city attorney's office. And they came to us with help with, they wanted to, um, their goal is to reduce the number of people coming back for kind of misdemeanors, small things. And typically what happens is, um, this is for not for big crimes, or this is you, you were trespassing, you were doing some, uh, you had a, you were, you know, sleeping in a construction zone, things like that. So what happens is the police arrest these people. Police will take them to, to court. And then the city attorney's office, somebody has to show up to, 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 for the trial. And they typically have a couple of hours to show up to this trial. And so they have no time to actually sit down, even look at the history of these people, prepare a case file. So they came to us and said, look, for all these people, there is this ideal thing we can do. They need a diversion program. They need to be connected to their social services. We want to connect them, but we just don't have the time to go to court, uh, to go to court prepared. And what happens when most times is the judge, we go in, the judge sort of, you know, might say 15 days in jail. The jails in LA are full, so 15, anybody that gets fewer than 30 something days um, uh, just pleads out. So they go out. Next week, the police arrest them again, come back go out, come back. Um, and so what they want to do is say, if you can help us identify from the city attorney's office who's going to be com coming back uh, and being arrested for misdemeanors, we can prepare case files for them beforehand and be ready and make the connections with the social services, make the connections with what we need, um, and kind of improve the outcomes for these people. One, we had to kind of work with them to make sure that what, where is this list going to? Who has access to it? Does the police ever get access to it? And so, so we kind of dealt with all of that. And that came from one more contractual things, but also from sort of trust and collaboration with them over the years. As you know, I wouldn't work, this work would only happen with this team. This will not go outside that and contractually as well as a bunch of other things. But the second piece was when we went back to them and we sort of built, we built sort of our first system. We said, look, this system is, you know, of, of the people we give you, the 100 and something people, 75% of them come back. And so it's 75% efficient. But it has a much higher false positive rate for Hispanic people than white people. And they said, well, looking at your, you know, what, what we're doing and what you've talked about, our interventions aren't punitive. All we're doing is preparing a case file for them. So if we prepared a case file for some Hispanic person and they didn't come back, it doesn't hurt anyone. We didn't do anything uh, punitive to them. So can we then just pick the most efficient model? And so I said, well, let's, let's look at it this way. So if you did that, um, what's going to happen is over time, you're going to help both you know, white people and Hispanic people, except you're going to help more 
by a higher rate white people than Hispanic people. And so this is what's going to happen. The recidivism rate today is high for Hispanic and lower for white. And this is what's going to get to. It's like the diabetes example. So with your 75% efficient model, this is the outcome we're getting to, is increased disparity in recidivism rates. We can offer you option number two, which is equal uh, in the machine learning. You know, it, it, it models that will have equal recall for both groups. And that equal recall is 2% less efficient. So instead of 75, it's 73% efficient. Here's what's going to result in. It's going to result in keeping the status quo disparity. They both go down, but the disparity remains exactly the same. And that's going to cost you 2% more. Option number three, if your goal is equal recidivism rate in the future, then you need to build the model that we have to build. It has to have recall for each of the races proportional to their prevalence rate. And that's going to cost at 68% efficiency. So there's a 7% cost of this definition of equity. Now, they're all equitable in some definition or other, but if the outcome you care about is equal recidivism rate five years, 10 years from now, then option number three is, is what we recommend. Um, and that's, so that's what they're doing now. That, that's what they're building is, is going. But it required kind of going from you know, false positive, false negative metrics, machine learning, to basically telling them about here's the outcome. If this is the outcome you care about, here's the cost of that outcome, and here's how you think about it. And then turning it in the back into models, metrics, all the changing, you know, everything, rebuilding the models. And, 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 but that's the conversation we all need to be comfortable uh, and have experience in having. Because that conversation is not a machine learning conversation. It's not a uh, what tool are you going to use, how are you going to implement it. It's a values conversation that we're not, like, I wasn't trained for these things. Right? It's, it's, I've stumbled upon these things, and, and, and I'm trying to learn how to have them by talking to people in ethics, in other areas, who have these conversations much more frequently. But I think we all need to be kind of in those positions so we can learn and not be kind of put in the middle and say, which metric should we use? Which is the most common question I get today from government agencies is, tell us what our fairness metric should be. I can't, can't tell you that. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a bunch more things we're doing in this area. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up, right, basically, what I sort of, again, this was, this was hopefully, we'll see how, you know, I, I need a control group somewhere else of similar people to see how effective this intervention was, right? I'm trying to get, my goal is to get all, a lot of you interested in doing this type of work. And it doesn't matter where you do it. Uh, wherever you are, you can start doing it, right? I think we, we, we have a lot of these tools today that give us, you know, we can easily make these tools into become making more efficient policies. I think we want to make sure that these efficient policies are not just efficient, but they're equitable. Uh, and sometimes they might be in conflict. Um, we do need to do, you know, change how we do education, and I think we're getting there. I think we need to kind of focus on research on, on, on a lot of these types of problems. It's not easy. These problems don't come to you. You have to go to them typically. Um, so one of the things we're doing at CMU is trying to figure out how do we make it easy for people to plug in. If we have test beds and if we have infrastructure with data and problems and people, how do we make it easy for other people to come in and, and, and work with us uh, through these, these types of collaborations? So uh, I hope you guys get, you know, we're... If you're, if you're currently a student, you know, there are many ways to get involved. There are, we're, we run a data science for social good program. We're going to be running it at CMU. A lot of other universities have also started running these programs. So, so again, it doesn't matter which one you go to. Try them out. They're really good hands-on experiences of working these things. For our program, the applications are going to open up on, on Monday. We're hiring, you know, a bunch of people, postdocs, software engineers, senior people at CMU at this intersection. Um, we are also kind of starting these local data science for social good chapters where we can help um, people at universities and cities kind of help get started, connect them with local organizations and give them, give them some of the, the resources. And then we have um, a, a thing that we're launching. We've done a pilot which is kind of doing this type of work more, more virtually. So how do we allow people who are interested in helping out a few hours here and there, weekends, um, to plug in and, and help do these types of problems. So, this is solved for good. Um, we're, this is, we're the very early stages, so, so help us, you know, if you want to take a look at it, give us feedback uh, as, we, as we grow that. Um, but happy to, I know I went um, very long. Uh, so I would take questions now, but also I'm around for the rest of the day, so come, come find me, email me, happy to chat. Um, and thank you very much for listening.
I loved how you um, uh, kind of took these broad general ideas and models and you, you made them kind of uh, very specific, right? So you talked about Johnson County and how you had to bring, you know, some of these off-the-shelf models and then tailor them to the needs. The same thing with, you know, the, the driving example in a, in a developing country. One of the questions that I always have about this is, like, um, so much of what we do is driven by money. So, how, you know, some of the examples you gave were, like, government-supported, um, and I, I think there's two parts to it. One is oftentimes the groups that come to you for help are the ones that are already probably kind of doing things on their own. They're, they're probably the higher performers in general. Um, and then the second is, is like so many of these things, they're not things that you can just do simply. You have to invest time and energy. You have to even do experiments after. How do you support all this? Because we, I think one of the reasons why we get more, I mean, the NSF, the NIH, they fund us to like make the algorithm a little bit better you know, to, to, to make iris flower prediction better. Um, but, but nobody funds us to actually help people, um, and that's a challenge. It, it is. I mean, I think it is a challenge because we don't have infrastructure today to do this, right? Most of this is one-off. Uh, and even, you know, when I do this at CMU or Chicago, the first thing is that, you know, I, I can do it, but then if somebody else wants to work on this, how do I make it accessible for them? And because we just don't have that setup, we do have that setup. And you know, if, if if Facebook wants people to work on it, they just give them some money and laptops, right? Then you have access to the data, and then you can do things. And I think governments and, and nonprofits, one, they don't have the money, but more importantly, I think they also don't have people who understand their problems. Um, and, and so right now, you're not going to go to them with ideas because you might not know what their needs are. And you know, the ideas you might go to them to are your research ideas, and they'll look at you and say, well, why would I do this? Um, so I think, I think there is a lack of, of infrastructure. Um, and that's something I think my view is the universities have a responsibility to, to fill that gap. You know, we, it's our job to train ours to both sort of have an impact on the education and research, but also in the community that we live in. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, they're longer, it's a much longer conversation about tenure and incentives and, and papers. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a big bottleneck. Uh, so I don't, have a, I don't have an answer for you in terms of solution, but I think it is, it's a challenge that we have to find individuals who are kind of interested in doing it and they care about it and then they push through and make it, hopefully one of the goals is to try to make this easier for other people to plug in. And so if people have ideas around and if you're interested, you know, that's what we're trying to build happy to, you know, get feedback and suggestions on how to do it more, more effectively. Uh, hi, thanks for doing Hi. Yeah. Hi, okay, there we go. All right, use the mic. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk. And I, all the projects you've seen, you mentioned seem really good, and they, like, align with my sensibility of what good is. And I'm, but I'm wondering, like, they all seem to be developing and based on kind of creating these new infrastructures of sort of ubiquitous surveillance. And you mentioned several times in your talk, you know, obliquely the, the, what you refer to as like the former Department of Justice and the former EPA. And I'm curious, like what this, this, this idea, how you think about what practices we might be normalizing, like testing pregnant women for lead might seem to be really good, but with the precedents that we set with these, you know, very good projects, what, how do we think about how other people might use those when those become normalized? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question to, to think through before we do every project, right? I think, and when we do these projects, we, we, you, you do want to have the conversation of what are the possible benefits, what are the possible harms, could it be misused? Um, and that doesn't mean, I think, I think th there are sort of few ways of, of, of safeguarding against misuse. One is actual contractual and you know, legal ways. When you work on these things, so for example, every project we work on, one of the things that's, that's not negotiable is one, the code is open source, two is we can talk about what we're doing. And so part of it is transparency and openness helps us make sure that everybody in the world knows that this capability exists, that this information exists, and if it's misused, there are journalists that, who, can, who can come in and, and help disclose those types of things, right? That doesn't, that doesn't guarantee things. Um, so, so I think in general, whether, you know, we, we, all of these things are being used in, in a lot of different ways. The data that's there will be used in some way. And I think the goal is to have people inside government, outside government, everywhere, 
who understand these types of concerns, who understand these issues, have the same, have these values, um, and and work together. So I don't think any of these things are going to be magically, you know, tuned to like it cannot do any harm. I think that the risk is always going to be there. I think the question for us as society is how do we mitigate that risk? How do we educate people about around it? Um, and then how do we build these types of, of systems that makes make it really hard to do the wrong thing, right? How do we design the incentives? So there's no magic bullet there, right? It's not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to magically say, I've designed the system so it's guaranteed to do this because that's, that's not really possible in a lot of these things. Um, but I think the point of having, you want to have all these conversations. You want to have these conversations at the beginning. You want to have, so in the summer program that we run, we, we don't have an ethics curriculum in terms of like three lectures. What we ended up doing was every Friday afternoon is a session where we break up into small teams and we talk about the ethical implications of the phase of the project we're in right now downstream on different types of people um, so that we can start thinking about, hey, we're making these decisions now. What could happen down the road that could, that could help people, hurt people? What, what types of people? How do we include those people in these conversations now? Again, that's not a guarantee. None of this is a guarantee. We're still trying to figure out how we how we normalize those conversations um, so that they're part of the, the workflow. Um, and then how do we embed those values in a transparent way in these systems? Like that's the, for me, that's like if I if you're building a system, these types of values should be somewhere publicly posted. Those are that's your config file. That's public. That says I put this much weight to this many this types of people, this much weight to this type of people, which is totally uncomfortable. Um, something we're not trained for. But that allows us to have informed conversations about what this thing is doing as opposed to right now, you know, politicians have vague notions of we want equity and, and they're never going to define equity for anyone. So. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. First, so I want to preface this by saying that I really appreciate your talk and I think that if you were leading all of these projects that we have across this country about like fairness, uh, We'd be a lot of a lot people better. doing it, though. Uh, no, yeah, but I just want to. So, but I, I'm asking sort of a negative question. So I want to just preface that know, by saying I, know, I really appreciate exactly. your perspective, but I, I don't think I, a lot I can of people see share. that. Yeah, um, I'm Tony from the University of Washington, by the way, and thank you. Um, so, I'm really interested in the failure modes of this kind of work, and in particular, you said something which um, I found quite stressful to hear, which was that you know people don't come to you with these projects; you often have to go to them, and I think that. I would argue the exact opposite because as data scientists or as machine learning experts, we offer a really robust set of tools that, as you've already pointed out, are really best used by people who have a perspective on how they are being used. And I would go insofar as to say that what you just said is, you know, posting values publicly. We, we should actually be voting on how these tools are being used. Like how human works, beings right? in, in, in the society that are involved in how in, – in, who are going to have their data fed to a machine learning model deserve the right to be voting on their ballots as to whether or not these systems are going to be put in place and what value systems are going to be put in place. Because as soon as you start assigning an individual in these systems to elucidate those values and encode them then in a fairness metric or something like that, you're, you're disenfranchising whole groups of people from being able to make that decision. So what I'm asking, I guess, is um, have you seen or do you think that we're going to see this sort of like more democratic inclusion in this machine learning in social good space? So two, two points. One is when I was saying people are coming to me and, and, and other way around, I'm going to them and not they're coming to me. I was generalizing a lot of us when we start off doing this work, we have to go out and elicit these things, right? Right now, there are more people coming to me than I can, I can possibly help. And I, but that, that's only because I've done all of these different things. That's, it's, that's not the norm. It's really, when I talk to sort of students, junior faculty members who are trying to do this work, you have to go out and convince them that they, they, can, be, they can be useful for these things. Because for one thing, I think universities have gotten a bad rep for going out and eliciting these projects purely for research purposes and not for the short-term impact that these organizations need. So I think, I think that, that's true. The second point of, I think we can argue about sort of democratic ways of, I think they, the, the world needs to be included in these decisions. I don't know if voting is the right, and the next panel will tell you a lot about that. Uh, I don't know if voting is the right way of doing it. Um, but I think, and there are some, there's a lot of work going on in that area, right? So there's a team in New Zealand, um, um, Rima, she's running it. They, um, they are trying to think about 
ways of incorporating different types of stakeholders um, that are involved in any type of system, their feedback into the design and inclusion of, of different things into that. Should this feature be used in there? How do, if this was important, like, is this data relevant here? Is, and not just from the people who are collecting the data, but the people whose data is being collected. So I'm absolutely with you on the, the people that are c touched in any way by any of these systems need to be part of this process. Now, whether it's ballot voting, I, I just, I don't think that's the right approach um, because a lot of non-informed decisions get made that way. I think maybe community groups and, and, and it is, might be a better, better way of doing it. So no argument there. I think that's the way all of these systems should be built. Um, and I hope they, they, they do. So. Um, so I've worked on some things like this before for uh, legal cases. And I have run into the issue before of going back to the one example that you had about lawyers not having enough time to go about reviewing case files, essentially being asked in order to make reports that just take, I don't have enough time in order to go about doing things. And some of the particular requests that you end up getting in this way, in like this line of work is for things that are, for constraints that are either extremely hard to quantify without any sort of reasonable amount of thoughts, or you can quantify, but you know, the law is not prepared to deal with solving thousands of very difficult, hard, difficultly hard combinatory optimization problems over really massive spaces. Um, have you ever run into anything like this? And if so, how do you deal with it? I'm guessing yes. <laughs> I mean, any real problem is hard, right? Like we, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying all of this is easy, but neither is, you know, targeting ads to millions of people really fast or neither is high, high frequency trading. Those are hard problems, but we figured them out. Uh, these are important problems and hard problems, so they should be prioritized. So, I mean, you're right that uh, these things don't come well packaged. They don't come as tractable problems. Um, and, and that's sort of my point about teaching students problem formulation, is that's the first piece, is trying to understand what, how do I formulate this so that I can solve it in a way that's better than what's being solved today, not perfect. That's the other thing is a lot of, lot of the, when I'm working with people like, well, this is not gonna be perfect, so why should I do this? It's gonna, like, well, it's not perfect today either. Um, I, I, so, separate conversation, but it's uh, just because I think it's hard and the perfect solution is intractable doesn't mean there is an intermediate, uh, isn't an intermediate solution that's better than today that can get us to an improved world that's helping, because every time, every day we don't help those people, you know, like, we don't need to wait for the perfect, but that doesn't mean that we can, can continue. So I think, I think a lot of it is, what, I, what I'm proposing is if we spend time on these types of problems, looking at kind of the, 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 the short-term things, that opens you, that one gives you the, the credibility, two gives you the relationships, and three gives you the depth to then come up with a large set of these longer-term research questions that you can spend time working on if that's what you care about, but now they're directly applicable to the problem you started with because you understand them. And you have the relationship to then push it back into that and, and see the impact that otherwise you might not see. Um, so I, again, yes, absolutely right. These things, most of these problems, the, the actual solution is much, much, much more complicated. The one that we are implementing as step one is, is not complicated, but that step one allows us to then iterate and, and get to the more complicated if there is a, a, a reason to. It might be that you move on to the next one for that point because it's more the higher impact on that side. Thank you so much, Reid. Uh, this was, uh, we have had a lot of uh, intense discussion, uh, and so we're kind of into our break time. Uh, quick bio break, and we'll start with the panel discussion at 10.15. Uh, men's restrooms that side, women's that side. There's coffee outside. Uh, don't allow food and drink in the auditorium. Is this a PC? Uh, yeah. Oh, great. I think you can just plug in.
Is there an opening on that side? Yeah. Um, is this a, is this a yeah. USB? Yeah. It could be. Yeah. 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 Nice. So if you pull it up. Yeah. Um, Hi. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good. And you? Great. Do we... Uh, we're just going to... You're just going to sit. Okay, Am I yeah. not able to... Oh, okay. I just... I can't... Yeah. I found, I found this. So... Okay. Here. So... I'm going to... You need to go to the... Uh, D. Right. So let me open two yeah. windows. This is yours, right? No. Uh, this is. Yeah. Okay. Which uh, one is? Two slides. Yeah. It's either a PDF or a PowerPoint. Yeah. So it's here. All right. So when you guys start, I'm gonna say. Um, right. When you guys start, when you guys start, just push this VGA light yeah. off, and it'll show. All right. I'm I want to do that. Yeah. Does it show? That's it. And, and so this is this is the PDF version, right? Or is it? Or is it, do you have to like it's, it's a PowerPoint. It's PowerPoint. And if I do this, yeah, All right. Okay. Hi. How are you? Great to see you. Good. And if oh you've got you've got a uh, uh, visuals. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, are we going to, uh, I'm here, and the, uh, is the idea that we are going to sit at the table here? Well, or we're going to have... Uh, happy to follow your lead. Yeah, Ray and Ren and okay. Lisa, because I can sit here, I can also sit in front of you. I'm sitting in front of you. Great, perfect. All right, All right. great. Okay. Okay.
And you want us to... Uh, All right, why don't we uh, get started? <clears throat> My name is Mike Traugott, and I'm a principal investigator on a MIDAS-supported project in the social sciences. <coughs> and we have, I hope, one of the interdisciplinary teams of the kind that Raid was talking about. Um, the project was formed around three main issues. Uh, but we're going to be talking about one of them today, a project related to um, political communication. This uh, project started with a collaboration we had with the Gallup organization. During the 2016 campaign, they collected 500 interviews a day for the entire campaign. We had a database of almost 60,000 interviews. Uh, those surveys contained a question uh, have you heard or read anything in the last couple of days about Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Two separate questions. And if the respondent said yes, then they were asked in an open-ended fashion, what was that? And it was recorded verbatim by the interviewer. We had large samples of tweets that mentioned Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, uh, <clears throat> primarily from uh, the public, but we also had a set of tweets from journalists who were covering the campaign. We had a content analysis of news uh, about Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump that uh, ended up consisting of uh, hundreds of thousands of different articles. And part of our project was an analysis of uh, fake news. We, we applied uh, a wide variety of um, data management and data analysis tasks to these data files, and it has resulted in the text of a book, the cover of which is uh, up on the screen to be published this winter by Brookings University Press. We, we worked, as I said, in this interdisciplinary team uh, on campus that involved people from ISR and from uh, the School of Information. We had computer scientists and social scientists. We had collaborators from Georgetown University, from the Department of Computer Science and, people, uh, and Political Science, and people who were at the uh, McCourt School of Public Policy and their massive data uh, institute. And uh, we're not going to have a formal presentation this morning. We're going to have a conversation that's going to be uh, led and moderated by Ray. But I want to introduce the team members who are here. You, you already know Ray from his, uh, his uh, prior presentation. John Lab from uh, Georgetown Political Science in McCourt. Lisa Singh, Computer Science. Uh, and McCourt at Georgetown. Uh, my colleague at Michigan, uh, Jaren Budak, who's helped with the program for the symposium, who's in the School of Information and also in uh, Computer Science. My home now is in the Center for Political Studies at the Institute for Social Research. So I'm going to, uh, I want to show you one more thing, which is the table of contents of the book to show you the breadth of uh, coverage. And now I'm going to turn things over to Raid to get us started. One thing that wasn't part of uh, Raid's introduction is that he has some experience in politics. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not politics in the policy sense, but politics in the partisan sense. He worked with Barack Obama's campaign. And so uh, we thought he would be a great moderator. OK. Um, I am not going to talk very much. You've already heard my monologue, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, this, this project, I think it, it's, uh, I read a few chapters they sent me, you know, 
uh, four chapters, so it's, it's very interesting, and I think especially for a book that's focusing on politics, there's a lot of good data in here uh, and, and good analysis, so that's already, you know, uh, great. So I'm actually, I, I'm going to start asking them some questions, um, but then I'm hoping that people will, will, will jump in because it's a topic I think we all should care about. Um, um, so I, I guess my, my first question was in, to, to Michael's sort of point was, the, what was the motivation for each of you to kind of come into this project? Like what, what was the, that was, because it's hard to build these types of teams. Um, and so what, what got you all motivated and interested in, in, in joining together? Uh, I can start in the sense that I had a prior relationship with Gallup and they asked me about in a, a pilot study for taking these kinds of measurements in 2016. But I'm also a political communication scholar and my prior work has, was, has been primarily in the area of um, attention, media effects, attention to media and using the survey method. So we ask people what kinds of media they're attentive to, uh, what, maybe when was the last time, what did they remember. Uh, these are survey questions that have uh, very substantial measurement errors associated with them. And uh, in, the, in the Gallup... For the computer science people, you want to tell what measurement error means. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Half joking, half serious. No, no. So there's all kinds of measurement error uh, uh, that would be related to this. One of them would be memory problems. One of them would be social desirability bias. I pay a lot of attention to the media. Uh, I, look at, I look at political news all the time. Um, and this Gallup open-ended question was intriguing because it shifted the emphasis to a notion of retained information. What is it that you're hearing about? It could be from any number of sources, including non-media sources, interpersonal communication, and so on. So it was an interesting concept. And then uh, I, in particular, was stimulated by the call from Midas and thought about putting this team together. I have other colleagues at uh, ISR. Ragu is here somewhere. Pam Davis Keene is part of this other team that was studying parenting and we have a project that's looking at these kinds of survey measurement errors and so on. So it was, it was a good chance, a great opportunity to look at a variety of issues that I've been interested in for a long time but in a different way. Uh, so what brought me into this? What brought me into this was a phone call by, by Mike. I'm very, very happy to have received. Uh, so I'm a computer scientist by training, and um, during my PhD, I was telling myself that I was doing computational social science, but really, I was a computer scientist applying my hammer to uh, to problems that I see around. So I've been trying to escape that. I've been trying to actually be interdisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, since. I could, and um, so I think that that's why I'm at, I'm here. That's why I'm at a university. Hopeful that uh, that um, allows for these interdisciplinary uh, spaces. Uh, it's also kind of our identity as, as school of information uh, faculty, and uh, so this kind of interdisciplinary space is exactly where I think, uh, like what you were saying, uh, right, where where good things happen. Um, so it was the the team was really uh, exciting, and I I think I remember like the first meeting I I joined, and uh, where they were telling me about all this rich data and uh, different methods that people were bringing in. So um, it was sort of a no brainer. All right. So um, I had interests coming into this both. Um, topical and methodological that made me really interested in uh, this project. Um, prior to this, I um, had been interested in uh, what in the field of communication and political science we call media effects, but we might call in regular language media persuasion. Like, does the content of media actually persuade people and change their political opinions, and under what circumstances does it do that? Um, and I had a couple of the papers in my first five years of my career were, were, all, were papers that tried to get uh, better causal leverage on that. And I had a methodological interest also. Um, I've been interested in using um, 
open-ended survey data and figuring out better ways of analyzing open-ended survey data, um, uh, especially in areas where survey researchers often used what survey researchers would call closed-ended questions, but regular people would call multiple-choice questions. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, to get at things, and often when they are, those, those questions are vague. Uh, one thing I was interested in before this project was um, uh, studying confidence institutions questions, um, which are, are fairly, are extremely vague. You know, how much confidence do you have in business in the United States or something else like this? And you get, and you have huge time series on this, and I've, I've been trying to do it with the press, like how, confidence are you, how much confidence do you have in the news media and the press? And it's a multiple choice question. And getting, trying to understand what people actually mean by asking open-ended follow-ups, right? And, but previous to this, I had done a lot of open-ended, analyzing open-ended survey questions, you know, with research assistants, reading them. So the human method. <laughs> um, and that is a, that has a lot of advantages to it. Um, but when you really scale that, and you have a problem where you think it'd be really useful to use open-ended survey questions, and you're going to have a lot of responses like we have here, you know, 400, 500, or 500 people a day over the whole, whole, whole campaign, and use that as a measure, as we do here, as a measure of news reception and retention, right? What information in the news environment have people uh, uh, encountered and remembered enough to tell back to a survey researcher? Um, if we're going to use that, we're going to have, and we are lucky enough to have a large amount of data, we're going to have to figure out a way to, uh, it would be great if we could figure out a way to analyze that automatically. Um, or at least compare, or, you know, analyze that automatically would be a lot easier than hiring a lot of people to analyze it ourselves, to analyze it themselves. Um, even though we might want to, you know, cross-check and verify if the computer is getting us, giving us the same thing as, as a person would. So, um, and that's the thing that I continue being interested in is better ways of analyzing uh, open-ended uh, survey responses um, in this area and other areas. So, so I, you know, I, I hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. I mean, what we found in the project is that, uh, as in any project, um, there are huge potentials and also challenges you didn't know when you started the project of, of these multiple, multiple types of text, analyzing them and comparing the multiple types of text, comparing your results from these multiple different types of text in different, ver in different formats. So maybe we can talk about that. Uh, so if, if I'm being truthful, and I guess I should be, um, <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and that's the honest to God truth. Uh, I was, uh, I met Mike and uh, I met um, Frank from Gallup uh, or spoke to him uh, and uh, Mike was super excited. I have a strong interest in understanding social media data, understanding its biases, understanding what can be learned from it. Uh, I've never actually worked with traditional survey data prior to this collaboration. Uh, and so I've learned an enormous amount about survey data through this collaboration. Um, but um, Mike, you know, called me up and said, Gallup wants to work with us, and can we do a weekly report all through the election? And I thought about it, and I said, oh, let's try. Let's see what happens if we start analyzing these, these uh, data sets. And, it was really quite fascinating. I learned so much about political science and I learned so much about what people remembered and I was just appalled by some of the things that were going on and it just it made me more and more aware about the political science and more and more interested in it. So, so yes, I guess, what, what did you guys find? What were some of the, the big highlights? I'm sorry, what kind of the media. Highlights of the media. Sure. Okay, um, so just to, if we we're going to talk about the the, the text data, I, I, I can talk about I can talk about some of the text data and some of what we found in the the analyzing the tweets throughout the campaign, analyzing the open-ended Gallup questions that asked what people had heard recently and uh, what people found in the newspapers. So one big thing we found is that um, that and this, that is kind of the initial headline that that. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton used some of this data in her book about the campaign. What happened? She 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 published some of our data slightly before we got to publish on our data. So, we'll give her an exception for because it's Hillary Clinton. Um, the um, <laughs> uh, which which is this this finding that in sixteen, just looking at the Gallup data, right? Um, people um, 
repeatedly remembered hearing about the Clinton's email scandal throughout the campaign, and we have a, we have a figure that shows that, and we and she showed a and we have a figure that shows that like every um, throughout the campaign, a huge percentage of people hear about that constantly, and um, other stories come and go, but everyone's reporting reporting hearing about that, and about Donald Trump. Um, uh, when you ask what have you heard about Donald Trump, stories rapidly come and rapidly go, um, and and there and we and then fade very quickly. The stories um, people stop reporting that they've heard about it. Um, so whether it's uh, the Alicia Machado story at the end of the first presidential debate um, and his treatment of her, um, whether it's his tax returns and not paying taxes, which you probably have also forgotten, but was a story during one of the presidential debates. Like just like our survey respondents, you've also forgotten. Um, <laughs> they forgot quickly too. Um, uh, and stories like that came came and went very quickly. Um, another big finding is that the Gallup open-ended data, what people reported hearing, seemed to behave quite differently than our analysis of the text of newspaper articles and our analysis of tweets of journalists and actually random sample of all tweets, but let's focus on tweets of journalists. So we, we focus most, mostly our attention on the tweets of jur political journalists and the newspaper coverage of the campaign. The, both of those, what journalists were tweeting about and what is actually appeared in newspapers, believe it or not, despite our concerns about newspaper coverage, was actually fairly consistent and didn't end um, wasn't as biased towards the e Clinton email story, didn't as disproportionately cover the e Clinton email story actually, and didn't jump around as much based on the current story. Like they consistently covered certain topics throughout the campaign um, that we could find, that we could measure in newspapers and that we could measure journalists actually tweeting about. Um, and it was, but what did people, despite our measures of media content and what journalists were thinking about, what people were hearing was jumping, was jumping around in the latest story and then they'd forget and they were always talking about the Clinton email scandal. So these different measures of text and streams of text actually behaved quite, they had some similarities, like there was a correlation <laughs> between the, when a topic would come up in one stream and when a topic would come up in the other stream, but it, that correlation was not super strong. Um, and you, if you just look at the visualizations of the different ones, they, they, um, they did not mirror each other. And one question going forward is, is I think, we, we speculate some of it in the book, I don't think we've nailed it down, is kind of why those streams and our text analysis of those different streams were so different and how much of it, well, the big question is how much of it is reality and how much is it of it is our measurement? Because it's, it's actually a big challenge to measure these different streams of text in a comparable way <laughs> um, because they're very different types of text. And um, other people could talk about those challenges uh, uh, too. But the, so those are some of the big things. I guess one of the things I would ask is you found that was the coverage. Yeah. Um, and this is how what people, how do you connect that to, to actions that people took as, as a result of that? How, what is that connection to, here's what we want people were hearing. Um, how, do they, how, do you, how do you then connect to what they did, what, whether they voted, whether they didn't vote, who they voted for? Let me say something about that quickly, because first of all, we don't have two colleagues here who are teaching this morning, uh, Stuart Soroka and Josh Pasek. Um, and Stuart did a lot of sentiment analysis of uh, both uh, the news content uh, and also of the open-ended survey questions. Josh did the work with the story life and the comparison of um, the length of time uh, an item was in the news and then it was in the comments of the um, respondents in the survey. One problem of uh, da the data collection was that Gallup did not collect voter preference items. So we don't have any connection, direct connection in our analysis between the open ends and that. We have an indirect measure, which is they, they did measure every day favorability ratings of the candidates. And so we could look at the connection between the comments that people made and, and favorability ratings uh, in, a, in a time series aggregated way, not at the individual level because these were uh, separate cross sections each day. Um, but there was a, a lagged relationship, again, a, a kind of a, a modest correlation, but by social science standards, a reasonable one. Um, 
uh, between the sentiment that, or, or the, what Stuart measured actually was the net sentiment, the difference in the positive and negative sentiment between Trump and uh, uh, Clinton, and the relative favorability of the two candidates in the Gallup data. But I think another part of this story is about um, the fake news element and the fake news content, and that's something that you're in. Yes, uh, so in regards to fake news, so again, we don't know how people voted. So we only know what stuck with them, which I think is at least halfway there. So we usually, at least as computer scientists, when we're looking at these kinds of questions, we're kind of focusing on only social media data and we're like, we're kind of limited to that versus now at least we're able to connect that to kind of things that stuck with people. So, uh, so when we look at um, in the fake news chapter, when we're looking at the uh, prevalence of fake news and the net favorability of, uh, of Clinton over time, so how much more people were favorable uh, towards Clinton compared to Trump, they're all really bad, but com in, in relation, uh, you actually see a very strong uh, relationship between uh, the uh, prevalence of, of uh, fake news and, and uh, this uh, net favorability, but it goes um, the kind of, again, this is all correlation, not a causation, but uh, at least if you look at uh, cross correlation, so you can look at which one was moving first, it's actually uh, how uh, the one that's moving first is favorability, and it seems like fake news is responding to that. So uh, as people were becoming more uh, positive towards Clinton, uh, that uh, was followed uh, in, in just a few days with an increase in fake news production and consumption. So that at least uh, tells you for that particular kind of stream, for that particular kind of question, which hopefully we all care about, it seems like they were very attuned uh, to what was happening with the, with the campaign and uh, very much in line with what was, uh, what was going on there. So, but also the other thing that we can do when we are with the, with the um, um, uh, retained uh, information data that we're looking at, we can also look at that uh, across different um, groups of people. So if you look at, for instance, how, what are the people that are leaning Democrats saying versus leaning Republicans saying, then you're, and also what they are, what they are saying about Clinton and, and Trump, you're seeing quite a bit of uh, audience fragmentation in terms of, at least for Clinton, the kinds of things that people were saying were, for instance, a lot more uh, aligned with, with fake news coverage compared to the traditional news coverage, but you are not really seeing that for, uh, for Trump. Uh, so, uh, and that again, you know, we don't, we can't really connect that all the way through, but if you think about the fact that the tr with Trump conversation was moving around quite, quite a lot, with Clinton it was very uh, focused and those kind of repeated uh, exposure, as we know from, from past work in, in political communication, matters a lot. And, and we see that in, in this campaign in a uh, kind of, um, asymmetric kind of way for the for the candidates, and we it's, it's you know not we're not we can't really say fake news caused it. It's not I I, I wouldn't say that at all, but it definitely went the way that uh, uh, fake news uh, agenda setting was uh, was for. So I think that's uh, one of some of the findings that we have from uh, from that chapter. I mean, as, as one of the computer scientists on, on on the project, you know, you were talking about. A lot of the challenges in dealing this type of data, or even the weekly reports. Um, how, how what, what were the challenges that you guys faced, and sort of what, 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 how did you deal with them? Yeah. So, hello. Switch to it. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, so, just at a broad level, if we think about the different techniques that were used through this book. Um, we had, you know, kind of standard um, survey analysis with regressions and so on. We, um, we did um, frequent word analysis. We did sentiment analysis. We did topic analysis. Um, we did event analysis. Um, and um, we did some network analysis as well. So just to kind of talk about the different types of analyses, and when you think about those in the context of text, particularly text that's partial and noisy and short, um, our algorithms, and this is to all of you computer scientists who are interested in algorithms related to, to text, our algorithms are horrible. Um, and uh, so 
Uh, so we could never actually use a fully automated algorithm. Everything we did was semi-automated, where we started out with, um, with frequent words or frequent sets of um, items that we understand, understood people were talking about, and we had people at Gallup and, and, and our, our, our political scientists on the team look through these words, start putting um, words together into meaningful topics, Yes, we used LDA. Yes, we used non-negative matrix factorization. Yes, we used all those wonderful things we have. They don't work. Um, the other problem that we had was um, with these verbatims, we had the issue of um, people spelling things, abbreviating things. So we had a lot of things called synonym dictionaries that we created to help us uh, with some of those types of problems that we saw. To, Cleaning the data was a really big issue. Um, so, so it was a lot of fun, but what we found was that all these tools need to be continued, we need to continue to work on them in these new domains. They work very well where the text is richer, longer, um, more, co more coherent, but in spaces where that isn't the case, um, we haven't developed sophisticated enough models for those. And in terms of a takeaway, just as a computer scientist kind of watching and, and working with political scientists, there, were, there, there's, there was a, um, to me, there were kind of three takeaways from, you know, and again, this is me also very interested in, in the um, topic of Clinton versus Trump. Um, this was a really negative campaign. So nobody, these candidates were just not liked, you know? So it was just who, who was disliked less was kind of one of the things that seemed to emerge a little bit. Um, and the debates really helped Clinton an enormous amount. And, you know, it looked like she might just get over the, the un unfavorability and she might make it through. And that Comey announcement was huge. I mean, it just, if you look at any of the figures in the book, and I wish we, we just brought one just to kind of show, Oh, you have one, so, so great. So um, it just completely um, changed the trajectory of uh, what people were thinking about at that moment, right? We could, we, that was what we were able to see. We don't know where they got their information from, Twitter, newspapers, TV, wherever it was that they got it from. But that announcement switched what they were thinking about for her to email. And that's a trust thing, right? If you're thinking about how untrustworthy she is, I think that, that kind of stands out. Okay, so yeah, so we have figures, so we can, we can show this one, can show this one yeah, figure yeah, I not? think is, um, is telling um, of that. Um, and then the third thing that I would say that kind of stands out is um, I think in political research, uh, there's a, um, and the political scientists can correct me if I'm incorrect, but there's, um, it's unclear about the relationship between different types of events and uh, the impact of these events. And uh, we were able to look at some of these different events that occurred, and these negative events that occurred for Clinton, they really did capture the attention. Um, and whether it was because Trump kept talking about them or whether it was because the media did or whomever, but you know, when she had health issues, when she had um, issues uh, with email um, and different announcements, they really did capture it. So those were my three big takeaways, uh, this figure, the red is email. So, um, so you can see that she could never quite get away from email. Um, this is, these are the topics that people, these are the topics that people reported in the Gallup open-ended hearing about Hillary Clinton recently. Uh, in the uh, last couple days. In the last, in the last couple days. Um, and so this is starting, this is starting in the middle of July. Um, and the red, the red topic is the email topic. Um, and the, uh, the, the, um, yeah, so the green topic is Clinton's health problems. Uh, you know, that starts being discussed after September 11th and then drops away. Um, and then the, uh, Comey letter, first one is on October 30th. Uh, and that's, can you see my, yeah, that's right here. Right? So that's, that's the first Comey letter. And you can see that this is the second Comey letter, which, uh, you know, exonerated her, um, that sort of. Uh, and so, so that's what you can see at the end. Um, I could tell you what these other uh, colors are. 
The yellows is, is just a general debates topic. There was a lot of, there was a lot of mentions that related to things that happened in debates that weren't specific to any of the other topics. Um, we could talk about that more. I can show you, Lisa, do you want me to just show the, the Trump one as a comparison? Sure. I think. So this is the Gallup's. So, so just, just to highlight sure. your email never goes away except for when she's gained, you know, negative health or um, the debates, right? So the debates uh, each pop up and she's, she's getting a lot of visibility and favorability there. Yeah, so this is the comparable figure for what people say they have heard about Trump. And so it's like this. For, um, and this is what I... What? I was just going to say, this is topics again. So, um, you know, this is a semi-automated approach where we started with, uh, uh, you know, I already explained that. But... Um, I, I can also show the, lead, the color legend if, it, if it's useful. So the, the big thing... It's on, a, it's on another slide here. This is a... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, but the big thing you actually don't need the legend for, for Trump is that just, this is what I meant about stories come and go for him. Like people, everyone says they've heard about something and then they, they, they stop mentioning it. Um, uh, so things don't stick with him, right? And he's a master of that. That still is the case, right? And, and the, what happened was the reason some of these topics don't look as prominent is because we had more than this number of topics. These are just the, the top ones. And he's just going back and forth between a lot of different topics. These were the top 12. Let me just add to this that one lesson of our experience was um, the importance of data visualization. Because Gallup didn't just donate the data. It was a, it was a part of a trade-off where we had to provide analytical summaries of the information back to them. We did that regularly, and we also, uh, in a couple of specific instances, provide information to the New York Times or the Washington Post. And we had large amounts of data, which were, uh, for, for these particular outlets, their websites, was not amenable to the presentation of statistical tables. And visualization was required to show uh, in, in, a, in a quick and interpretable way what was going on in the data. And Lisa was critical to the development of these visualizations as well as... I like pretty, oh. <laughs> I like pretty pictures. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and Stuart did a lot with uh, the, word, the word clouds as well. Yep. But uh, this notion of responding in real time, you know, within 48 hours, uh, and then figuring out a way to summarize the data because obviously even on a daily or a three day moving average there was too much to consume easily was another element of what we learned I'm curious actually so when i was you know in on the inside of these campaigns right um there, there are things you're trying to do and then there is you're trying to communicate something and you give speeches and then the media picks up certain things highlights them the 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 public picks up something and highlights them, and, and then the flow starts, right? The thing you're analyzing. Did you guys sort of, do you guys have an idea of what the campaign was trying? Like, if, if you showed this to the campaign, what, what would their response be? Like, yeah, we tried squashing this down and just kept going up, or we weren't worried about this. What, what were the kinds of, like, what would they, you think they would, I don't know if you've already done that, or, or if you, if, what would you think their, their response would be to these, these things? Well, I can say quickly that um, this will be a very difficult task for the 2016 campaign because of the NDAs that the Trump campaign had their staff manage. Hillary Clinton has this book, What Happened, in which she divulges a lot of their strategy uh, over time. But we don't know anything about that with regard to the Trump campaign. <laughs> Great. Yeah, here. Hello? Okay. So, um... As a lay person looking at this again, I think Trump was masterful in keeping email as the fundamental thing that he talked about and that went that, I mean, if his campaign wasn't trying to do that, they did it successfully anyways, because um, if we look at all these other streams, like we were talking about, um, email wasn't what was dominant in these other streams. So they weren't getting it from that other information, right? They were getting it from somewhere, perhaps television, perhaps other things, but perhaps the Trump campaign. Yeah, so 
So this is what people report hearing about Hillary Clinton, and the red is email, the email topic. And this is what, in our sample of national news, in our news, national newspapers coverage that mentions Hillary Clinton, the topics in that, and that's red is email. Actually, it's not a huge percentage of actually the the newspaper articles and national papers about Hillary Clinton, and not comparable to what people report hearing. Um, it's not even a bigger as bigger percentage of what people. Well, journalists were tweeting about. You think tweet is, well, journalist tweets are more in the realm of journalists gossiping and things like this. It might focus more on the sensationalist. You might think that. Uh, but if you look at, this is journalists tweets about Hillary Clinton. Uh, they they uh, hear, I mean, there's a jump with the Comey letter, but it's it's never a huge percentage of what journalists are, 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 are you know, commenting in real time. Uh, and you can, if, and if you don't think this is useful, you could look at the newspaper articles and, uh, Instead, but yeah, that's what I mean about the other measures don't don't, dis, don't other measures don't display this pattern that you find in what people remember. Um, you know, uh, maybe maybe journalists did not cover the campaign perfectly, but we don't find evidence that they are. We don't find a, like a, evidence that they their distribution and focus on topics is perfectly producing this. Yeah. But I guess a another maybe note that's kind of. We, we have been talking about maybe how this campaign has been different, but there are also a lot of ways this campaign was similar. And maybe, again, we're saying that they maybe didn't fail as much in covering email, although they actually did quite cover a lot. Uh, still not as much as how people are remembering, but in term, if we think about what did the, the, these news organizations uh, cover, uh, and you do see that like the um, media ecosystem is changing. So you could say, hey, maybe, Maybe they would not be focused too much focused on horse race or, or scandals or or negative negativity, but we so that's one thing that was actually consistent. So we do expect that to happen based on past uh, political communication research, and we, you do see that again in this in this campaign. So it, there was not as much focus on 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 policy uh, coverage, and there were a lot of things that the organizations could have focused on that did not really kind of make it uh, make it there. So there are certain ways that uh, is, uh, you know, what you would expect uh, in usual and in sort of the ways that uh, perhaps news organizations uh, fail the public. On that note, questions from the public. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to give you that microphone. <laughs> but I... It is, um, do you do you have a respondent characteristics, and do you see any kind of uh, uh, covariate distributions of the respondents that differ across these uh, this kind of uh, alignment with different uh, news cycles? So we have that for the for the fake news coverage, we're, uh, fake news of production and consumption. Uh, we have an analysis. I, it's not in uh, the book, it's a uh, work that followed that where we kind of moved beyond just looking at party ID and looking at uh, uh, gender, age, uh, uh, race. And at least for that particular question, you do see that um, um, uh, male respondents, uh, responses were a lot more aligned with, uh, with uh, uh, fake news coverage compared to uh, uh, traditional news coverage for Clinton, but not for Trump. So uh, you, you see a gender effect, and I think that we have seen that uh, for this campaign and for uh, uh, other um, political campaigns for uh, um, female um, um, candidates and uh, an age uh, an age factor. So older and, and male uh, were uh, better aligned for for fake news, but we didn't see an effect for race for that particular analysis. Uh, my question is: After uh, future campaigns read the book. Gallup being a large organization, could, could it, what would be the scale of surveys that a campaign would have to do on a weekly basis in order to get the sense of this? Is it, is it hundreds of samples or tens of thousands of samples? Well, <clears throat> it, as making an assumption about non-probability samples and the use of web surveys, it wouldn't be a very difficult effort to engage in. Um, it would depend on how reactive or responsive the campaign would want to be, but it, it would be fairly easy. The, the, I should have said these are telephone interviews with live interviewers. 
but it would be fairly easy to organize a web-based non-probability sample uh, ongoing data collection effort and to apply similar, uh, you know, analysis procedures. So it wouldn't be very hard at all. And, and, and uh, these would be national surveys, but there would be statistical uh, procedures modeling with, uh, for example, Mr. P, that would allow to, uh, the campaign to make state level or even smaller geographical unit uh, estimates as well for, for targeting. Can we, can we add that we, we do have some plans to do this, uh, do uh, something analogous to this in 2020, um, but we will not be using, but if, if the plan comes to fruition, we will not be using phone interviews. These are, these are cell, a combination of cell and landline phone interviews. Um, uh, but our partnership for uh, 2020 is with a different firm and they will be, and if, if that comes to fruition, uh, they would be all completed uh, uh, on a uh, computer or tablet, not over the phone. Uh, uh, so we're, we're moving. We're we're going to try that <laughs> uh, in in 2020, and tr but but try to do this this similar thing uh, in 2020. Oh, yeah. Um, so can you guys, in, from your work, were you able to predict why? The polls were so wrong in predicting that Hillary Clinton would win. Like, what went wrong? That was a disaster for data science and survey research. Like, why? I, I, can, I can answer this question because I get asked it a lot. Uh, and the first point is that the national polls were not very far off. They estimated a Hillary Clinton popular vote victory, and she won by about that amount. But it's important to remember that in the 2016 election, for the second time in the last five elections, we had a candidate who received the minority of the popular vote who won the Electoral College. And there were, there's, a, there's a very interesting report uh, published, presented by the American Association for Public Opinion Research, APOR, that you could read. There was a systematic bias in some state polls which the data aggregators, the results of which the data aggregators used in their models to predict the outcome. So their high levels of confidence, relatively high levels of confidence in a, a, a Clinton Electoral College victory came from the use of uh, data with errors in it. Um, we, we don't understand exactly why the data in these states were of lower quality. There are some explanations which are pretty clear. The polls weren't conducted very frequently in some states and not near the end of the campaign. Uh, and in general, the state level polls were conducted by local news organizations rather than national news organizations. They have smaller budgets. Polling is like any other kind of consumer product. You get what you pay for. And if you pay less, often you have issues or problems with measurement error. But um, I would say that the problem was primarily with statistical modelers and, uh, and data aggregators. It came from lower quality, lower level data in producing the electoral college estimates, but the national polls estimates of the national popular vote were pretty, pretty much on target. I want to have a different take on that interpretation. Uh, I feel the data aggregators got it wrong. They do it by simulation uh, for the electoral vote. But many of them fail to account for four or five Midwestern states have correlated errors. So they are not necessarily low quality. They are still two or three percent off, but they are off to the same direction. Most of the aggregators fail to simulate the concerted a bias. I think that lesson, if they don't learn, they will un continue to produce a poor forecast for the next election. I think this is, a point that, this is a point that's well taken in the sense that people who conduct pre-election polls uh, have to make a lot of assumptions, starting with who's going to vote, who, who the likely voters are, because turnout in the United States is just barely over 50 percent. 
And they use persistence forecasting in the sense that they expect the electorate generally to look like the electorate from the previous election. And one of the things that was different about the 2016 campaign was that turnout patterns differed uh, in uh, an urban-rural comparison, and they also differed in an education comparison. <coughs> and so by using a, a, a kind of a flawed model, I think that this contributed to these uh, errors, especially at the state level. And if anybody was looking for class projects with real data and, and election time predicting turnout, the data is really easy to get. Predicting individual urban turnout is a really, really, really hard problem. Um, so try, try giving that to your students and, and see what happens. Uh, I, I would just, I was getting too much into the weeds, that particular issue of whether state, state polling errors are correlated um, is, a, is a great one, and you should assume if you're modeling uh, the, the rectoral college that state errors are correlated. Um, the, I don't always agree with everything 538 and Nate Silver does, but they did assume correlated errors could happen, and, they, and their prediction was that Donald Trump, in the Electoral College, is that the state's polls are wrong, that Donald Trump has a 19% or 1 in 5 chance of winning, um, and got a lot of criticism for that, because they were the, of the modelers, they were the ones that assumed the most correlated, that the, that the errors would be correlated. And as, as Mike pointed out, the errors were, state errors were correlated because the state polls were poor, um, because they were sparse, and they, a lot of the state polls didn't, rate, didn't weight by education. The national polls were not poor, um, at least relative to other polls, and so they were not more wrong than the 2012 polls were. 2012 polls underestimated Barack Obama's performance by about 2 or 3 percent. He did about 2 or 3 percent better than the polls predicted. Um, and that's not in the far further off than that polling averages were, were here. Real Clear Politics does the simplest polling average, which really, which literally just averaging the polls over a certain time window, um, and that was off by 1.1 points. So, um, but you're right. You need to you need to have um, you need to assume state errors will be correlated. I believe 538's model actually did do that, and that's why they said they had one fifth chance. We'll take one last question with a short answer, hopefully. Hello. Um, so my question has to do with sort of the disconnect between um, what people were reporting versus what was being talked about. And I'm wondering, did you do any sort of analysis to kind of dissect um, the sources, uh, journalist sources, to see is it possible that voters are kind of being disproportionately affected by, say, liberal leaning or conservative, conservative leaning or internet sources, stuff like that? have something well, in your pockets she that's... Shut <laughs> she is definitely... <laughs> shut it off, actually. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things to keep in mind, just broadly, is, is that we don't have access to all the sources that people were listening to, right? Um, we have a very limited number of sources that, that, that they may have gotten their information from. Uh, and so to do a causal type of link is not going to be possible in this. But, um, but we are interested in understanding how um, journalists uh, are connecting to the public. And so we are looking at um, a liberal leaning, conservative leaning journalists and how they impact the public and, and who's following them and how they have their own clusters and connectivity. That's not part of this book, but that is part of a, a larger study that we're doing. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, but yeah, I think we want to be short. So, um, so, so we do want to look at some of the impacts. Uh, we understand that for 2020 to understand uh, public behavior, public um, interest and who they, public opinion changes, we might need to think a little bit more about sources that we didn't have this time around that we might have access to. But we were very focused on tech sources and, uh, and that was kind of the strength of what we were doing, but it may also be a limitation. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know I, so the book is coming out later this winter. Later in, the, in the winter, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much for one for the work and two being on the panel. So, thank you.
So we don't have a break right now. We are moving right into the next session. So, and, and I think uh, Charan is going to be chairing the session. So I'm going to invite her up. No, no. Oh, we're not taking a break. I can okay. unplug and take my, <laughs> take my uh, laptop out of the way here. Yeah. I should probably find the program that would be helpful. Should we plug? Oh, is this your laptop, Mike? No. Oh, no. This is the one. Well, then I will. Good, good. I'll plug you back. Where are those? For the speakers. I'll plug you back in so that the regular laptop is back. i got to figure out something. Figure out. Uh, are you sticking around for this session? Okay. Maybe I should ask for the. Uh, so, okay. I, well, should I just ask for the first speaker to come here? Uh, can we have the first speaker for the first talk session come up here? Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. All right, great. So, uh, this is a 15 minute talk. Uh, you might want to aim for 12 plus 3 for, uh, for the uh, like 3 minutes for uh, uh, questions. If you don't do that, we won't have time for questions, so it's up to you, but your limit is 15 minutes. Okay? So, I. Um, That, that sounds really smart. Yes, let's do that. Okay. All right. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. All right. So, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. This is the first research uh, talk uh, session of, uh, of our symposium. Uh, well, uh, we're be a little bit behind time, so I'll just uh, write, uh, jump right in. The first talk is uh, uh, by Wei Jing Tang uh, from University of Michigan, and the talk title is A Flexible Generative Framework for Graph-Based Semi-Supervised Learning. So, uh, thank you. So thanks for the introduction. And I'm glad to introduce our work for graph-based semi-supervised learning. Oh, yeah, thank you. So let's start with the classical semi-supervised learning. So we have a data set where only a small subset of individuals have labels. For example, on the right-hand side, we can see the blue and red points are the labeled data. And the gray means that they are unlabeled. And we, in the semi-supervised learning, we want to use both label data and unlabeled data to predict the labels for these great data points. Besides features of individuals, additional graph information between data points is often available. For example, the age between two nodes contains some relational information, and we want to use this graph information to predict the labels here. And this is called the graph-based semi-supervised learning setting. I'll give you a concrete example here. For example, we want to classify the political orientation of social network users. And each node is a user, and the edge between two users can be a friendship or retreat relationship. Each node, node features can be user profile or the user post. And we want to, like the label we are interested in here is the political orientation. Okay. And both user features and the retreat or friend relationship are used for to predict the outcomes. There are two groups of existing methods here. Um, the first one is the graph-based regularization. We assume that there are some, uh, they assume that there's some similarity over the local neighborhoods. For example, uh, as shown on this, on this picture. So, uh, for example, in the political orientation example, um, sorry, yeah, uh, for two users, two users who are French, for friends, are more likely to have the similar political orientation but it may not be true uh, when we think about the retreat graph because people, users from, two, from different or, um, political orientation may want to debate through retreat. Okay. So the second group is called the graph network, which is very popular in recent years. So they aggregate features from its local neighborhood to present the outcome. Basically like that, we, when we want to predict a user's political orientation, we're not only using its own features, but also use the features from its neighbors. So most of them are belong, uh, belong to the discriminative approach, so which treat the graph as fixed. Um, everything is conditional on the observed graph. So in our work, we propose a generative approach, which models the joint distribution of the features, graph, and labels together. The generative framework has the following advantage over the existing method. 
So first, by modeling the distribution of the graph, we can learn the underlying dis the structures of the graph. And there's a rich literature in the network science which tells us that the underlying structure do exist for bending real world graph. And second, by modeling the joint distribution, we can explore more general relationship among graph feature and labels. Moreover, the generative model can handle missing data situation. So for example, if there are some missing edges or some missing, missing features. So let's move on to the details of the generative framework, including how we construct a generative model and how we learn the model parameters. Okay. Let X and Y to represent the features and outcomes of N nodes, and G represent the graph, and we observe like here N nodes here, and we have like the edge set for N nodes. Okay. And we only have M labels. So in the sem graph semi-supervised learning setting, the outcome Y can be divided into two parts, Y observe and Y miss. So we want to infer Y miss based on the observed data, which, which includes the Y observe, the graph G, and all the features X. And we consider the following generative model uh, by factorizing the joint distribution of X and Y and G into these three parts. So we first have X, and we generate the labels from X, and the G is based on the X and the Y together. And we model the first two parts in a parametric way, so parameter by some theta here. For example, um, for the condition, conditional distribution of Y given X, we model, we model it through the multi-layer perceptron, which is a fully connected new network. And for the graph part, um, we use two popular models in the network science network science literature, which are uh, latent space model and stochastic block model. So both of them assume that the distribution of the graph can be factorized in the n square terms. They assume that the conditional, like the conditional independence among edges given the node features. Okay. And in the latent space model, they assume that there is a latent space. And whether there is an edge between two nodes only depends on their locations in the latent space. And here we take the X and the Y to be the latent space. In a stochastic block model, they assume that there are K different blocks. And whether there is an edge between two nodes only depends on the blocks they belong to. And here we consider the simplest case. When two nodes belong to the same group, they will share the probability P0 to have an edge. Otherwise, they will have another probability P1. So after we specify how to parameterize the model, how could we learn it? Ideally, we want to maximize the likelihood of observed data, the y miss g conditional x. But it is usually computationally intractable for complex models. So instead, we use the standard variational approach to optimize the evidence lower bound with an approximate posterior q phi here. So you can see that when q phi is exactly equal to the true posterior, then there is no difference between this evidence lower bound and the, the likelihood of observed data. So in particular, we specify this Q phi as two different graph neural networks, graph convolutional neural network and the graph attention networks, which are the most two popular ones in the graph network literature. Okay. And we are going to use, after we train this model, we are going to use the Q phi to infer the missing outcome. Okay. So for this generative framework, it has the following two advantage. The first is it is very flexible because we don't require the marginal distribution to be tractable, and it, we only require the first two conditional distribution to be differentiable with respect to parameter theta here. And it allows the efficient learning and inference using the elbow approach. So let's see how it works in the real data. And we consider three standard benchmark data set, which are commonly used for graph-based semi-supervised uh, learning. They're um, such Sia, Cora, and PubMed. So here each node represents an um, academic paper, and the edge between two papers represents the citation relationship. The class is the academic domain of the paper. In features, we're going to be the back of words of title and abstract. The label rate represents the proportion of label data during training. 
we compare our generative framework uh, with two group, two group of baselines. The first is the MLP, the multi-layer perceptron, which uses no graph information at all. So we use it for reference. And the second group is the graph neural network. We use GCN and GAT, which treat the graph as fixed, and both of them belong to the discri discriminative approach. Okay. And in our generative approach, we consider four different combinations. So for the generative model of the graph, we consider latent space model, stochastic block model, and for the approximate posterior part, we consider GCN and GAT. So they turns out to be four different combinations. Okay. So in the standard benchmark setting, during training, we have 20 labels per class. And we can see that for most of the case, the generative approach performs better than the discriminative approach. And when there is an underlying mark represent, uh, we, it means that this generative, like this combination, performs better than its counterpart, the GAT. Okay. And we do observe that GCM performs the best on the part map data set, and we investigate um, more. Um, so we found that the average number of the two half neighbors is much more like than the other two data set. So basically mean that means that when the network is denser and the number of class is smaller, um, GCN is likely to be able to collect rich information from its neighbors, so which makes it hard to be further improved. So we also consider another setting we, we call it as missing edge setting, so, which is similar to the standard benchmark setting, but we remove all the edge um, in a test data set. So we want, for, for the test nodes, we're no longer to have the edge with the other nodes here. Okay. And we can, see, we can see that the generative approach actually performs much more robustly than the discriminative approach. Yeah. So to briefly summarize, we propose a generative approach for graph-based graph semi-supervised learning, which is very flexible to explore more like, a relationship between the graph um, label and features. And it also allows efficient learning and inference using the ALBA approach. And we can see that it's more robust in the data scar setting, especially when there is some missing edge. Moreover, the learned generative model of the graph is potentially to be used to understand the underlying graph structures and also for link predictions in the future work as well. Yeah. Even though it is not the main task in our setting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, could you explain a little more about what kind of factorization assumption you made for variational inference and how does the information about edges come into that uh, Q function? So, uh, the first question is that how, how do we use the a variational inference approach? What kind of assu assumption we make for oh, yeah, this part? Okay, what was your, what's the second question? Okay, yeah, I see. So, so here we didn't like provide us, but like a very uh, a formula for the elbow lower bound in details here. When we like expand into several terms, we can see that the, actually there is a generative model for the, for the graph showed there. So, um, so that's how the generative part will have some impact when we learn this uh, approximate posterior. And one of the assumptions that we make for this posterior is that when we want to use the GCN or GAT uh, to take the Y observe G and X as input, like we actually remove the Y observe part because usually like the graph neural network need to have like all the features for the nodes, right? And Y observe is only available for a small subset of nodes. And in that case, we make a further like approximation. So remove the Y observe part. We just take the X and the G as into the GCN part, yeah. But actually, we can make some specific um, like constructions for like design for for this for this part. Yeah, it's not a big problem. Yeah. I'll ask one question. Uh, so, given the difference in, in performance, oh, right. That's the uh, given the uh, difference in performance you had across the two uh, two um, evaluations, I wonder if it's also a function of how. Uh, one of the three, I guess, PubMed is um, 
maybe more homophilous in that like you, you have, you can better predict, uh, is, is there a difference in, in, in that setting? So you were saying that there's a difference in size in terms of um, um, kind of how much correlation there is across uh, um, um, pairs of, 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 of nodes that are, that are connected. Uh, so here I, I'm not mm -hmm. about like the size of the network yeah. itself, but like the uh, average number of yeah. two hub neighbors. Yeah. Like basically, like you have much more edge between yeah. between between nodes. Okay. And then using the discriminative approach, you are able to collect more information from mm -hmm. its neighbors because the number of edges is much more. Yes, but it's uh, the number, not necessarily the classes of those of those neighbors, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I also, there is another concern. Like mm -hmm. here is because the the number of class mm -hmm. uh, of the PubMed is yeah. like is smaller than the other two. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, that means that this task this task is simple, like sim more simple than the mm -hmm. other two. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Let's let's thank Beijing one more time. <laughs> Sorry. Oh right. I probably let's see. Did this. All right. Um, next, I'm uh, very uh, uh, pleased to introduce a, a colleague of mine from uh, School of Information. Uh, and here, um, Michelle is going to tell us uh, why scientists uh, cite the people that they cite or the papers that they cite. So uh, let's, oops, round of applause. And, and does this clicker? Okay, great. So yeah, so thanks everybody for coming, listening. Um, this is work in progress, as you can see by the sort of changing titles. Um, so I'll be talking about sort of the indigeneity and science of the metrics that we use that keep us up at night and uh, you know, that we really wanna see go higher and sometimes they don't. Um, first, let me say that uh, this is joint work with uh, colleagues from uh, Chicago and Harvard. And uh, to uh, jump in, um, so we'll be talking about citation metrics. Um, you know, there's lots of kind of terms uh, that are often very fuzzy in this space. So people talk about impact, quality. Um, so I'll define them in the following way. You know, I'll say that quality is something about the paper. It's the attributes. Uh, impact is also kind of a fuzzy term. Uh, in our case, we'll take it to mean uh, intellectual impact on other researchers. So. Um, does something change about how you do science as a function of you haven't read this paper? That's what we're gonna call impact. And of course, citations are the actual kind of quantitative proxy that we tend to use for these things. People find lots of positive correlations, uh, you know, sort of evidence that citations are actually pretty good as a measure. And in practice, I, I feel like it's fair to say that we talk about these other sort of characteristics of science, but, but when it comes down, sort of rubber hits the road, in policy settings, et cetera, it comes down to, you know, citations are how we define and measure quality and impact. And so the, the, the you know, the image here is maybe like my favorite study ever, which basically put scientists in an MRI and told them that you're expecting either a high impact publication or low impact publication, found that like, you know, you can find, uh, changes in your brain, you know, your brain chemistry as, the as you get the signal, right? So these are, this whole system is like very much embodied in how we do science. Um, and what are the key challenges to actually using citations as a metric? Um, so first, you know, when we think about citations and quality, um, there's this kind of famous, uh, you know, well talked about phenomenon, sort of the Matthew effect, or it goes by different names, rich get richer, et cetera. Um, and the idea is that like, you know, once you have citations, it's easier to get them. There's some kind of cumulative advantage process going on. And so we kind of suspect this happens, but you know, we actually don't have like super clean evidence for it. And um, you know, it's all, always sort of correlational. Um, and we, more importantly, like, don't really know why it happens. Is it because like rich or rich, so famous scientists get more resources and do better science? Is it purely kind of like through changes in perception? Or maybe it's just like Google Scholar just gives them more attention and that's the only thing going on. Um, so I'll show an experiment showing uh, how perceptions actually change. And the second thing I'll talk about is the second part of this relationship with citations. So I think, you know, people suspect that, yeah, quality and citations are quite, you know, linear, fine. But when we think about impact, I don't think people have too many um, 
clear uh, concerns about this. Right? It's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, if it doesn't have citations, it doesn't have impact. So we tend to equate those things. Um, and the chief problem there is, of course, we cite for a variety of reasons, right? And so the heterogeneity in citing might be quite different for how we cite famous papers versus obscure. Uh, if I had to guess, I would, you know, prior to doing this work, I would have said that, you know, famous papers get cited purely kind of like symbolically to kind of position ourselves in the literature. Um, and so I'll be showing data from a survey here that basically shows that my intuition, maybe you share this as well, is actually incorrect. Um, and, then, and so now jumping, I'll kind of highlight some findings. I uh, would be happy to talk more detail about all the sort of ins and outs going on. But the way we did this is we partnered with Web of Science and kind of spammed the scientific community asking scientists why they made specific reference decisions in their papers. Okay? So I'll skip how we sampled this, but the, the details of it, but broadly, because this is Web of Science, we could sample very systematically across fields, um, across, you know, across countries. So this is pretty much like a random sample, more or less, of, how, of citers. Um, and we're asking people about papers they wrote in 2015, and we're asking them about their referencing decisions of papers that were you know, older than that. Uh, the survey kind of looks like this. You would you know, come here and say, you know, Dr. Smith, uh, you know, in your paper you cited the following. Do you remember or not? And you would go on and answer a bunch of questions. And the questions would be along these lines. It would say, you know, how well do you know this paper? How much did it influence your research choices? Um, uh, which aspects did it influence? Um, and you would then come to the following panel that would ask you, like, what do you actually think of this reference? Is it good or bad? So you'd move these sliders left to right on each kind of dimension of quality, kind of comparing this paper against others in the field. All right, so now jumping into the findings here. So, you know, we sent out, I guess, almost 70,000 emails. We're really shocked to discover that people actually took this survey and, like, at a surprisingly <laughs> good clip. Also shocking to me is that I spent the next, like, the following two months, like, fielding emails from often disgruntled people about, like, or complaining about metrics or asking for jobs or, <laughs> like, a variety. It turns out when you spam, like, 70,000 scientists, you, you, like, you get all sorts of, you know, feedback. Um, but, you know, broadly crazy, like, surprisingly high number of people actually took the survey. And so we ended up with, you know, nearly like 10,000 scientists answering these questions. Um, and so now jumping to the results, so, you know, citations as a proxy or as a cause, right? So, what I, so I lied a little bit. We actually had two forms of this survey. So the control form that I showed you earlier was, you know, this one. 85% of people were assigned to that. And 15% of people would be assigned to the following form. Everything's the same except it would include the following kind of box. And it would say, our records indicate this paper has been cited X number of times, which ranks it on the top Y percent of the distribution. And that's the only signal we gave you, and, that, and that's it. So that's like the prime. How did it affect people's ratings of quality? All right, so here's sort of one of the main results. So here's how people move the slider on how good they perceive the paper to be by the condition to which they were assigned. And here's sort of how obscure or famous the paper is. Uh, and broadly, we see that, like, giving, you know, the signal could be good or bad, right? You could be cited a lot of times or very few. So telling people that the paper they cited, kind of reminding them that it's, like, very famous, has been cited a thousand times, actually doesn't shift perceptions all that much. However, kind of reminding people that the paper they cited is obscure lowers their perception of the paper on perceived quality, right? So this is sort of um, maybe not groundbreaking, but actually, like, the first clean evidence we have that like citations are actually like, not just measuring quality, like they're changing perceptions of quality. Um, this kind of effect happens across the various dimensions we ask about. Um, you know, we can talk about the significance levels of all the, you know, there's different levels to cut up the data, but broadly, what I want to point out is that, you know, it's consistent across all the dimensions <laughs> we ask about. And what's interesting is that, again, like being told that you're in the top 25%, like doesn't actually shift, like the treatment effects of that are essentially zero. And then if you're in the bottom, like 75%, you're harmed by exposing your citation signal. And not even harmed all that much differently, to bottom 25 versus like the median. 
And so I think it kind of, it's like a little bit of evidence that we're kind of like thinking, scientists are thinking a bit categorically. There's like famous and not famous, and if you're not famous, you're bad. You're less valid, less significant, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we learn from this exercise? Um, you know, so, you know, again, usual assumption is there's some kind of process, maybe through Google Scholar, et cetera, but citations are generally like, seem to be some kind of measurement. Here we show that it actually is a cause, and it's basically harmful for, for almost everybody except the people at the very top. Um, and it shows, it kind of like not maybe shockingly, that citation counts underestimate, like if we equate citations of quality, papers not in the top will be perceived, like they'll be, their quality will be underestimated. All right, now jumping now to the second aspect of this project, tackling influence, impact. So how does that work? So we can cite for a variety of reasons. The way we assessed why you cited, your citing motive was with the following question. You know, we would ask you, uh, how were your research choices actually impacted by your reference? And it would go from one, paper would have been very similar without this reference, to two, you know, maybe I added a sentence to the discussion, and then five is like, this was key to my whole project. So how did people answer this question by the sort of, uh, how many, times the paper's been cited previously. So I have two graphs here for the mean effects. You know, here is our, how obscure or famous your references are, and here's how you perceive their influence to be. Uh, five minutes, okay, great. Um, and so what we see basically, kind of counter to my intuitions at least, systematically famous papers mean more to the people citing them, right? So like per citation, it's a more meaningful citation, it's even more clear if you look at not only kind of mean effects, but like maybe we really care about like what are the foundational papers, like which really move the field. So let's just see like who answers, you know, four or five to our influence score, like it had major impact. And you see an even more stark kind of pattern here that like papers that are quite famous, like thousand citations plus were the ones like three times as likely to actually like change your research choices in a major way. So this, I think, um, somewhat counterintuitively shows that like, you know, famous papers actually like really driving science, and per citation, they mean like maybe three times more than obscure papers. And um, so what we conclude from this is that, you know, again, usual assumption is that, you know, okay, like people said for already reasons, but it's all kind of randomly distributed, so maybe it doesn't actually matter that much. We show that it's like not actually not all that random. Um, and there's parts of this I'm not showing that, you know, Famous, citations of famous papers like mean more, often quite a bit more. They influence more aspects of our research choices. Um, and we can also show that people read them more closely. Um, and so this, we kind of reach a sort of conclusion here that, you know, that relying on citations actually penalizes the famous papers because they might have like three times as much impact as they're giving credit for. And uh, to sum it all up, um, you know, some presenting I, I've said very little about kind of scope conditions, and that's, I think, one of the strengths here. We're talking about like all fields of science, pretty large scale across the world. Um, we see, like, we're kind of highlighting the indigeneity of all these metrics that we use that people often suspect but never kind of have clean evidence for. So here we're showing, like, yep, yep, citation counts really do change how people perceive you and presumably cite you in the future. Uh, one of the pathways is that we just like read famous papers more closely. Uh, and, you know, and the sort of practical conclusions, like if you're using raw citation counts, you know, you might be iffy about using them as a measure of quality or something, because um, you're like, oh, I don't know, give them a advantage. But as far as impact, that's our measure, you know, right? And here we show that they're actually like not a good measure of either. Like they'll be underestimating impact of famous papers and overestimating their quality. Uh, and thanks for your attention. Great study. Um, so I had a couple of just technical questions and then one more uh, just broader. Uh, first of all, so did each scientist just get one reference from their list of 20 references on their paper, is that how they did it, or they got every single? Uh, so we asked uh, for two references. Okay. And that actually, so the results I'm showing are like, um, so I'm not showing the, the most robust 
kind of regressions, right? Mm -hmm. But we can look at like within scientists mm -hmm. of your two papers that you cited, mm -hmm. do you perceive the, you know, and then everything kind of holds up, Got as, it. as I said. Uh, the second is like, uh, you know, time effects, like, right? I mean, some of the famous papers have been around for like 100 years. I'm just wondering if you guys thought about that. And then the larger question is just, was there any differences across scientific disciplines in, in some of your kind of conclusions? Um, so, great question. So the, so the last one is differences show up like there are, you know, some literatures turn out to be like much more rhetorical than others. Um, I, so this is like work in progress. I haven't made too much of that heterogeneity because I just I haven't focused on it, but I, you know, like cultures differ and you know, we, I, there's some signal of that, but I haven't like, you know, it's to, to be done to take a closer look. And the, and the first question you asked, sorry, was, uh, oh yeah. Well, yeah, right. So, so I didn't go into the sampling procedure, but we're asking you about references that were published in 2000, 2005, 2010. Okay. So I actually don't have, you know, so there's 15 years of heterogeneity and I haven't really seen too much differences on that angle, so I haven't really brought it up. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next speaker is Christopher from uh, the Computer Science uh, and Engineering Department, and he will be telling us about constructing expressive relational queries with dual specification synthesis. So, if one, oh, no, that is not helpful. Where did that go? Um, do we know what's happening here? I actually don't know what this is here. There's one. Alright, hello everyone. I'm not going to read the title because it's kind of a mouthful. Um, I did this work in collaboration with um, Mark Jin, my department, as well as my two advisors, uh, Mike Caffarella and H.V. Jagadish. Um, so just to go over the problem a little bit, I want to talk about this problem of crossing the data chasm, quote unquote. And what that really is, is uh, we have a lot of people who are data end users, such as um, people in this room, business people, scientists, health providers, and the like. And generally, in most organizations, they store this information in databases. And often, these databases are relational databases, such as MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server. And there's this wide gap between the data end user and these databases that I'm going to call the great data chasm. Now, there's a few different ways we can cross this data chasm. The most traditional way is for us to provide training in database tools, such as SQL, which is a language that people typically use to get information back from these databases. So for, an exam for example, if we have some database and we're trying to find the name and location of stadiums that had a concert in 2014, 2015, we get this blob here. And you know, if you're trained, maybe it's easy for you to look at this and try to figure out what's going on. If not, this might look a little bit intimidating, which is what actually happens for a lot of users. And so as an alternative to these training and database tools, we can also hire technical middlemen. So we have people who are this is their full-time job. They're database administrators, they're query analysts, they're query writers, and their job is to write the SQL for you to get the information back. And, but in, I guess as an alternative of both these methods, um, one approach that we're taking is we want to build more user-friendly tools, and we can probably democratize access to data a little bit by enabling these data end users to query the database themselves. So I'm going to talk about two particular um, SQL alternatives, um, user-friendly alternatives to that. And uh, one is pretty straightforward. It's called the natural language interface, where the user explains their query, um, what they want to say just in plain English, and the system's job is to produce the appropriate SQL queries. Now, the, the thing with this is that uh, the, the pro is that it's expressive. The con is that it's not accurate. Expressive in the sense that there's some complicated things that you can express in natural language. The problem is that the state of the art is only like 55% on a prominent benchmark. And if your data system is only giving you the correct answer 55% of the time, you quit and you leave. The second thing, um, second example of a SQL alternative is called query by example. And this, um, in this approach, the user provides examples of what they want their query to produce. And so um, the, the system similar to the previous example, produces SQL queries. 
Now, this has the kind of opposite pros and cons in the sense that it's accurate, but it's not expressive. It's accurate in the sense that the queries that result from running this interaction model are guaranteed to satisfy the input that the user gives. But when you start introducing the complexity of, of uh, a large set of possible uh, expressivity in SQL queries, what you actually get is that the system is going to dump out 5,000 possible queries that could match your input. And that's not necessarily helpful because the user has to sort through those in the end. Our approach is noticing that these two have complementary pros and cons. We want to enable both of these and provide a dual specification interface. Now, the research challenges in this are to, one, define a novel interaction model. And second, we want to develop an efficient algorithm to be able to handle this kind of dual specification input. Um, and so just to describe this a little bit, I um, have a little bit of a video um, just describing a, a short demo of uh, the system that we built to do this. Hopefully this works. Consider a database containing information about scholars and their publications. The user can issue a natural language query to find all authors from the University of Michigan and their total number of publications. For specific proper nouns and entities such as the University of Michigan, the system offers a list for autocomplete. In the next section, the user specifies some information about the output of the SQL query that they are looking for. The first column is for author name, so the user puts text for the column type and adds HV Jagadish as an example. The second column is for the number of publications, so the user puts number for the column type. The user cannot remember precisely how many publications Professor Jagadish has, but knows generally that it should be between 50 and 100, so they type this range into the box. The user then executes this specification. The results appear one by one in order of most to least confidence. The SQL appears complex to an untrained user, so as an eyeball test, they can preview the results of executing the query. The first query appears to be correct, and the user's task is now complete. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of the interaction model and what the interface is like. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly, just kind of taking a peek at under the hood. Um, so imagine that we have a task where the user provides, uh, user's looking for all movies before 1995 on like the IMDB database or something. Um, in addition, there um, is the, the dual specification, or I guess the query by example portion of the query is listed below in a more formal presentation. And for some reason, the fonts all exploded on this. So. Um, there's the, pro and the challenge here is that there's many branches of possible queries. So you start from an empty query. That's what the square box is. And then you kind of expand. You add a select statement here, where statement here, yada, yada, yada. And we're kind of expanding this query one layer at a time as we go. Now the question is, which branch do we explore first? Because the computer could spend all its time, and an algorithm could spend all its time exploring all these possible branches. And the second thing is, how do we avoid exploring bad branches? And so uh, to kind of solve these challenges, uh, we developed an algorithm called, uh, an approach called guided partial query enumeration. Um, what we do is we take an off-the-shelf natural language model to guide the enumeration process to, to kind of select, okay, should we select branch number one, two, three, whenever we're on a level? And then secondly, we prune large branches of partial queries early. Um, we, d we use some rules to be able to determine, okay, like some of these gray boxes uh, down here, there is no possible completion of this at that point that will evaluate to the specification that the user provided. And so we'll kind of make that assessment and we try to do this as early as possible to make this process efficient. In terms of, uh, we did two kind of experiments to evaluate this. The first thing um, we did was a uh, user study. Uh, the one th what we did was we performed a user study on 16 subjects. Uh, six of them self-identify as SQL novices and 10 of them identified as more experienced with SQL. We compared the usability of our dual quest system with a state-of-the-art natural language interface. The users performed a distinct set of four tasks on each system. They didn't have any overlap in the tasks that they were doing. Uh, we provided them four, four of these tasks and then four completely separate tasks. They had a five minute time limit per task to complete these. And here's kind of just like a simple graph uh, of the aggregated accuracy results. So if you look at this, um, our system is, has the bars in blue. And for our DuoQuest system, the users get actually most of their task attempts correct, over 80, 85% of um, the tasks they completed correctly. Um, and for the remainder of tasks, they all timed out. There was no case where they actually uh, had an incorrect result, which meant that in an incorrect result, uh, the users would incorrectly choose one of the SQL queries as their desired query when it wasn't the actual query. On the other hand, for the natural language interface, the correct proportion is really small. It's around 20, 25%. The majority, uh, for the majority of cases, the user's timed out in that five minute limit. And then um, it, the worst part of it is actually there's a few cases where there's false positives, where the user's actually selected the wrong query and said, this is 
the correct answer. This is a SQL query that I'm looking for, which you can imagine throws a kink in your data pipeline. You, you don't want to have ever do, be doing data science and find a query is completely incorrect and giving you the wrong data. So um, just an overview of the time results um, as it kind of uh, we kind of break down uh, those timeouts, and so uh, in general, the users are completing their tasks, you know, within 100 and 200 seconds, and our system's providing a, a giant speed up from the previous state of the art. We also performed the simulation study um, on Spider, which is a benchmark of natural language queries to SQL queries. So there's kind of a pair of natural language and SQL queries for each task. Um, what we did was because they don't come with a dual specification, we had to synthesize the, the TSQ, the query by example portion of this. And we did that and produced them with one to two example rows for each task. Uh, the details for that are in the paper, and so I kind of gloss over that. Uh, the, we compared four different approaches. So one is our approach. Uh, chain is an approach where we also enable the dual specification as in our system, but it's a more naive approach where we, we weren't doing that efficient GPQE process we mentioned earlier. Um, and the final two were this, uh, the single specification approaches, the uh, natural language interface and the query by example. Um, each system, they return a ranked list of queries. And so what we measured is the top N accuracy. Uh, the top N accuracy is what percent of the time the correct answer was in the top N ranked results. And um, what we see here is actually over, I guess, in terms of uh, compared to the single specification approaches, um, in the top one accuracy column, we have I guess more than twice the amount of accuracy. We improved the accuracy more than twice. And then um, top 10 and top 100 as well, we see just improvements across the board. Um, and I think this improvement is pretty drastic, especially when we consider um, that single specification approaches are the only ones that are currently, um, I guess, prominently available. Our takeaways from this um, study are that, first, that databases are hard to query for the untrained. Um, that's kind of an observation that's made across the board. Uh, do a quest. Uh, combines the advantages of the single specification systems that people have been working on for decades. Our user study demonstrates a 62.5% increase in accuracy over the state-of-the-art natural language interface. And finally, our simulation study uh, demonstrates a more than twice increase in top one accuracy over these single specification approaches. Um, thanks for listening. I'll take questions and comments. Thanks. There are mics on both sides uh, that might speed up the process. Oh, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you, uh, have you actually looked at the data where you break down where the, uh, like, uh, they are new to SQL and the experienced people that like they already knew, uh, they already know how to use SQL? Have you like uh, actually check uh, like uh, where your program is most uh, beneficial, uh, like to what type of user? I'm going to confess that at this exact moment I do not remember. Oh. I think I did look at that. Uh -huh. My guess is that it didn't stand out to me in a significant way, which is why I don't remember. But okay. that's a good question. <laughs> you can, you know, if you actually okay. want to talk offline, I can actually look up the numbers. So oh, okay. yeah, if you're interested. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting because you you really want to make it uh, perhaps like a uh, to kind of uh, make the learning curve a little like a slower for the for the new learners. So maybe that's what you may be more interested in. Yeah, yeah. Just my sure. opinion. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much again. The next speaker, I'm happy uh, to announce again from uh, a colleague from uh, uh, School of Information, we know is going to um, be telling us about extracting medication information and adverse uh, drug events from clinical narratives, which apparently I'm sort of able to do. There we go. Hello. I can already see that there are some issues with the text, I'm sorry about that, but, but you can understand, this is natural language talk, so, so you can probably understand uh, what, what this is about. Um, so just to kind of give you a quick uh, introduction, I am uh, Vinod Vaidishwaran, my primary appointment is in the Department of Learning Health Sciences, uh, with, which is in the medical school, but I'm also a faculty member in the School of Information, um, and I'm just a spokesperson for uh, my 
uh, research lab, and my students who have kind of worked on this. So, so most of the kind of acknowledgments go to them. Um, okay. So uh, when I talk about uh, kind of introducing you to health data, what is big data? What is data science for health? Um, the professional view for that is when you have uh, books or journals or peer-reviewed literature that talk about this, um, and there are about 26.7 million uh, citations in PubMed. We have seen that word PubMed in an earlier talk. Um, and uh, otherwise, there are medical records, which are uh, many, many more, so 98.7 million documents or notes just from one year in Michigan Medicine alone. So now think about uh, all the other hospitals and so on. Um, specifically, pharmacies, uh, who are also health professionals, uh, in, in the pharmacist's view, they are not really talking about clinical notes, but they are looking at drug information. There are many, much, much more information about drugs, um, and RxQui is basically a, a, a pharmacy unique identifier, uh, but then they have prescriptions, and there are about 3.8 billion prescriptions uh, for uh, retail drugs in one year, again, just from U.S. pharmacies. So um, when you think about what, a, what is there in a prescription, and this might be a question for everyone, uh, so shout out. When you see a, a prescription like this, Senna 8.6 milligram tablet and take one tablet as needed, uh, what are the components of this, uh, this medication prescription? Okay, dosage. What the, what, what the first one there is drug. That's Senna, or strength, and then you have dosage and route and form and duration and so on, uh, and also about reason why that was given. So in this particular case, it was given for constipation. So this task of converting what this text document is, text sentence is, into these forms is called uh, information extraction, named entity recognition, uh, or specifically kind of medication extraction. So you are starting from a narrative medical uh, document and kind of identifying mentions of these medications from there. Um, so when I talk about narrative medical documents, I'm talking about this. I'm sorry about uh, the, uh, uh, the slides. Uh, I, can, I can share these slides with you uh, later on. But what I wanted to kind of show here was that uh, one medical record is really about 200 lines and it kind of keeps going on and on. And you're going to find out what exactly in that set is really talking about medication. So there is, uh, this is the identified, so you can see this. Uh, th there is uh, some sort of privacy protection here. Um, uh, but specifically what we're looking for is a component here that talks about discharge medications or uh, somewhere else where they talk about this particular drug. Uh, uh, um, and it's just mentioned as dilaudid IVPRN somewhere hidden in the entire text, okay? So to kind of, the challenge is to pull that one out and then convert that into um, a structured form, a structured table where you have to identify these components and fill that table up. So when uh, Professor Rai Ghani was talking about a lot of data but not really in rows and columns, this is an example of that where you have a lot of data in free text form and uh, the challenge is to convert that into rows and columns. Okay. So how do we go about doing this? So we start with what is a, a string of this medication extraction, medication uh, prescription, and we identify that first one is a drug, or, and that second one is a strength and route and frequency and duration. So this is a sequence labeling problem. Uh, you have input as the text string, and output is a sequence of uh, labels that we have to kind of uh, identify for each word, whether it belongs within a class of interest or outside a class or any of those classes. Uh, and traditionally, you, this is considered as a supervised machine learning model because you have a training data set that you train your models on. Um, so there are multiple sequence modeling, sequence labeling uh, models that could be used traditionally in 80s, 90s, and, uh, and 2000s. Hidden marker models in conditional random fields were very common. In 2015 plus, it's deep learning models that are very common. Uh, and uh, so these, these neural network models are uh, currently the state of the art for, for tasks like this. 
so uh, in, in, in this particular talk, in a, in a minute or so, I want to kind of show you what all kind of uh, goes into it. And this is uh, a work, this is work from one of my PhD students uh, and others in the group who are looking at focused representation as approaches to build this model. So what does focused representation mean? Is that you want to identify features from concepts that are relevant, for example, the drug name, uh, the medication duration, and so on, and contrast it with auxiliary information or features coming from outside that, the background uh, of all the text that, uh, that is kind of hiding this information. So if you learn both of these tasks well, then they can help each other. And this is basically what these two kind of components are saying. One is kind of optimized to learn the concepts better, and the other one is optimized to learn the anti context better, uh, so, uh, anti-concept that is context better. And so if, if uh, kind of you bring those two together can help your model even better. Okay, um, so how do we, how do you evaluate this model? So this, uh, the data set actually comes from MIMIC. MIMIC is a large uh, 60,000 patient corpus that has been de-identified and made available for uh, researchers. Um, specifically, uh, a shared task was organized around this data set called N2C2, that is uh, National NLP Clinical Challenge, I believe, um, in 2018, that took some examples of that, 303 uh, uh, clinical notes, and uh, in the train set and 202 in the test set, so about 60-40 uh, split of uh, 505 uh, discharge summaries, uh, and uh, that consists of about 100,000 uh, sentences, 60, 40, again, 60,000 in the training and 40,000 in the test. So that was what was provided for all the teams that participated in this challenge. Uh, and uh, the teams were kind of encouraged to build their own approaches to, to identify this. These were manually, manually labeled. The concepts and relationships were manually labeled by a team of uh, uh, annotators. And that was a data set that was provided. Um, so just to kind of give you a summary of what that data set looks like, drug is by far the largest class, um, and there's, there's a distribution that goes from 16,000 mentions of drug, uh, only about 6,000 or so mentions of strength, form, or frequency, and very few mentions of duration. Um, and uh, what we then found was when we kind of trained these models, uh, traditional, I should not call them traditional, they are five years old models, so, so, uh, but, uh, 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 so a model that kind of focuses on uh, the conditional random field or a model build that is built on neural network models based on conditional random field uh, performs somewhat uh, about 0.854. Um, this is, uh, this is, this is shown, the results are shown based on F1 measure. F1 is a harmonic mean of precision and recall or uh, sensitivity and positive predictive value, depending on whether you are coming from clinical background or not. Um, okay, and uh, this focused representation improves that significantly from 0.85 to 0.92 and reaching what is currently a state of the art for this, for these approaches. Uh, the biggest classes that seem to be having a problem are reason and ADE. They are, by, uh, they are smaller classes, but they are also not performing as well. And so uh, the main reason for, for things like this is that there are a lot of um, words that are outside the context. So diuretic was in the data set, by, but diurst was not. Uh, and so uh, that vocabulary uh, understanding and vocabulary mismatch kind of was the biggest reason for, for uh, problems like this. Um, so additional training with more data set, more uh, available data sets could probably help these models. Okay, uh, so uh, to summarize this medication information, you all are having a great natural language processing experience, right? When you're kind of looking at the word medication and kind of understanding that it is medication. Uh, so that's how great our, our brains are. Anyways, so um, the, the challenge is can machines do this uh, automatically? Uh, so medication directions are uh, encoded instructions and, and identifying this information from there uh, would, uh, would be very helpful. And we have kind of shown that focus representation models help. But I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to kind of see, show you why 
models like this and, and are, are useful to be kind of trained in smaller data sets and how that can be used for further research. So uh, the follow-up of that work has been to identify self-management of drugs and medications in uh, oral anti-cancer, uh, in, in cancer patients. So when patients uh, are taking medications at home, so these are, these are oral anti-cancer uh, drugs, uh, they uh, encounter side effects at home. So they have to manage those side effects again at home. So how can you kind of uh, understand what are the known adverse events of uh, drugs and, and help that to, uh, to uh, educate patients about what they can expect and so on. There are differences in, uh, so those who have uh, some understanding of what an electronic health record looks like, you might question why couldn't this information uh, come out of um, clinical uh, lists, so there are medication lists that are available, uh, but, but medication lists are typically, so medication lists are things when patients go in and nurse asks you, are you what medications are you taking? And you kind of you list that down, and then doctors might add to that list and so on. But so there is a list form of this medication, and there is a note form of this medication. They don't necessarily have the exact same information in both of them. So how can you uh, fill gaps when the lists are incomplete, or, or get a better current representation of what medications are, are the patient is taking. So that will be the, highlighting the differences in uh, medication information coming from two different parts of an electronic health record. And finally, to uh, improve the models to uh, help transcribe prescriptions better. So what that means is when you have a text like this, Ventolin HFA 90 MCG 2 puffs orally Q4HRS, X90DYS uh, is basically what prescribers, doctors, would write to pharmacy. And then pharmacists, when they're giving it back to patients, are supposed to convert that into this, where they're saying inhale two puffs by mouth every four hours for 90 days for wheezing. Right? Uh, so, so how can you convert this text into a grammatically correct sentence uh, in, in an automated fashion? So there is there some work uh, happening with uh, my collaborators in College of Pharmacy and School of Nursing to, to uh, achieve that. Okay, so uh, again, uh, well, I want to kind of leave a thought behind, and that is this work happened because the, of shared tasks and data sets that were created and shared uh, with, with other health researchers. So, there is a, there is, uh, so this is kind of a call for action also when you're thinking about how these data science uh, uh, products, that is uh, an annotated data set and a shared task, helps advance research uh, that is kind of helpful for multiple other tasks than just, um, just the task that it was shared for. With that, I kind of want to open up for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, which, so the, uh, the slide before this, you were showing us a lot of interesting data sets and other questions, and I wonder what the challenges, given the privacy concerns of like actually, like some of these would actually help with the question that you were answering, given the challenge you were mentioning about the context uh, versus not context, so some of those data sets might be helpful in that. So what are limitations that stop you from using these uh, across different projects? Okay. Uh, great. The question was really about what are the limitations of uh, that this data, this data could it be used for other projects? So yes, it could be, and there are two posters uh, based on follow-up work from this work. So, but that might be just in the presenting poster number eight zero three eight zero four. Great time to plug. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so please take a look at it. One specific one that, that I want to kind of highlight is uh, that we are using this also to process tweets to understand whether when somebody. Uh, uh, on, on, a, on a tweet is mentioning that they are suffering some from, they are going through some side effect of a drug that they have taken. So, so if you can identify that relationship from these approaches that you have already learned, but then applying it on, uh, on, on social media data, that kind of helps advance that information. So uh, yes, it, there's potential for, uh, for, uh, for using them, but context matters a lot. So uh, uh, I would not say that you can use these models as is, Probably it will not do very well, but uh, these models give you some sort of a initial state to start from so that you can kind of retrain the model or, or uh, adapt it to the other data set and so on. So some sort of transfer learning, exactly. Thank you very, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you.
kids. All right, great. The last talk of the session is uh, by uh, Jun from the Department of Human Genetics. And this is going to be about uh, data science challenges in, in this particular space. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Let's. Can you, can you all hear me? All right. um, so I'm going to, well, on account of the, that you all want to get to lunch, I made this relatively light for your brain. Uh, I'm going to switch gear to talk about uh, biomedical data. I'll be talking about biomedical data. Ah, it's not on. Now you, can, now you can hear, right? No. I feel like it's on, but it was maybe just a little. It's on. It's on now? It's on now. Oh, okay. There All we right. go. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gear to talk with you about uh, biomedical data uh, coming from laboratory science. All right. So the setting is uh, really about. DNA sequencing that can be an assay to count transcripts in a cell. So the, the entire situation arises because we now have this wonder machine called sequencers that cre creates uh, just tsunamis of data that's washed over every medical school. Now we have to deal with it. Uh, you do not have to run gels or run microarrays. You can just break up the cell and count transcripts. By knowing the identity, you will figure out uh, which genes they came from and how much is produced in each cell became a, a great way to functionally profile a sample. The output is uh, this rectangular table of integer counts that all of us are familiar with. The challenge, of course, is uh, sequencing has become cheap very quickly. With one dollar you spend, you can ask the machine to count one million times. So with that efficiency, uh, suddenly many, many groups have trouble handling the data. If you try to use Excel to open one terabyte file, the, the Excel will collapse in shame. So, uh, uh, therefore, we are dealing with uh, ever larger data. So that's actually not news for a lot of our, uh, you know, computational scientists and students. Uh, this talk is going to be about the new challenge where this table is filled with zeros and ones, but they're not binary. They are, they are low integer counts. They are zero, one, two, and threes. The problem is uh, sounded like very timely, but it's a, actually a timeless problem. You deal with the NP matrix, where there are many techniques to turn the original data into n by n distance or p by p distance. They allow you to go dig into different directions for interpretation. For sample sample distance, you will report classification, sample heterogeneity, batch effects, and so on and so forth. For gene-gene correlation, you interpret in terms of co-regulation or uh, regulatory networks. The, I already alluded to you that uh, most of the research in this lab goes from tissue on the left to that machine, then to data. But now, what has been really recent in the last four or five years is this uh, second step. There is new wizardry in nano devices to allow you to capture individual cells quickly. So you have. Again, one dollar, you can capture one cell and sequence for thousands of genes to profile them very efficiently. Therefore, those of us who uh, have grown comfortable with the NP matrix with, with real values as if we are living in the analog world had to deal with RNA sequencing where the table are integers. You go into somewhat like a digitized world. And then now the single cell RNA seq presents the problem of extremely sparsely sampled integers. Uh, if you just type in the word single cell analysis, you see the picture on the left. Those are the number of papers published in PubMed. Most of the increase in the last three or four years are accounted for by the picture on the right. It's one of the uh, more popular technologies to profile samples. There are many apparatuses uh, here in uh, University of Michigan. Uh, likewise, the number of software tools written for the purpose of analyzing single-cell data also grow. 
at a pace of one or 200 per year. And many of them are, have not yet been published. Uh, this just tells you how quickly the market is turning over. So with this challenge, we uh, really are, are grateful for MIDAS to have founded a center uh, called single, Michigan Center for Single Cell Genomic Data Analytics. Uh, so this talk is essentially me speaking on behalf of all the colleagues in the center and, and a larger and larger circle surrounding our center. These are the 10 funding uh, investigators. Uh, of course, I want you to see their names and uh, faces. Uh, if you see them at the symposium, please talk with them. Uh, another point I want to make is this is a grand experiment for uh, extremely diverse disciplines. Uh, going from left to right, we have mathematics. We have two of them in College of Engineering. Uh, Johan in statistics. Uh, two of them from computational medicine and bioinformatics. Then we have a uh, biomedical scientist in environmental health, in cancer center, in pathology, or, uh, and stem cell development, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we have colleagues from biostatistics. Uh, the center really cross-cuts many colleges of, uh, and schools in this, on this campus. Uh, furthermore, we have, I realize, many of the attendees um, are from these groups. They're from statistical biostatistics and bioinformatics. Uh, in one of our recent, well, it's more than a year ago, the in symposium, more than 70 groups registered. And, uh, this time last year, we did a, a one-day workshop. Just even the lightning talk ran nearly the whole day. So this is a little dense. You don't have to follow this. This is kind of playbook for those who analyze genomics data. You start out with that MP matrix. You, uh, in the first act, you shave off the uh, low confidence rows and columns. Then you normalize, you, you get a sense of some equity of the distribution. Then you assess heterogeneity using a great deal of multivariate techniques so that you get a sense on the data structure, the batch effect, and, and classification, and so on and so forth. Then very quickly, as you boil the data to, to uh, kind of its essence, you have to invoke more and more biological assumptions. For example, if you believe cells cluster into cell types, you go to one route. If you believe the cells follow a trajectory that's continuous because they are developing, they are differentiating, you follow another route to analyze the data. These are not trivial decisions, uh, but often the same data types can allow you to do multi-threaded analysis depending on your starting principle. And then there, there is a great deal, many layers of uh, crafts of the trades asking you to do the proper thing, uh, whether in the clustering world or trajectory world, eventually, uh, you will quantify your learning by either pseudo time on the left or marker gene selection, and then you have to uh, build bridges to prior knowledge because every system you go, uh, you have colleagues who worked on it for many decades using histology, using low throughput method. So even the, when we invent new language, we have to be able to map to the old uh, uh, linguistic system. So uh, another point I want to bring up is Many of you have heard the word sparse, but in this case, uh, they, they indeed carried on two meanings. One is this uh, P feature uh, structure can be reduced to a lower dimension, so that's a low rank approximation of the high dimensional object, so that's the meaning number one. The second that no one had to really deal with until three or four years ago is we have ex extremely sparse sampling. Actually, what I, said, what I said is not entirely true because people in ecology or political science uh, have dealt with sparse sampling before. But it's in such amazing quantity of data in biomedical research, this is, is quite fresh to us. And then if you look at um, how we have been educated, the, the book on the left deals with categorical data, but it lives in the age where you deal with one or a few outcomes as if you are doing clinical trials. And then the book in the middle is kind of the text, well, the Bible in the field for statistical learning in very high dimensional data. Uh, but it doesn't really address integer counts. The book on the right talks about sparsity and learning. But again, there is very scant uh, mentioning of how to address integer counts data. Uh, I will give you one example on how the counts data give you uh, major inconveniences. And then you have to retool everything you have learned. For example, if you get a cell, you get a readout of uh, uh, this vector, basically how many uh, transcripts for each gene. 
uh, a lot of zeros, some ones, some two and three. You ask, is this cell very diverse in transcriptome or very uh, egalitarian? Of all the transcripts, do they distribute more evenly across genes or get hacked by some jackpotting genes? So gene index is great for measuring inequality in a distribution, just like it has been invoked in economics to measure income inequality of different nations. So then you can uh, either use the equation or using the graph. If the straight line on that graph indicates all the genes have com comparable uh, kind of claim of the transcriptome, while that drooped line is a situation where some genes uh, express a lot higher than others, so there is a great inequality between the super rich and the super poor. This has been applied to uh, in literature search on uh, which author has greater uh, vocabulary richness. And then in research, in this case, the picture on the left, every dot is a cell. We are profiling how uh, stem cells in the testes are generating sperm. And then we are trying to quantify how the cells character change in terms of uh, expression inequality. These four curves on the right seems to indicate that the cells progress closer to mature sperm. They are more dedicated to a narrower spectrum of function. They have greater inequality. But then there is complication in that if we set up the wizardry, uh, this computational diagram to generate the model, we find the graph on the right is to show you if we simulate data with known Gini index, if you read it from right to left, highly sampled, they get correct readout. As you sample less and less, you get increase in Gini. All those curves go up. So now the sampling depth became uh, something instrumental. You used to think about, oh, bias and noise trade-off. That trade-off is changing depending on how deeply you sequence the cells. So we have to address all of those uh, such problems are also seen, as I mentioned, in other data intense disciplines, such as what I listed below in consumer, in econ economics, in communication, and so on and so forth. So these are, even though these are marketing words you put in a grant proposal, but we are dead serious that they are all mapped to the same mathematical structure. And then there are practical difficulties. Uh, I have some commentary that I can fly over, really, about how quickly we publish, how quickly we validate, how difficult to benchmark those 500 or so computational tools. Uh, a lot of this chaos came out of the fundamentals of analytics. If you just do PCA, you have other ways to project data. The same data we know, there are four clusters as shown in the top middle, but different tools will tell different stories because they have different philosophies on what they want to see. And then it maps even further to uh, how we measure distance between two vectors. Uh, those who are sampled shallowly will tend to have a vaguer identity that their distance to others will be changed by sampling depth. So I'm actually coming to near the end of my talk. Uh, these are the bigger topics that represent the, the collective aspiration of people in the center or surrounding the center. How to benchmark software tools at scale? Can you benchmark 500 tools in 1,000 data set and still kind of have both the uh, high altitude, uh, kind of large scale view of the research landscape, but also have the granular detail on why some tools fail at, at, at which step, and how do we document the compromises and decisions at every decision juncture. The collaboration at scale is another question uh, in such diverse field. How, how do we uh, really uh, meet the demand of data analysis needs and algorithmic development needs? Should each develop a few deeply engaged collaborations or many, many uh, somewhat semi-superficial collaborations? And how to develop the workforce with different types of adaptability and, and, and evolvability? Then the last point uh, really is what we increasingly encounter. How do we really study uh, how we teach data analytics, how we learn data analytics. If someone is known to be a master of putting out stories, can we study their behavior at scale? If there are uh, kind of suboptimal practices that's prevalent, that's driving uh, high-impact papers, how do we study uh, 
the decision-making style of the analyst. Uh, that by itself is, is a challenge, probably will uh, trigger the interest of all of you who, who study human behavior, uh, attention engineering, or how we do education, how um, you know, a large group communication, and so on and so forth. So the last one is, uh, well, do want to um, emphasize that we do have several areas on methodological side and on the uh, application side, and we are the center is contemplating moving to uh, spatial analysis. So this is indeed the last one uh, where I want to highlight the posters that you will see uh, uh, coming either out of the center or out of the bioinformatics department. They are mostly in the 100 series in the poster room. So go talk with the students. question because in, in several years ago we tend to treat those initial steps as just data cleaning as blue color work we don't have to think but now we increasingly realize even how you shave off the edges uh, represent your world view uh, how much biological signal you are discarding and how much you really know the data were generated we know that Kant's data came out of a Poisson sample but underneath it do we have three Poissons in parallel and uh, chains with another three in series, all of those will affect distribution properties. Then it, it will compel us to really think about, do we need to have a realistic working model molecularly, or we can get away with just a, a machine learning type, learn the distribution property that's not quite real. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, as, uh, People are coming in. Please, uh, you know, if you settle down, we'll just get started. Um, it was uh, great to see all the posters and so many of you enjoying uh, the breadth of different things that various people uh, have done at Michigan and and at the institutions from which we have visiting scholars. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to we're going to kick off the afternoon with a really exciting uh, industrial panel and. The uh, moderator for this panel is my colleague, Professor Ella Atkins, who is a professor of uh, aerospace engineering and, uh, and a data scientist uh, in aerospace engineering. Uh, and and uh, she's uh, worked on a number of things that uh, she probably won't tell you about. And <laughs> And she asked me not to not to tell stories about her. So, so without without further ado, uh, Professor Atkins. So my job today is not to talk about myself, but to talk about these wonderful industry panelists, and I will learn about them as you do. Uh, and so the way this is going to work is um, I'm going to basically just go down the line and introduce everybody by name, and then. Each of them are going to spend three to five minutes uh, describing their company and their data science interests, and then we'll take your questions. And I have a short list if you don't have questions, but please ask the questions that you want instead of me talking much, in which case it'll be a good session. All right, uh, I think I'm going to get the ordering right, even though their ordering is not what's up there. So immediately to my right is Tony Chin, who is AI lead for DD. I didn't ask about that name, Chu, Chu Ching? Didi Chu Ching. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, next is uh, Dana Budzin. 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 Ah, I had a chance. <laughs> Co-founder and CEO of Universal Basic Data Income. I just learned that acronym five minutes ago. <laughs> um, next, we have um, Richard Lindbergh of Quicken Loans, who I did have a loan with, not him personally, but his company at one point. <laughs> 
And then finally, Kyle Schmidt, who's managing director of the global insurance practice from JD Power, and we talked drones and insurance, which promises to be an awesome follow-on discussion. Please go ahead. Hi, um, Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tony Chin. Um, I run a AI research team uh, uh, out of Mountain View, California. Um, so we are uh, part of the uh, larger parent company, Didi Chuxin, which is um, headquartered in, in Beijing, in China. So Didi Chuxin, um, it's a, um, it's a ride-sharing platform and uh, uh, online mobility platform uh, with markets in, uh, in China, uh, in uh, Latin America currently, um, as well as uh, in uh, in Australia and uh, to some extent in Japan as well. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I, my background is in um, operations research. I got my PhD in OR uh, from Columbia University. So I'm uh, uh, more on the uh, technical side of the, you know, the, the, the table. Um, and um, so that, that's, uh, that's how I got into uh, machine learning and AI, uh, because that's uh, go hand on hand with uh, uh, operations research. Um, so regarding data science um, at DD, um, I think data science and machine learning really lies in every aspect of the of the platform and the product. Um, so within within the broader organization of AI labs, uh, we are really the people who. Uh, promote and uh, enable the uh, uh, AI and machine learning techniques uh, to uh, improve the ridership experience uh, on the platform, um, as well as uh, to you know to improve the uh, business and operations. So um, a few uh, examples of um, application of AI uh, and data science in in the uh, platform. So we have. Uh, uh, we have a speech recognition uh, sort of uh, voice command uh, assistant for drivers to enable drivers to uh, uh, command and operate the app without having to actually touch the screens. So, so that is very helpful in a lot of situations to, uh, to ensure a smooth operation as well as to ensure driver safety. Um, and we, we use optimization and uh, uh, operation research techniques in uh, uh, order dispatching, for example, to to improve the uh, overall uh, tri uh, ridership experience as well as the uh, overall driver income. Um, and yeah, some other uh, examples are um, we use uh, natural language processing techniques uh, to build out uh, uh, chatbots for customer service. So this greatly increases the. Uh, uh, the efficiency of uh, customer service. Right? Um, so yeah, so that I think that that are just uh, uh, a few examples of uh, how uh, we use data science and machine learning uh, to enable uh, a better product and and platform. Thank you. Hello. Okay, it does work. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so my company is UBDI. Um, as she said, it stands for Universal Basic Data Income. And our approach is to build a privacy by design environment where you can own and control your data um, and monetize it um, as you choose um, to be fairly compensated for the value that you're producing every day. Um, so I guess a little, I'll start with a little bit about me and how came down this path. Um, at 18, I got sepsis shock, um, which is basically blood poisoning. I went into a coma for about a month and a half, roughly. I wasn't awake for it, so it's tough to say the exact time. But uh, um, after I woke up, it was actually my challenge with health records that led me down this path because no, no one had any idea what happened to me. I had been at several different hospitals, um, and they all naturally had disagreements with each other um, and the quality of the data um, <laughs> that they were seeing. They didn't trust the other people's you know, methods, and no one could understand why this happened to a healthy 18-year-old. So um, they, they still have not figured that out, 
But what was interesting is that led me down a path as a bioengineer. Um, and I did some work with Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who was starting a consortium of companies like Children's Hospital, City of Hope, to help leverage their detector systems for um, different health and medical applications. Um, and in doing so, they were saying, oh, but if we could just get some health data. And it was this interesting moment for me where I was like, here I am trying to say, like, aggregate my health data for free with other people, and I don't have a vehicle to do so with my own data, right? And I still, the best way for me to handle my data is in a binder. It's not even on a digital, you know, um, vault for my, for my, that's protected on my phone for me to share when I choose. Um, so anyways, I decided that there needed to be a ve vehicle for people to be able to share and aggregate their data with other people um, and then be fairly compensated um, for the value that they're producing. Sometimes you might want to give it up for free for researchers for all the wonderful posters you saw outside. Sometimes you should be compensated for the value you're producing. Um, so that kind of led me down this path to UBDI. Um, and we allow people to aggregate millions of data points on themselves. Um, right now it's across social uh, data sources like Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, Flickr. Um, uh, fitness and wearables, uh, Google Fit, uh, Fitbit, which is now kind of in Google Fit, I guess. <laughs> that will, uh, we'll see how they handle that. Um, Garmin, your financial data, your health records from hospitals, um, and, and really giving you this private data vault that you can, um, that's decentralized, um, that's localized, that's in your control, and that you can then share and aggregate with other people when you choose. And, and part of that is being able to run analytics on the device, right? And as devices get better and better, it makes that a lot easier for us. Um, but it's really to distribute these studies out to everyone's devices and being able to get the results and only send the aggregated results to the back end. Um, because this idea that, you know, this is, we're eventually gonna talk about 10 years from now, but this idea that these data lakes, um, that all of these just piles of piles of data that you can query from in one place. Um, I just do not think that that is going to be in existence, both from a regulation standpoint and just from a how you should do security standpoint. Um, and so I, I guess I, I'll probably stop there. I don't know if that was three to five minutes, but we are constantly building um, and looking for different data sciences to both you know, analyze this data and find different value in different use cases, but also to do so in a privacy by design environment, which includes getting smarter and smarter about what questions you ask and how you ask them um, to be able to run those analytics in, in that safe and secure way for, for individuals. So, cool. Thank you. Well, that's going to be tough to follow. Um, so, I, my name is Rich Lindberg. I, uh, I'm a principal analyst at Quicken Loans. Um, basically, a little background about myself. I started in finance uh, about 15 years ago, um, really focusing, you know, just on trading and things along those lines. So numbers focused, but like not really in the space of data science as it is like kind of today. Um, I'd say about six or seven years ago, uh, I was seeing all the data being generated at companies that I was working at, uh, including Quicken Loans. I was like, wow, this is a, this is a really, really, really uh, potent, uh, asset that we're not really utilizing to the fullest extent. So I went back to school. Uh, I started learning uh, about this whole field that I had no idea of, machine learning, data science, and basically from probably the last five years or so, that's been my commitment, you know, is to better myself there and left the dark side of finance and kind of, you know, went more into the, uh, the data analytics and data science world. Um, so Quicken Loans and how we use, uh, how, how data and how the data science team works at Quicken Loans is we have, uh, you know, we have probably people, some people's most important information uh, that put, put them most at risk uh, with uh, their financial state. So clients have to give us their information in order for us to write a loan. We then take these loans and we give them to Fannie and Freddie, Fannie and Freddie, who are the government sponsored entities that basically uh, package those and send, send them out for securitization. Um, in order to do that, we have to follow a lot of guidelines, which means we need a lot of your information to come to us. And it is the number one thing 
that our company focuses on is making sure that that information is secure and locked down and not falling in the, into the wrong hands. So, um, so getting the data, you, you basically have this asset that you can then do things with that, you know, that can help make a client's experience better. For example, like we have a conversational analytics team where if for some reason, you know, someone comes to us, wants to learn about a mortgage, and they say, you know, I'm not really to, ready to do something today, but like in six or seven months, I'll be ready. Our team will actually take that, synthesize that, and say, in seven months, let's reach back out and do this thing, as opposed to badgering somebody every single, you know, however the marketing channels kind of go. So we have teams that do that. We have teams that focus on, uh, you know, risk and hedging and things like that. Um, and overall, we, we just have a large uh, infrastructure of data that we want to protect, that we want to make sure that uh, is secure for clients, but that we can utilize ourselves. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Schmidt. I'm the Global Managing Director at J.D. Power, uh, and I run our insurance business. Um, <clears throat> a lot of you have probably seen the brand name of J.D. Power out there, uh, a company that for the past 45 years has been focused on market research. Um, I joined J.D. Power about 13 months ago, background actually very similar to Rich. Uh, I, I spent a very long time in finance, um, uh, mostly in Europe, Asia, Africa, and in that time I, I increasingly saw the questions that was coming out of the, the executive, coming out of the business, was really focused on, we have all of this data, what, what can it be used for? What can it tell us that we don't know? Uh, my, my attraction to J.D. Power is, as I said, spent the past 40 or 50 years in market research, and it always viewed itself as a company that creates market research. Um, whereas I viewed it as a company that creates unique data. Uh, we create unique data across most major products around the world. Uh, we capture consumer sentiment. Uh, we capture customer behavior. Uh, we capture customer perception. Um, and this makes it a rather unique data set. So much as Rich said, we're sitting there, we're going, my goodness, there must be something more that we can do with this. Uh, over the past 18 months, um, we've invested heavily in artificial intelligence laboratory that we can now take this data plus other data um, and start finding out how do we productize. Uh, how do we productize in a way that um, is respectful, useful uh, to the public, understanding their sentiment, their understanding of data science, artificial intelligence as it sits today, um, and really bring useful products to the market. Um, I think probably some of the most uh, interesting things that we find is when we look in large data sets, driving uh, data telematics. Um, we haven't looked into drone data yet, but that will definitely be uh, in the future as we get there. Um, understanding the behavioral aspects of insurance, it's a very expensive product. It's uh, um, uh, a product we don't use very often, but is very useful when we do, and really trying to help uh, the public, the consumers, and the companies uh, coalesce in a better way um, uh, based off of behavior coming out of that. So I will leave it there. All right, so the main thing we want to do in this panel is to invite the audience, everyone here, to come up and ask questions. Um, I'm going to kick it off with one question that they are not going to be surprised to hear, which is the following. This panel is about what do you see to be the case in 10 years in terms of technologies, algorithms, new data sources, business models for your companies. If each of you could respond to that question, maybe to kick things off, that would be great. Yeah, going down the same line is fine or reverse, whatever you want. Sure. Um, so I, I would like to uh, provide some perspectives on the, um, on the um, data science methods and algorithm part of it. Um, so um, I think from the early days of data science, uh, people, people started off from basically uh, showing the data, visualizing the data. So that, that's when you build a data dashboard and connect to your original data source then that gives you a very convenient way of uh, seeing your data 
instead of uh, digging into the tables. Right. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a basic uh, basic initial step of utilizing data. Um, and then um, we go on to uh, the next stage of uh, developing uh, predictive analytics uh, and descriptive uh, data methods. So uh, putting into uh, the algorithmic terms, that's basically uh, to uh, develop algorithms to uh, predict some quantities and also uh, to describe your data. Um, so common applications are like um, traffic prediction or uh, uh, supply demand predictions for uh, online retailers or uh, in the case of a ride sharing platform, then we, uh, uh, we also predict um, uh, how many drivers are available, um, how many orders will be, uh, will be uh, open, uh, submit by uh, the passengers uh, in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and also, uh, you may uh, cluster your regions with similar properties uh, using clustering algorithms. So that's, that's the, uh, the predictive and uh, descriptive uh, type of methods. Um, so um, in the in the next few years, and actually uh, we, are ha we are already seeing the trend right now, is that um, more and more um, prescriptive type of methods are being utilized uh, in organization uh, to uh, provide guidance, to, uh, to provide recommendation on actual decision making. So the, pre pre uh, so the des descriptive and predictive type of methods basically will provide you some input um, and provide you some auxiliary tools uh, regarding decision making. So they, they don't actually make the decision for you. But um, I think in the, um, the big trend is that um, the methods are developed, more and more methods are developing in the, in the direction of being able to uh, make decisions. So those, those are the prescriptive type of methods. And some uh, emerging examples of those methods are like reinforcement learning um, and optimization. So, uh, so the using optimization in, uh, in business and operations is actually not something very new. So uh, we have uh, seen a lot of uh, operation research applications in, uh, for example, in uh, airline industry in the, in the online uh, or traditional brick and mortar retailers um, uh, for uh, solving planning problems. Um, but the, the problems that, modern problems that we are uh, seeing more and more common are those uh, problems that are dynamic, that uh, you don't actually see the actual demand or supply when you are making decisions. So, so you need to rely on more and more newer uh, online decision-making methods. So that, that's the direction I'm seeing data science is going, that it's, um, it's actually going to uh, automatically make decisions for you or uh, to some extent basically to provide you with the, uh, some solid recommendation regarding uh, critical decision-making. <laughs> There we go. Um, I'll keep mine uh, pretty quick. Uh, it's not perfectly related to my company, but in the in the next 10 years, I kind of, um, and maybe I'm too bullish on this, maybe I'm not bullish enough, but I see um, that we will have our own personalized uh, AI that is has to have a range of ethics that we protect ourselves from companies that have their own AI that are battling against us. Um, and, and an example of that, just to put that in like a context, is like for deep fakes that are going around, right? Um, that you would almost have your personal AI on your device with your set, that it would protect you from um, those deep, deep fakes um, for yourself. So you would have your own like personal ethics board through your personalized AI and uh, it would hopefully act on your account for different things. Um, that, that goes along the lines of personalized services as well. Um, you know, the fact that 
uh, you could gather so much data about yourself because hopefully you're all empowered and UBDI is really a thing, uh, <laughs> right? So you all have your own data that there's so much data about yourself that you can actually gather insights about yourself um, compared to a population and have that be reported back to you. Um, as well as create personalized service for yourself, whether that be around travel and everything else. And because people are hopefully empowered with their data, the battle is not between creating a data monopoly where you're harvesting and collecting as much data as you can on people, but instead um, the value that you can add um, to these two individuals and having that fair value exchange that if they find what you're doing that isn't fair, uh, they can just take that data back uh, and put it to something else that they think is the most valuable. So um, that's kind of where I see the trends going now. So in 10 years, I, you know, I think that we're gonna, we probably can't fathom a lot of the ways that things are gonna move, you know, uh, just cause I don't think 10 years ago, people were really understanding where we'd be today. So, but I, you know, that caveat aside, cause we're gonna be wrong. Um, <laughs> I, I think something Tony said about the de descriptive, prescriptive, uh, you know, data, and I think descriptive today in business is at least like the ante to play. You know, like you, if you're if you're a business starting out, you've got to be able to have the description of like what's going on, what data is out there, and all, and how how are you performing. But then prescriptive is really the long term view of things where you'll be informed of what, what's the next best action, what are things that you should, do, you know, how you should be uh, making decisions as a company in an efficient, op optimized way. Um, I think what that also means is that data literacy for people is going to have to be paramount way more so than it is today, meaning that I, I assume everybody in this room is probably pretty data literate to some extent. Um, but there's other people outside of here who are going to have to kind of take the, the steps to actually protect themselves the way that, you know, they, 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 they may not know how much, how they're generating data or why that, that, that data is being generated or how it could be used either in their favor. Cause sometimes a lot of this stuff is pretty innocuous and does good, you know, actually does good for you. I mean, there are things that, that if data is collected on you, it's, it actually can make your life a lot easier, but there's ways it can be used against you. So I think that data literacy is just paramount for the next 10 years for people. Now, another thing is like augmented reality is just, you know, it, there's so many ways that that sort of uh, technology can be used to make people more efficient in the prescriptive manner and things like that, where you're at work and if you can actually have something paying attention for, essentially for you to tell you these things and making it so that it's just part of your work environment to basically take yourself to the next level or become more optimized. I mean, that's something that we don't have too much of today. I mean, Pokemon Go was great, but like, I think in a business sense, we will actually see things like that, uh, you know, expand into other roles. Over the next 10 years, <clears throat> I'll, I'll take a, a slight tangent on the direction that this has been going, but one very parallel. Um, you know, we do a lot of work before we get into the actual use and application of data around public sentiment, individual sentiment, consumer sentiment. Uh, and, and it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> over the course of that next 10 years, I think one of the most important things we'll have is precisely, as you said, Rich, uh, to get the end users on board. There is a large level of distrust uh, amongst the general public um, uh, about the application of data, uh, how algorithms make decisions, are they biased, are they not, do we even understand how they're making a decision, uh, what is the impact of the outcome on me? Uh, which right now um, <clears throat> we haven't completely as an industry, especially as it expands out into more touch points, been able to explain that very well. Now by the counter side of that, when products come forward that get a task or a job done that is important uh, to the public and consumers, they do very much adopt it quickly. Um, you know, we think about some very basic ones. Uh, 
recommendations, optimizations uh, for online retail, um, <clears throat> uh, obviously mapping uh, uh, and direction, navigation uh, algorithms. Uh, the public is very much on board when they see it, and I, I think I heard the word innocuous in there. Uh, it's solving a day-to-day -day job, but I think my biggest fear is that we move too fast and you get a backlash. Uh, from the public at large just due to the lack of trust. So that data literacy, that explanation, that increasing confirmation that there are checks, there are controls, uh, so that we understand what the algorithms are, are ultimately doing, because I do completely agree, uh, completely agree that movement towards the prescriptive is uh, absolutely the way that it is already going, but just helping understanding so that as time goes on, um, we, we have that uh, space in the uh, public sentiment and the consumer sentiment to keep pushing the boundaries, uh, to keep doing better things and performing better tasks. Uh, but it, it, it'll take a lot of work on everyone's behalf to translate um, our language into theirs. Okay, thank you. So let's open this up to questions. Uh, get out of your seat, use some energy. Um, please go down to one of these microphones so that we'll capture your question for everyone. Yeah, and the person sitting next to the microphone made it first. Go ahead. <laughs> Anyone, anyone. Every time I turn this on, it's like a moment lag. Um, I mean, so one thing that I was doing while I was looking around on all the posters is I was actually, if you saw me take a, if someone's in here with your poster and I took a picture of it, um, I was actually looking at different data sources um, and, and things that we could replicate from people being empowered with their data, right? So I don't think, I think there's this really, bad idea that <laughs> that P really strong PR and lobbyist efforts have put in people's heads that it's like if you if a user is empowered with their data if it's controlled if GDPR exists if CCPA exists if all the increasing regulations exist that there's going to be less data and that's just that's not the case in fact there there'll be a surplus there will be more data and it'll be better data and it'll be clean data and it can start to be structured data because it's uneditable and straight from the source like there's there's very much more than just the fact that you're empowering a person like you are empowering data scientists too so I personally believe that you know for all the interesting things about an individual that you can aggregate from your YouTube from your Fitbit from everything is that expands to your utility bill to you know from everything else I think there'll be more and more incredible questions that you can ask um, to solve and you're gonna be doing so uh, with permission in an ethical way and I just I think the idea that there would be less is just not necessarily true. I just think you'd have to make your intentions clear, kind of like you were saying, like, uh, I don't wanna, I know that we're not supposed to pitch our things, but like in our app, we're constantly working on a study details page and minimizing the data that we take out. So right now it's probably not as clear as it, it, it's not as clear as it will be in the future, right? But we're literally mirroring what someone types in on the back end on that page for you. So if they're extracting that, you know, Uber, like we wanted to see Uber rides, rides versus Lyft rides and what you're spending on Target, Walgreens, whatever, like you're seeing it. So we're, so that visualization um, and the transparency of knowing what you're doing, I think as long as those things exist and we, uh, you know, work as companies and they start to adopt that model, I think you're just gonna see more powerful things that you can do with data. I think for sure we're gonna see people, you know, opt out and do things like, hey, I don't wanna be communicated, but then I go back to the data literacy thing is that just because you opt out doesn't mean that you're truly out. You know, like there's, it's, it's kind of a, there's just some nuance to the laws of how these things are written. And I think that that goes to part of the thing is like, um, I think that it goes, I, I would look back to the user to, to actually look at it and say like, how do you actually, how do you understand how these, these data points are being generated? And if they are being generated, are there other ways to, you know, get signs that aren't actually you saying this thing, but another way to kind of cap, 
cast a net to get those things. So I do agree. I think there's going to be the people will be, will be creative in how they can figure out uh, using data or using other data points that are not uh, restricted as far as uh, a user base. But I think ultimately it's like a, a data science, you know, as a data scientist, and I know Brian as a data scientist as well. But but uh, but basically with with that, I think that um, you know. I don't think anybody really wants to be using stuff that people don't want them to be to be using per se. So I think that that's we just have to hold that to ourselves as far as like data scientists in the data science community that like if people say stop bothering me, we, we find a way to meaningfully stop bothering people. All right. Uh, next question. Was I too fast? Did you guys want to say more about that? Oh, no, we were just laughing. We were coming down at the same Oh, yeah, time. okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello. So I have a question for all of you. I think every company just uh, tell everybody we have a very high study that we can guarantee the database very, with very high security. But the database linking still happening. So my question is that if this happened to your company, if what kind of method you guys will use to deal with this situation, especially for the customer? There we go. There's a lag. All right. So I, I know specifically with Quicken Loans, we probably would spare, be messaging, we would spare no expense to make sure that your data is protected at all costs. We, we will do whatever we can to basically make sure that whatever breach happened, that whatever, you know, whatever it, we have to do to regain the trust, we will, we will go down that route. Um, I think that that's just something that, and I wouldn't be surprised if I heard everybody else say it's a very similar thing, but I think it's very true with it is that like we, we have a responsibility to the client to make sure that their data is secure, that, that we can't lose, that if, if something were to happen, we do whatever we, it takes to make it right. Gosh, the lag, okay. Um, Sorry, I, I will make this short. I don't want to keep talking. <laughs> um, I was going to say the architecture that w I think part of it for, for our company is the architecture. So if there was like uh, a breach on our end, we're making sure that all of our, uh, the data that we're collecting from the device is aggregated anonymized insights from the data itself. And we built that. We built our architecture in a really creative way to let that happen. So each user in our case is given basically a personalized data vault that they keep of a, in a cloud provider of their choosing. So there's, they hold the only key um, and then there's a long layer of like, because it's in their, their own vault and then there's another key and another key and another key, right? Um, so it's just going down the ladder. Um, and because um, actually no one, the way that that vault is built is no one can actually see, touch, or hold that data. It's only when they choose to share out of that data vault that we can extract insights. And that allows us to do analysis on the device and then aggregate those insights and bring those anonymized insights onto our back end. So if, if we ourselves were hacked, uh, the goal was that we did our job properly and that you would actually be only finding those insights and there would be no PII um, and there would be no uh, way to de-anonymize our data, which is, uh, you know, constantly a struggle, especially with like Twitter data where you mentioned your best friend and like you're, <laughs> you're not known, but way to shout out to Sarah. Um, so, <laughs> right, so I mean, we're increasingly getting smarter and better about that, but I think part of this is that for newer companies, and we I'm by far the smallest on this stage, right, and we're just, we're starting out, is that building that, uh, that what I call privacy by design from the ground up and building that architecture to protect you is gonna be a lot easier um, to, you know, uh, build for that security than uh, Zuckerberg who has built his platform and he can't go back no matter what regulations are in place. Retrofitting privacy by design is an enormous task. So it's that's that's totally true. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would actually, for for our company personally, we do something very similar uh, to what you do, Dana. Um, oh, 
the objective is to keep it as little PII as possible just through the architecture. Um, we focus on all aggregated uh, anonymized data. Uh, obviously, we have plans in place. Um, if a uh, clean room or other matching service were to uh, be exposed, um, even if it wasn't tied back but contained uh, some of our customers, uh, right, you, you own up to it. You, uh, uh, whatever was leaked, uh, you go through the process of making it right. I, I think the good part is, much like you said, Rich, um, you know, we've been through a few of these. Um, staying quiet, hoping it goes away is just not part of the corp corporate culture anymore. Um, and hence, we see more solutions where if I don't need PII, I, I don't want to collect it. And if I can keep it separated so that it can't by architecture, so that I don't get it all in one go, um, even better yet. Uh, so uh, I, I think really mirroring just a version of, of what Rich and Dana said is precisely the way that we look uh, at it. It's not surprising that the messages will be uh, similar because um, data is the bloodline and, and data is sacred to, uh, to the company, um, whatever we data product that we um, offer to our customers. Um, data security really lies as a uh, top priority of, of all, the, all the agenda. Um, so, um, so customers are really uh, being assured that um, data is uh, used uh, in a responsible way um, and in an aggregated manner and, um, and it cannot be uh, traced back to uh, any individuals. Um, and that, that, is, that is the, uh, the goal that um, even, even for uh, internal use. Um, so. Just talk loud, it'll be One fine. Yeah, I think I can provide some uh, perspectives on that. Um, so, um, you know, by uh, using using the data uh, to create data products, um, we um, um, we also constantly have this um, um, idea of uh, giving back to the society, and that is that is also part of the um, part of the uh, initiative for responsible use of data. Um, so one initiative that we have within the uh, AI labs is uh, AI for social good. So um, this is to basically to um, uh, uh, to encourage uh, the uh, incorporation of uh, uh, the consideration of um, uh, social perspectives into the design of product and services. Um, so uh, one example is that uh, we have utilized uh, a knowledge, knowledge graph uh, to build out a, a tool and uh, basically um, a, a dialogue chatbot uh, for a driver care assistant to, to basically to provide such a, such a, a personal care assistant for the, for the drivers and for their well-beings. So um, the, basically the assistant provides capabilities of uh, um, providing uh, guidance on general uh, well-beings, providing um, uh, practical uh, guidance on practical issues such as uh, the areas where uh, we have seen more traffic rules violation, uh, where are the gas stations, and also um, 
even even to um, provide some uh, emotional relief through dialogue interactions. Um, so I think that's um, that's uh, one way, you know, you uh, you're able to uh, use data and then uh, to to create some uh, social good in that respect. To follow up on that, um, <clears throat> it's quite interesting as, as we've looked through, uh, customers are very good at assessing value. Anything they touch, uh, they want value. Um, and really value they increasingly, especially when it comes to data, the application of data to products, they're not defining as a discount um, a monetary return to them, they're, uh, which frankly we were kind of surprised at. Uh, they're, they're looking at <clears throat> what else can you give me back? I can give you an example on an uh, uh, insurance telematics program. Um, <clears throat> It's got some good aspects and it's got some uh, challenging aspects. The challenging aspects is are you tracking me? How much do you know about me? Uh, the underlying reality is not as much as people think. Uh, it, it's actually relatively anonymized. Uh, we don't have the frequency or the data transfer capacity to really know that much. Um, but what we're finding increasingly is what they really want is to be safer. Um, uh, and we're increasingly seeing that in the uh, insurance world, at least, is saving me money is definitely good. Uh, providing me another service is good, but can you keep me safer? Can you prevent something from happening? Um, and when you give them trade-offs between money and the things that really matter to them, their personal safety, their family safety, their friends' safety, um, they almost always choose the safety route. <clears throat> So I, I, I think we're increasingly finding rather than just pure monetary uses of data is the expansion of what benefits are coming out of this that are provable. Um, and we see that very quickly through uh, the use um, that comes out of those applications and the feedback uh, loops that are created out of those applications. So um, I, I think the shortest way to answer the question is we're getting more creative, not just how much will people pay for this, but what things can we do that people want, and that's actually rarely money. So, like public records data, is that what you're talking about? Like, okay. So, so we have data internally at Quicken Loans. We have data that we acquire externally that's from public records. And I, I think that part of it is just there's a legal construct of how you can actually engage with somebody. So that actually puts up a lot of like, if I go to public records and I find that we built a model that predicts you're likely to buy a house, all right? And I go, I want to call that person. I can't just call that person. I can't just email them. I can't do that stuff. We have legal guidelines around us to say, wall off, There's, this person does not, we, we don't have the legal right to do that. On top of that, too, with GDPR and CCPA, if you opt out, we have to basically say, forget this person's even in our database, so the, they'll be basically dropped out of the model at that point right there. So uh, when I say dropped out of the, the model, the model results. They may still be a part of the model, but completely anonymized as far as on our end, just the result will be, hey, this person, and it'll go through the whole channel and basically they'll say, you can't do anything with this thing right here. So I think that part of it is like, you know, there is a challenge with we do have public records information. We do have things like, especially for houses, like 
where, and this is for communities, it's for bondholders, it's for the homeowners of like putting that information out there and having people know that this is who owns the house, who, who lives there, uh, who, who's ultimately responsible if something goes wrong. And that's basically for our legal system, you know, set up to have that, that, sort of, uh, that sort of infrastructure. So we have to be careful of that anyway today. And going forward, we're, it's going to become even more important. As many of you, I'm sure, have noticed, it can be hard to read reporting about data science without finding a half dozen or so substantial inaccuracies. Do you think that customers and people in general are well enough educated about how data works and how their data is being used? Or are there really problematic areas that they don't understand? And if so, how can we educate them better? No. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Oh, gosh, I really thought I waited that time. Um, I'm sorry. I totally, in that moment, like totally forgot the the question. Education. Education. Yes. Um, I think part of that. A short answer: No. I I do not think people are educated enough, um, and increasingly becoming less educated around these things, and increasingly watching movies to get their education or. Um, just being fed different news from people who have a lot of money to push news into your feeds. I think that there is a problem with um, the information that people are even getting, even if they get information to read it and try to educate themselves. Um, I think to educate people, um, it's going to take visuals. It cannot be like, here's this, this is just what we get in a table, right? I think when people start to see visualizations about um, their data or they see um, in, in one of our, our partner applications, you can see a live feed of like how your Instagram data comes in and what a comment and versa like an emoji and, and everything else, right? When you start to see how that data is like separated out, I think people actually say like, oh, that's, that's the data they're collecting. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with sharing in our case and sharing that or, you know, in their case. So I, I actually think when you start to give, I know I keep coming back to this, but I think when you start to give people back their data, it takes away a lot of the fear that people have um, around how different data is being used and they can then get smarter about like, okay, I'm okay with it being used in this context, but not this context. And if they have control, they're able to like, um, or, or ownership, part of that is the fact that you can take it back if someone screws you over, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it. I think those are excellent points. I think that I'm still of the camp of no people are most, most users are not data literate of like what exactly are they doing, and I think that that's actually part of the legal system has allowed that to happen. Uh, I, there's a whole thing about Apple's iTunes, you know how it was just you know tens of pages long. Nobody's really reading through all that stuff, and I think it really for companies in the future is that if you do have data, uh, if you're if you're taking data, you're using data, you're doing anything with it, is probably having simplistic explanations of what exactly is happening or, or what is happening in general to try to get people to go down these paths to learn what's actually happening. I think that that's probably as far as the business community, you know, that'd be a lot, a lot better than a scroll of, you know, 100 mouse scroll, you know, down to basically find, to hit just accept. Because in there, they actually are spelling out exactly what are you signing up for. And I think that that is a responsibility of of uh, the data and business community to get better at explaining that. It's also a responsibility for a user that if you really don't like these things, you've got to read those. Like, you, it, it, other than, and if you don't want to do it, like, don't use that service. There are probably, there's probably another provider, or if there isn't one, start a company because people will probably do it, you know, so. So, so I want to follow up on this question. And it's, it's fascinating because I expected you guys to talk about educating people about data literacy, but I think instead you're answering with solutions that a company can offer a customer to improve their data literacy about that company. So I want to ask the question that I wanted to hear answered, so this is me using my moderator's prerogative, which is, not at the University of Michigan, which has all of these wonderful people that are data scientists and understand and other classes, people that couldn't be here today, but K through 12. How do you change the way 
kids are coming up through the new data science era to graduate from high school with a better understanding of how to do all of the things that you guys are talking about day to day as they interact with the web, with whatever it is, movies, and life. So <clears throat> rather than repeat, I agree, I agree with Dane and Rich there, everything they said. Um, here's some of the good news. Uh, customers do want to be part of the conversation. Uh, they're not in a standoffish state. Now, I can't speak to the under 18, but I can start at 18. And the difference in understanding of a current 18-year-old versus a 58-year-old, my apologies to anyone, um, is pretty substantial. Short for, they do appear to be picking it up. Um, I, I don't think they're being taught explicitly, uh, but they are much more savvy with their understanding of what data they're giving. Um, uh, a, a lot of times you'll hear, uh, you know, the younger generations will give up any data. Mm, it, I, it's not quite that simple. They, they actually are, they're definitely not reading the 10 pages, but they do have a better understanding of the footprint, footprint that they're creating and what is going out there. Will it ever reach the level that we would want it to be for complete understanding? No. Um, I, right, we're, we're still trying to get to financial literacy, let alone uh, uh, some of the things, concepts that we're talking about here. Um, but the good news is we do see evidence that they're much more educated they're learning as they go because they've interacted with this from a very young age. Uh, they are open to being part of the conversation, um, which means I think it will happen with time. The question will just be, do we get too far ahead um, and create a backlash? In other words, can, can we move at a similar pace uh, uh, as um, the public at large? Anybody else? I, I would think that the one, you know, unconventional way of uh, uh, educating the public about, for example, the, the data inaccuracy in our method is actually through constantly improving ourselves in developing those algorithms. So just to provide one example, uh, for example, on the uh, uh, ride-sharing platform is the uh, estimated arrival time that we provide to people. Um, so. The algorithms for um, predicting that, that quantity is always uh, evolving uh, through years of uh, uh, development and research. And um, uh, a number of years ago, you know, for example, the ac accuracy is, is definitely um, less accurate than it is right now. And people uh, would sense the uh, inaccuracy through the use of the uh, application. So, uh, when you when you tell the the people, oh, I'm, the driver is going to take uh, five minutes to pick you up, but it, actually it took uh, seven minutes. So, um, so the, the inaccuracy is there. Um, but now, through years of uh, uh, development and um, um, algorithm advancement, then that inaccuracy inevitably decreases, and um, um, and people experience that through uh, using, using the uh, application, and, and that, that will be felt by um, everyone who are using it. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, constantly uh, um, improving ourselves is also one way of uh, achieving that goal. Okay, we're at our last question. Um, hi there. So, a lot of our universities, and I'm from UC Berkeley, um, are like starting up a lot of data science degree programs. And as those of you who sort of work in industry, I mean, we, I'm curious because we often, you know, show the undergrads some of those reports from like McKinsey or Deloitte that say there's going to be X point X million data science jobs. And I've never been able to find the data or methods behind those. And so I just want to ask all of you, <laughs> what's your sense about like the students that we're, we're sort of, you know, educating with these degrees? What do they, what do they need? Um, what kinds of things um, are most important and, you know, what, what kinds of, you know, data scientists versus data skills, are there going to be new jobs created or are there going to be transformations to existing jobs and what can we do? Hello? Okay. Um, I'll take a first crack at it just because we, we're hiring data scientists right now. Um, <laughs> so this seems like a pretty good time to tell you what we're looking for. Um, 
No, so uh, one thing, uh, of course there's, and I, and I hope that this doesn't sound like every other job application pitch ever, but um, one thing is that it's not just the skill set. I feel like managers um, often don't know what to tell a data scientist to look for, what has value, what uh, is, you know, um, what path someone should take and look in the data because they think it's going to have a lot of value to a company. So I feel like, uh, to keep this short, um, looking for people who have also have leadership skills that they're able to recognize. Um, they're self-motivated to recognize certain patterns that could be good for a company and have the leadership skills to take initiative to say we need to get a budget like for those things. So for example, like if you look at uh, Google PageRank, right? That was someone, <laughs> that was a data scientist who the, the reason Google is what it is today is because someone said, okay, we're gonna give them the best results the quickest and, and here they are. You all know who Google is, it's a verb. <laughs> we all know, right? And it's because a data scientist took that initiative right to to basically uh find this one thing that turned them into a, basically a monopoly and and while i don't believe in monopolies um but that's kind of what uh companies are going to be looking for is of course you need those skill sets like azure core ml like what you know you're going to need uh to know about data quality and uh you know data wrangling is one of our main problems with uh like fitbit data when we run a study on fitbit data mine's dying right now if it's not already dead and i'm in a study so what does that mean for the two four six hours that i haven't charged this and my data is just zeros or the financial transaction information that comes in that says new york and then it says ny and then it says uh, you know, there's there's all these different things, right? So it sounds terrible to say, but on top of the skill sets that you're learning in school, that like leadership or that self-motivation to take initiative to ask a different type of question that you think could be most lucrative for a company and having the initiative to say, like, we need a budget for this or, you know, I'm going to take initiative. I think that's kind of what we're looking for, at least, so. Yeah, I think, you know, basic things, you know, SQL, those are like, those are kind of the building blocks of what we look for. But I mean, I think it's kind of funny where like, you, know, you mentioned something about managers not knowing what they want, where you see some job postings with like 15 years experience of neural nets. Like, no, like that, that's, that, you need a lot more basic things to get to even a point where your data structure is even possible to be, uh, a neural net to be reliably used. So like, I would say foundational stuff, you know, knowing your statistics, knowing why an algorithm, you know, does things, you know, as opposed to just kind of saying, hey, it just happened, this is great, like, I know how to do Python a little bit, you know, if, if someone's going, just, if that's someone coming in, that's, that's not good enough, so I, I would say, like, you know, looking, and I do believe that even though I don't know where those stats come from, I mean, I was from a group that came from, what, 20 to, we're like 130 right now in two or three years, so, like, the, the more people are realizing the strength of what a really solid data scientist core is in a company, it's going that that skill set's going to be one. So I just say the fundamentals: know your math, SQL, you know, know your you know if you're R Python, uh, you know Apache Spark or any of that stuff. Those are just critical things that like if you walk in, that's a that's a good to have. But if you have actually uh, subject matter expertise, that's 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 where a lot of where you can actually know what the target variable actually means, how you achieve it, could what what data you can't include, you know that, and that's really where I kind of point was like experience is also a, a matter, and not necessarily experience in that space, or like experience in data science in that space, but just general experience. So if you have that foundation plus a little subject subject matter expertise, you, you're a real powerful a asset. I just want to toss in creativity. Um, I, I think probably, you know, from the technical skills point of view, um, they're findable. Uh, I, I think when I think about that interaction where we're looking to bring someone on board, uh, from my side, I'm looking at creativity, problem solving, curiosity, uh, ability to communicate something very technical to um, internal business partners, subject matter experts. But also thinking about the data scientists looking at the organization, I think what Rich said is incredibly important. Um, am I going to be in an environment with a team that is able to articulate 
to one another how to get an actual result to be able to sit down and analyze the result. Because um, I think that is probably where this is a little bit different from a lot of jobs in the past, is we truly are translating between two worlds at, at the beginning. Uh, as time goes by and that um, expertise is developed um, out of the data scientist, it gets faster and easier, but I don't think we'll ever be able to move completely out of that world. There's gonna need to be the uh, symbiosis and collaboration between the two, but if there's creativity in that relationship, then some pretty neat things can happen. All right, we need to end pretty soon, but let me do a speed round of 20 seconds this end, that end, if you have anything to add, please uh, do that and turn your microphones on first. And if you don't have anything to add, then that's, that's 20 seconds is not much time. I, I guess I would just add, add one thing about, uh, about the last question. Yeah. So I think the, uh, the requirement set is definitely evolving. Uh, mathematical and quantitative maturity was the key for successful data scientists maybe five years ago. But uh, uh, as, we, as we go along and in the next few years, I think um, it, successful data scientists is more and more someone who is a full stack. If, if, if those of you understand software engineering, a full stack engineer is someone who can take from UI to the back end. For data scientists, that is someone who can execute a data product from end to end that is uh, beyond modeling and quantitative skills, but also uh, engineering skills, also product sense, because uh, those are basically a combination of the elements for being successful in, in data science. You were warned about that. Um, my five seconds is just gonna say, uh, make sure the questions you're asking have a purpose more I mean, I know that we want to explore, and we're at a university, so being creative is great, but I would say in the, make sure you're asking a question for someone or for something that, in my case, you know, can do some good. Um, if, you know, there's plenty of things that you can solve with data science that aren't gonna help fix the world tomorrow, and I'd say try to shift your weight towards the, the ones that will, because need a little bit of help out there, and <laughs> privacy matters, and I'll end on that. <laughs> I, I definitely think that that's an important, you know, important thing that was just said is that like you, you've got a real powerful skill set, like use it for good, use it for something that can advance and do something helpful. And if you're not doing that, you can, if you're not, if you're in a place where you can't do that, like do something else. Your skills are valuable. You, people want people like you, you know, everywhere in the business world right now, or even in academia. I mean, it's just something where I would say, hey, just, you know, Keep learning, keep doing what you do, but you know you are definitely valued, and, and it's it's becoming more and more prevalent in in uh, in practice. And I'll just leave one last note: be very uh, fast. What an exciting next twenty years! Um, you're all in fantastic seats, uh, and there are tons of problems to explore. Uh, find ones that excite you, because it's in every industry now, and. Have fun. That's a great way to end. Thank you. Ella, also, thank you very much for moderating the session. So we're taking a seven-minute break, coming back at 3.15 sharp for the next keynote speaker, Tina. And also, if you are one of the speakers in the research talk session two, Please come here and check in with me. I'm doing the PDF. I don't, because that way I know uh, that it's the right things that I want to say. Uh, I just want to go to one thing that I change. Yeah, it has it. Okay, so if you go back up, uh, let's see. Does this thing work? Yeah, I think.
Somebody okay, was using it earlier today. Uh, let's see, where's yeah, this right. mouse business? Uh, I don't know how... Where's the mouse? I want to go back up to the first... Uh, I couldn't find the mouse, and I don't want to... I mean, I could do this. Oh, wait. There you go. Can you, if you click home, there's a go. Oh, ah. home. Okay, so let's see. View... Oh, I see. So each yeah. one. Actually, I forgot the them? order. Mm -hmm. So the order is on a beer. I so think I have it. Jerome Lynch Jer is the Lynch, first one. Right. Lynch, and then. And then I have Yuran Jong. Okay. Jong, and then, then Renberg, and, and, and Martin. Then Martin. Yeah. Okay. So they're all here. Um, Should I say their names? I'm not sure I will pronounce them. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Okay. Great. We'll just all wing it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yes, of course. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. meeting in person. Yeah, yeah, same here. And Danai Kuta here, okay. she's going to chair the session. Yeah, I'll yeah. introduce you. I'll say the title and then we'll take it. So, 15 minutes, including questions. Yeah. I'll be right back. Yeah. Um, I'll probably talk for 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's good. And uh, I'll respond to all the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to try? Yes, I think they're in the folder. Wait, where is the folder? Oh, here. Uh, you said uh, name? Martin? So if you go even just to the second slide, and the audio is embedded there, it's just a question of whether it can find the file. Okay. Finding something. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how you will Are you running that. through um, HDMI or. or um, no, it looks like no. It's VGA. Okay, then we'll need a. If there is an I see audio. This one is connected then, though. Audio is connected. Oh, okay. Then it could be a machine problem that it's not reporting to that. Mm. Um, of course, I'm a Mac user. Um, yeah. Whatever the. Not uh, sure. The other possible. Tell you what, let's try a very simple system. Let me try one second. Let me try to play. Okay. So it's not playing when we're here. Oh. Maybe it's not connected yet because it didn't show up there at all. Let me ask Jing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Jing, did anyone play audio before? Like, because there's audio in this presentation and we want to make sure that it will play. Uh-huh. And it doesn't play? Like, first of all, it, do it doesn't seem connected yet. So it doesn't show oh, up Oh, here. oh, oh. You have to change oh, the... Here. Uh huh. The VSG thing. Uh, the VSG laptop. Uh, VGA. VGA. That's right. VSG. What am I thinking? Yeah, that's okay. the thing. Can I try to play? Sure. Oh, it plays. It does. It is like. Sorry. Oh, that Sorry. is my favorite most hard. That's Great, my it favorite. It works. So we're good. Yeah, oh my gosh. Right. Okay. So Tina, that's you. Uh, Jing, one more question. So, um, here, the lecture you see? Oh, okay, so that is when we will show that. Okay, yeah. good, good. And, and then, then we'll switch when Tina is here. Okay, so it's good. Oh, 
Sorry. No, it's okay. She just left. Oh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> So, oh, let me, uh, so you know how, yes, how to, to yes. wait, hold on, full screen, go ahead. VGA, or was it a, a line? Maybe it was HDMI? It is VGA. It should be VGA. Yeah, yeah, I thought. Oh, um, you want to Can we yes. just do this? Uh, where do you go? Yeah. I did full screen control. Full screen. Uh, maybe it's another. Yeah, yeah other windows or something? I don't know um, windows. Yeah, I mean. Um, so we did do VGA. So we are okay, up on yeah. the screen. Oh, no, okay, we no. were up on the screen. Yeah, but it was showing this one. It's oh, it was showing for that some one, reason. Okay. But it is VGA here that's connected. So what is showing now? It's not nothing. nothing. No. Before it showed it. Over. No, no, I don't. Oh no, well, you did not try it. I'm not sure. I don't know if okay. it was showing that okay. or if it's showing this. Oh, not showing like this. that. Okay, now it's showing this, and then it should show. You see, it's nothing. showing that. It is. And I don't yeah. know if this is right. this or if Maybe it's we a can mirror. I don't know oh, how to mirror. Is it like Control this. F8 no, I don't or something? Know for Windows. I can put put my laptop on because um, I don't know Windows, so I don't know how to gather stuff. I don't know how to search. Yeah, let me just make sure. No. Is it like F8 or no? It can't be F8 or whatever it is. It was just working a second ago. Well, PowerPoint works, but it projects PowerPoint? over there. Yeah, PowerPoint is what I tried well, before. Can I um, put my laptop instead? Sure, I think let's so. your laptop. Yeah. Uh, Let me see. There's a... I thought there's a connection. Uh, we can use this one again, just the same one.
Huh? We can use this one. Oh, okay. Um, so I would need a... What, what is that? Is that you, 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 as, uh, you, you No, it's a... It's yeah. a this, this thing. Yeah, this, that should be fine. Yeah. Let's take this one away. Yeah, let's on this see. Side here. Yeah, let's see if it works. Yeah. I'm, I let's not just yeah, knock out anything, right? Like, mm. Okay. Yeah, something is not quite. Oh, okay, it's working. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you, okay. right? Yes. Okay, let's get started. All right, so, um, so I'd like to um, um, bring to the stage um, here uh, Denai Kutra, who's a faculty member in computer science and engineering and a member of the MIDAS Symposium Program Committee and she will be introducing Tina and chairing the next research talk session. Thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce Tina Eliassi Red, who's an associate professor of computer science at Northeastern University and also a core faculty member of the network, um, the network science uh, institute there. Uh, before a Northeastern, Tina was at Rutgers University, and before that at Lawrence Livermore um, National Laboratory. Uh, Tina is a fellow of the ISI Foundation, and she has given over 190 invited talks. I don't know which number we are. Uh, I have a lot of friends. Yes. <laughs> um, her research focuses on data mining and machine learning, and um, has been applied in a lot of different applications, including personalized search on the web, fraud detection, cyber situational awareness, and also ethics and machine learning, which is very excited about these days. So please join me in welcoming Tina Eliasirad. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sinai and Jag and uh, Jing, for inviting me and for all of you for being here. Um, so if you're puzzled by the title of the talk, Mission Accomplished, so is it just machine learning or is it just machine learning? Um, so uh, let's start from where machine learning came from, so a little history lesson. So Arthur Samuel coined the phrase machine learning way back in the 1950s, and the very first machine learning program was the Arthur Samuel's uh, checker playing program. And it wasn't learning the way we think of learning now, it was just memorizing every state of the game uh, with the terminal reward of having been in that state. And it was doing some alpha beta pruning, so for those of you who have taken an AI course. Um, machine learning initially is, the, or in theory, is this lovely interdisciplinary flower where lots of different disciplines come together. And if I don't have your discipline up there, my apologies, I didn't want the flower to be too crowded. In practice, this is machine learning. So A says to B, this is your machine learning system. B says, yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. A says, what if the answers are wrong? B says, just stir the pile until they start looking right. It's a little cynical, but it's about right uh, in terms of what's happening out there. Now, what I would like you to focus on is the notion of right and wrong. So the notion of right and wrong here has nothing to do with morality. So when I say right and wrong and morality, think about your mother and what you would do that would make your mother proud, right? As in being a good person kind of a, kind of a thing. Now, fast forward, Tom Mitchell, uh, who was Rahit Ghani's uh, advisor, wrote this book back in 1997. And if you want to read a machine learning book, this is a really good one to start off with. I learned machine learning off of preprints of this book. He defined the well-posed learning problem as a triple. You have a task, you have experience, experience is data, and you have performance measures. And you would say that a computer program is learning from experience for that task if it gets better at that task with the performance measure that you have. So a particular machine learning task that you would all know is a spam filter. 
right? So the spam filter will see you labeling things as spam or not, moving it to the junk box or not, and over time you would hope that the accuracy of the spam filter improves, right? So that's one of the things that you would all know. Now when machine learning goes wrong, it's because one or more of this triple went wrong. That is, they weren't well defined. So let's go through just machine learning from these three um, variables. First is the task. And what I'm interested in in terms of AI and ethics, or uh, if you uh, narrow it down, fairness in machine learning, is where, uh, where you're interested in um, high stakes decisions, right? Whether Tina goes to jail or not, whether Tina gets a loan or not, whether Tina gets hired or not. So those are the things I'm interested in. I'm not so much interested in um, well, you know, you, um, fair web ranking, for example. So the two most popular tasks in this area have been risk assessment and ranking. You may say, why these two tasks? Machine learning has lots of other tasks. Well, I have a cynical answer to them. One is machine learning people know a lot about risk assessment, and we know a lot about ranking. It's low-hanging fruit. This will, should take you back to George W. Bush's era, low-hanging fruit. Um, the other one is that human decision makers that use these automated tools uh, understand risk assessment. Risk of Tina defaulting is eight, Rahit is two, so Rahit gets the loan and Tina doesn't, right? Risk of Tina committing a crime is uh, six, but Bob's is two or three, whatever, and he goes free and Tina goes um, to jail and doesn't get bail. It's very clear cut, right? Very easy for them to understand. Now, one of the things for you guys to think about are all the different issues with these two task definitions. And I'm going to specifically focus on risk assessment because that's where a lot of the work has been. So the one thing is the task of risk assessment or even ranking, it's too underdescribed. It's too abstract to have any kind of normative or ethical consideration. So when I say normative, I mean think about like, Murder should not happen. Descriptive is murder happens, right? So, and if you think about like normative ethical theories, they usually break down into three. These are the three most popular ones. So consequentialism, you know, you care about the consequences of your actions, and a lot of the work in machine learning has been on consequentialism, because it's about expected utility. We all love and know expected utility, like the back of our hands. Um, the other one is deontology, so this you should channel your German, it's about rules and duties. And the last one is virtue ethics, that is, you should um, do what a good moral agent would do, what an exemplar human being would do. And so mostly the focus has been on consequentialism, but the task of risk assessment is just not um, big enough to have any kind of normative consideration. It's just sorting. Risk assessment is classification which is sorting. Yes, no, yes, no. Again, computer science is very good at sorting, right? So then there's this whole area within risk assessment about impossibility results. His mission impossible. For those of you who don't know about impossibility results, it's basically you can't have your cake and eat it too. For risk assessment, this is task um, specific, um, Cheldukova, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon in 2016 showed that Suppose I break up my population into two groups that are mutually exclusive, A's and B's, so blacks and non-blacks. And suppose that I have different base rates. Or let's have a different example. Suppose I break my population into females and non-females, and that I have unequal base rates where, for example, the probability of a female getting breast cancer is not the same as the probability of a male getting breast cancer. And then she assumed that, um, suppose you have statistical parity, that is the probability of your classifier saying somebody has a breast cancer and that's female is the same as the probability of your classifier saying somebody has breast cancer and it's non-female. Then she showed that you can have these three parity or fairness measures that at the time were very popular. So precision parity, true positive parity, and false positive parity. These all are derived from the confusion matrix or the error matrix. If you talk to an actual ethicist, they're like, how come I'm tied to this confusion matrix? Like who died and married me to this confusion matrix and I can't divorce it? 
But computer scientists, machine learning people, we love our confusion matrices, right? It's like gift from God, and it just keeps giving. So then Kleinberg et al. generalized Cheldakova's results and said, okay, suppose I ha still have my mutual exclusivity between females and non-females, and still suppose I have unequal base rates, but I'm going to get rid of statistical parity. I'm going to add in the fact that my classifiers are, uh, um, and the classifier and the actual results are not identical. That is, they're not identical variables, and I have an imperfect classifier. And these are very simple assumptions, right? It's unlikely that your classifier is going to be perfect, right? And it's unlikely that you're going to have identical variables between the, vari the target variable that you're trying to predict and the actual truth. And again, they show that you can't have these three parity um, measures. And then last year, Feidelson and I actually simplified Kleinberg's results where you don't even need mutual exclusivity. That is, you could be somebody like Barack Obama who's black and white. You can be somebody who um, straddles the different groups, and you still will have these kinds of impossibility results. So what has happened due to these kinds of impossibility results? Computer scientists are very good at bastardizing things because we want it to work. They're like, oh, we'll just get rid of one of them. Who cares, right? Or we'll put some bounds on it. But, you know, if I'm in front of a judge and this algorithm is being used on me, I really don't want to get rid of one or, you know, put a bound on it. So there are people in law, like Deborah Hellman at University of Virginia, who's been studying what do these different parity measures actually mean. And so for her, precision parity means what you ought to believe, and true positive parity and false positive parity means what you ought to do. And so she has this argument, and she's writing a book about it, that if you are actually going to get rid of one, you should get rid of precision parity. Because precision parity looks for the right-making properties, and usually the right-making properties is being a white male. Which, for the white males among you, you have a royal flush good on you. For the rest of us, alas. Right? So then there are other issues with the current task. One of them is that the current tasks do not return any kind of uncertainty values. For all of you who are data scientists, machine learning people, data mining people, all the buzzwords, you know that there's some uncertainty in the result that your algorithm gives. But what the human decision maker is seeing is not those uncertainties. And there's lots of these examples of when you don't give uncertainty values to the human decision maker, what happens. One of them is this famous ProPublica study. Right? where this judge over, uh, over, uh, throws out, overturns the plea deal that the lawyers had made because the automated decision-making tool, the machine learning algorithm, the risk assessment tool, said that the risk of this guy recidivating was high. Now, perhaps the judge would have done differently if he would have been told that the risk assessment tool was only about 65% sure, right? Because part of it is also is in terms of incentives, and I'll come to it, that the judge doesn't want to go with a plea deal given that the algorithm is saying the risk of this guy recidivating is high because if the guy is let go and he does recidivate, then he, the judge may show up in the front cover of New York Times and he does not want that, right? The other aspect of it is these algorithms don't take context into account, right? You're taking, like, the compass data, right? It's 30 years' worth of data. It does not look at the context. It does not look at the laws. It does not look at the change in cultural norms. You're throwing it all into this sorting algorithm, and it's just trying to sort things, right? And that doesn't seem right, right? About 100 or however many years ago, slavery was legal, right? So... You don't want to take data that goes all the way back there, right? The cultural norms have changed. The laws have changed. We're supposedly better human beings now. So there are lots of approaches out there that can take context and uncertainty into account. We have one called learning to place, where society defines for us what's better and what's worse, right? First degree murder is very bad, petty theft, you know, it's better, much better than first degree murder. So there is this spectrum in terms of good and bad. And perhaps when a new person comes in, what we want to do is figure out where this new person places and have some uncertainty values about where this new place, person places, then ask the judge and say, well, the algorithm believes that Peter falls between Ed and Bill, and this is the confidence of the algorithm. And have the judge look at Peter 
uh, look at Bill and Ed's cases, and then make a decision about Peter if he chooses to. And so these algorithms are very simple. You build, for example, a classifier based on pair pairwise comparisons, and then when a new item comes in, you use the classifier to be able to place this new item. Right? And you may have some conflicts in terms of what your classifier will give you because the classifier isn't perfect. And so you would have, for example, a simple maximum likelihood estimate of voting where, you know, does the classifier say that this new item mostly belongs between item one and three or in other intervals? It's one approach. There are lots and lots of approaches that are intelligible, that you can actually explain it to somebody that will provide you context and will provide you some uncertainty uh, values. But there are other issues. Some of the other issues is that um, these algorithms don't take into account the incentives of the human decision maker. And in fact, the first person that brought this up to me was Pro Professor Peter Railton, who is a philosopher here in Michigan. And so he was telling me, you know, the incentives or the values of why this person is using a machine learning algorithm is extremely important. And you should take that into account. Why is the judge using your machine learning algorithm? Is it for efficiency purposes? If it is for efficiency purposes, what happened to due process? Right? Would you want a judge to use a machine learning algorithm to just sort things because he has a case this high? Or a doctor to use it? Is it because they want to have a more quote unquote accurate algorithm? And what does accurate mean there? Because accuracy is tied um, to the data that, that is being used? Or is it because of interpretability or explainability? So Andrew Gilman, who's a, who's a statistician at Columbia, had a blog post last year about the distinctions between interpretability and explainability. Ex expl explainability is post hoc. I have some input, I have some output, and I'm just trying to reason why I got this output given that input. And interpretability is, no, no, I want to crack up the model and see what exactly it did. And in some cases, maybe you really need interpretability. That is, you need a white box that you can actually see in it. Maybe it's all of the above. But how do you take these incentives and, and use them within your machine learning algorithm? Because you should be mindful of these. The other one is, OK, so if I am going to take the incentives into account, how should I incorporate that into my machine learning task? Should my machine learning task be somehow game theoretic? Like in the judicial system, it seems like there's a game going on, right? And so should my machine learning algorithm take that into account? Should my machine learning algorithm just learn from human exemplars? We have good judges and we have bad judges. In America, judges are rated. Um, they, have rating, they have stars, like restaurants have them. We have, we have doctors, better doctors and worse doctors. So maybe the machine learning algorithm should learn to mimic what a good doctor would do, or what a set of good doctors would do, or what a, a set of good judges would do, given the context. And so that's where we get to virtue ethics. So Socrates was a virtue ethicist. That is, you want to do what a good person would do. Now, we can have this discussion of who's a good person and who's a bad person, right? But there is this notion that some people are better at what they do than others. And perhaps we should learn on the people who are better at what they do. And we can have the people who are not very good at what they do as a counterbalance, as negative <laughs> examples. So if you think about the, these kinds of high stakes decisions uh, in criminal justice, in medicine, both uh, the judicial system here, when you become a lawyer and when you become a doctor, these are apprenticeship models, right? Especially, for example, in medicine, uh, you know, you are an undergraduate, then you're a medical student, then you're an intern, then you're a resident, then you're a fellow, right? It's just going all the way up to until you're an attendant. So do we have something in machine learning that is apprenticeship learning or imitation learning where we can actually learn from a human exemplar? Well, we do have that. It's just a very hard task. And it's never been applied for this particular application. It's been applied for like learning how to race cars or playing soccer and other kinds of tasks, but not how a human being makes a decision. So it's called imitation learning or apprenticeship learning. 
And what you do is you give it a bunch of demonstrators or an access um, to demonstrators, and it tries to learn a policy, the machine learning algorithm will try to learn a policy that will mimic those demonstration. And so the ingredients of it is, obviously you need access to a demonstrator or demonstrations. You need an environment or a simulator, right? You need to have context. You have a policy or hypothesis class, right? This is where you, what the first thing you learn in a machine learning class, right? My, my policy is coming from a 10th order polynomial. That's a bad idea, by the way. You're probably gonna overfit. Um, you have some loss function and then you have some learning algorithm. So this should make you think about um, reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement re learning, where Rahid also mentioned this um, in his talk. And we're not the first people to think about it. There are others who have thought about applying either inverse reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning models for these tasks. But if you look at these papers, the tasks that they're looking at are very simple tasks, like cake or death. Like I have something of, of value in the middle of a room, I'm sending a robot in to get it and the room is on fire. Um, so they haven't been scaled up to apply it in real world setup. Now when I talked about these with philosophers, they had some objections. This is one particular one, Michael Teitelbaum, who is a philosophy professor and an ethicist at University of Wisconsin-Madison. He said, how are you going to figure out the variables that a human exemplar attends to? And I'm like, well, through interviews and observations of the human exemplar. He's like, I worry about the reliability of such self-reports. I'm like, yeah, me too. Um, but we'll test their judgments also in simulated cases. Then he's like, well, but I'm worried about their judgments in the simulated cases because they're not the same as real life. I'm like, yeah, I'm worried about it too. But at this point, it seems like this is the best task we have. Not that much work has been gone into what is the right machine learning task here? We have just taken it for granted, risk assessment, move on from there, as if we're wedded to risk assessment, but why? So we need a lot of work in terms of what is the right machine learning task. There are others, like um, Tracy Mears, uh, where she's like, what machine learning should do is focus on procedural justice. That is, I would feel like um, the system was fair to me and I was treated justly if I was treated with dignity, if I was given time to actually speak up, if I was heard, right? And so the machine learning algorithm should take these four components into account. This is again hard for a machine learning algorithm to take into account, right? To define that, oh, Tina was treated with dignity, Tina was given enough time to tell her story, Tina was explained why XYZ was happening to her. And, Tina, uh, and somebody explained to Tina why the procedure is as follows, right? And again, these things are hard for machine learning algorithms. It's where we can grow um, as machine learning and, uh, people and data scientists. And then perhaps machine learning should not be used for some tasks. So mass inc in incarceration in America, and Rahit mentioned it in his talk, uh, is a problem at the state level. And so if you think about a pretrial disposition, there are two factors. One is flight risk and one is um, dangerousness. Perhaps machine learning can be used for flight risk. Did you take Tina's passport away? How long has Tina been living here? Does Tina work here? So on and so Like there are these features that, that, that make sense to us. But dangerousness is just fraught with all the social problems that we have. So maybe the bar for dangerousness and a machine a learning algorithm should be, uh, that, that is going to be used for dangerousness should be a lot higher. And there's this bear reform movement in America that's trying to make this happen. And in particular, I'm working with Debbie Ramirez at Northeastern, who's a law professor, and I like what she says, which is bail was not designed to and should not be used for crime control, <laughs> right? And so they, we should separate flight risk from dangerousness uh, because dangerousness gets close to crime control and bail was not designed for that. Now what should machine learning be used for, right? Um, you heard lots of good examples that Rahid mentioned. Another aspect is perhaps machine learning could be a check on bad policies, right? So if you think about um, the um, stop and frisk program in New York City, and you look at the data that's coming out of that program, and you try to reconstruct the intent of that policy, um, you're likely to get that the intent of the policy was to stop uh, young black and brown people and harass them. 
But clearly, that wasn't the intent of the policy that was written by the policymakers. And so then you can make some noise and you can change the world, right? So this is where I feel like machine learning can have a lot of impact. And then there's a broader question. It is likely that DARPA is going to have a program on computational ethics and whether computational ethics is something that we can solve if, if we solve these other problems. And to me, it is not solvable. Because if you think about um, ethics and if you think about computation, what I need to do is I need to reduce ethics into, as this book Moral Machines said, not to be mistaken with the work that Aya Rahman did on moral machine, on trolley problems. This, this book came out in 2009. They were ahead of their time. Um, you can't reduce ethics to just a lo uh, like a logically consistent set of laws that I can put in this computer, right? And so this notion that we can get to this computational ethics and I can have this UAV going out there and, and doing humanitarian aid by itself and come back and be responsible for what, what it did is too far-fetched right now. And I don't think we're going to reach it. I think it's the wrong question to ask. The other aspect is, is the machine learning algorithm actually learning for the task that you decided, right? Even if you have the right um, task. So some of you may be too young, but uh, way back then, this is a paper from 1992. Um, in the 80s, the United States government wanted to be able to distinguish tanks that were camouflaged versus tanks that weren't camouflaged in woods, and they trained a neural network. Back then, neural networks were also popular. This is the third coming. Um, and um, the neural networks seem to be doing really well, the, the, the trained artificial neural network. Uh, and then it, they gave it some control images, and they found that it was just horrible. And what they found was that the neural network learned uh, when it was cloudy and when it was not cloudy. It did not learn uh, when tanks were camouflaged or not. Uh, because all the times that the tanks were camouflaged were was cloudy, and all the times that it wasn't, it was sunny. And what the neural network actually learned to, to discriminate was whether it was, it was cloudy or not. So it didn't learn for the task. And then there's some really bad science from Stanford recently. This idea that my image recognition software can, decide, can, can tell whether you're gay or not. And it seems like what they learned was that some people tend to have photos that have better lightning, uh, better lighting. That's what they learn. But imagine going to a country that being gay is a death sentence, right? And they're you, or imagine going to a country that is using uh, a convolutional neural network to decide whether you're a terrorist or not. And it's just that, you know, perhaps some photos have worse lighting and off with your head. It doesn't seem right, right? So you need to be careful and double check and audit that your machine learning algorithm actually learned for the task that you intended it um, to learn. So those are about the task. And I'm spending a lot of time on the task because the task is extremely important. It's where we can be creative, right? As opposed to just saying risk assessment. We know it. We're going to go from there, right? Um, then there's experience. There's a lot that have been said about experience. So Joy uh, Bolyamini, who is at MIT Media Lab, um, she has um, this work that the commercial facial recognition systems were not uh, able to detect her face. And as soon as she would put on a white mask, then um, she would, she, they would see her. These facial recognition software would see her. And she coined the phrase undersampled majority which is that uh, the majority of population on the planet are not white males, but the majority of the instances in the training data are white male, right? Hence the under undersampled majority. There are lots of other cases. And one of the things to pay attention here is that usually when we do machine learning, we think that if I get something wrong, um, the loss between getting this instance wrong and that instance wrong is about the same. But obviously, this is not uniform loss, right? When Google labeled that African-American woman a gorilla, that was a huge loss for them, right? And so you need to take those things into account. And so then it becomes a question about, should we learn from demonstrations? Should we learn from simulations? Should I take into account implicit and explicit biases that people have? So Gabby Johnson is another philosopher 
who uh, is at Claremont McKenna now, and she wrote this great book on the, uh, this great paper on the structure of bias. I'm sure it will become a book soon. Um, and it's about um, explicit and implicit biases that people have. And my interpretation of the paper, I've been hanging out a lot with philosophers and ethicists, and so there's different interpretations of the readings of the text. But my interpretation was that explicit biases are like if-then rules, and implicit biases are training instances. And from time to time, I tap into the training instances and I make inferences. And the inconsistencies that you see in Tina is because I make these inferences from these implicit biases that I have. And so I may end up at different lo locations because I have to do that inductive leap, right? And so you have to take both implicit and explicit biases into account. And when does something that's an implicit bias become an explicit bias in the human decision maker? And then should we learn, for example, from complex networks? I'm in the Network Science Institute. So if you think about it in terms of individual fairness, the way, for example, Cynthia Dork defines it, is that if two people are similar, then the decisions on them should be similar. Um, and that is very much uh, about, uh, about selection in, in, for example, social networks, that uh, we are friends because we're similar. Or in terms of influence, this idea of guilt by association, your moms would say, don't hang out with Jane, she uh, will lead you down the wrong path, right? That you are friends with Jane and Jane is a bad influence and so then um, the decision on you should also um, uh, not be, be as charitable, for example. Um, in this area of complex networks and network science, one of the things which is interesting is the dynamics of privilege and prejudice. So if you get your PhD from a privileged lab, and we all know what that means, so don't come to me and say, oh, I don't know what privilege is. Um, so in academia, um, so, so that privilege doesn't stick to everybody the same way. Why is that? And how far does that privilege go? So does it go just to your academic child and then stops and doesn't go to your academic grandchild? Or does it go to your academic grandchild and how much? And does it go to your academic grand, um, great-grandchild? And how, what is the dynamics of privilege and what is the dynamics of prejudice, right? And are there, for example, phase transitions and all these kind of cool things that statistical mechanics folks like to study? Uh, within this area, in particular in computational and social science, um, there was a keynote talk at ICWSM that Jaron was uh, the program co-chair for um, about inequalities in, uh, in social net network by Marcus Strohmeyer, where he was trying to study uh, the rise of e inequalities in social networks based on the two dominant processes in social networks. One is closing of triangles, and the other one is preferential attachment. So when you enter a social network, you want to attach yourself to a star, and usually friends of friends become friends, right? And how that could lead to some of the inequalities that we're seeing in social networks. So there's, again, a lot to be done here. Oops. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, oh, I clicked on the, uh, oops. I clicked on the link. Um, okay. Then there's performance measures, right? There's been a lot done on performance measures. There's lots and lots of different fairness definitions. Rahid mentioned it too. There's group fairness, individual fairness, procedural fairness. Um, uh, when Arvin gave his talk back in 2018, there were 21 fairness measures. I think now they're like 50 something. You know, every other day there's another paper who nobody will cite and nobody will care about one of these. Um, and there's lots of these tutorials. Like there was one also at KDD. This one was at, was at Wisdom. But almost all the current approaches rely on, again, the confusion matrix as opposed to perhaps let's open up our minds and think about other things that we can measure fairness with or justice with. And usually these uh, current um, fairness measures aren't, again, big enough. They're not, um, uh, they, they do not have the capacity to have any kind of normative uh, or, or value judgment. And in particular, one of the things is there's this movement of, of accuracy first, where, oh, the algorithm is more accurate than a human being, so I'm going to use the algorithm, right? And my, uh, my, my answer to that usually is, oh, so you read a study, 
that had one data that did better than humans. Good for you, right? And so there was this famous study back in the 1990s in Pittsburgh where, again, they trained a neural network, and they wanted to predict whether when somebody shows up to the hospital and they have symptoms of pneumonia, whether they will develop complications. And the neural network seemed to do very well in terms of performance measures, all the all this stuff you like from the confusion matrix. But then somebody noticed, somebody that was working on the rule-based stuff noticed that, uh, wait a second, um, the neural network says that if you show up to the hospital with symptoms of pneumonia and you have asthma, uh, the risk of you developing complications is very low. That doesn't seem right, right? And it was because um, they didn't know that hospitals have this policy that if you show up with symptoms of pneumonia and you have asthma, you immediately get admitted, right? And so this, this notion of accuracy first, you have to be careful, especially in these high stakes decisions. Now, there are recent works by Rich Caruana, for example, at Microsoft Research that says, and I love his title, Friends Don't Let Friends Deploy Black Box Models. So if a friend is allowing you to deploy a black box model, he's not your friend, she's not your friend. And so he's looking at perhaps we don't have to give up performance for intelligibility. And he has this system called generalized additive models with pairwise interactions, and you can read all about them here, and you can download his code and try it. Again, I don't get any money from Rich by doing this. It's just saying it's good, good work. So some take-home messages. One is that we need to think about normativity or what ought to be, right, what, what you ought to do um, throughout the entire well-posed learning problem, the task, the experience, and the performance measures. Right now, everything is basically on the performance measures and some on the experience, but the task is like, no, you know, risk assessment given by God cannot be changed, which is wrong. Uh, we need to take into account the incentives and the values of the human decision maker. Why is it that an algorithm is being used here, right? Um, perhaps one task that we should learn is how a human makes a decision, right? And then learn on humans that typically make better decisions than other, other humans. And then we should have a serious discussion as to when, where, for what, and how machine learning algorithms should be used, right? And this is a more general, bigger question that we should have as a society. Now, I feel like there are certain areas of our society that are doing better than others. So FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is developing this good machine learning practices, like you have good manufacturing practices, good clinical practices, good laboratory practices. And in particular, one of the things that they're pushing is that maybe machine learning uh, algorithms should come with warning labels, right? Because machine learning algorithms affect people's lives, they perform differently on different subpopulations, and they have side effects. And so what we should do is we should have regulations that we can handle adverse effects, we can do auditing on the machine learning algorithms, we can uh, understand who the product is for, who the machine learning algorithm is for, uh, be able to articulate the risks and, and benefits of using machine learning algorithm, and also care about people's uh, data rights and privacy, right? And so what does that uh, machine learning practices, the good machine learning practices looks like? And this is their latest article, uh, their, their latest document on this, and it has good figures, and uh, it's a good start. And then lastly, education came up. So I want to say something about education before uh, I, I get off the uh, dais. So there's been a lot of talk about teaching ethics to machine learning people uh, and computer scientists, and I'm all for it. And you can find a whole list here uh, of, of courses, both in America and outside of America. Uh, I like this particular course that was taught at Stanford last winter. And there are others who are saying that you shouldn't just have one machine, uh, one ethics course, you should have ethics built in within the curriculum. And absolutely, I'm all for it, right? I'm a professor of education, yes. But one of the things that we need to do is we need to teach the public, the general public, about algorithms, about al algorithmic literacy, about how these algorithms can affect their lives. Right? And this kind of course has to be mandatory for all undergraduates, which means that no math or coding background, which means that we need to tell them how algorithms that, for example, Google uses, Twitter uses, um, Facebook uses, 
um, how they affect their lives. Why should they believe on what they see in Wikipedia, right? Um, and educate a public that can then hopefully elect representatives that know more about what the hell is going on. And then we can have better policies and better laws and better regulations. So at Northeastern, I'm gonna be teaching a class in the honors program, freshman honors, next semester. The title of it is Algorithms That Affect Our Lives. And depending on how it goes, I have ambitions of conquering <laughs> and, and having it be mandatory for all undergraduates at Northeastern. Uh, because we need a population that knows um, how these algorithms can adversely affect their lives or can affect their lives in a better way. I'm sure you've heard the story of this uh, person who was uh, admitted into Harvard, then Harvard found some tweets of his, and then Harvard took back the admissions of this person, right? This person never thought that, that those tweets would have that kind of effect on their lives, right? And, uh, and there was a nice podcast uh, recently with him where he's like, there is no unsend button. And so perhaps we should educate the public that you should think about what you put out there about how these algorithms are being used. And I'm sure you all, for example, know of Latanya Sweeney's work. So Latanya Sweeney is a professor at Harvard where she went to Google and typed in Latanya Sweeney and the ads that popped up were about bail bonds and then she changed her, her search to Tanya Sweeney, a more white uh, sounding name, and the ads changed to like ancestry.com and so on and so forth. So if you're an employer and you're doing your Google search on the person, on this candidate, you may think, hmm, why is Google coming up with these kinds of ads? Maybe I don't want this person. And not thinking about, wait a second, there are all these other biases that are happening and I should um, take those into account. So on that, I want to thank uh, these nice folks that have been talking to me. So uh, Danielle Allen started me on this road about two years ago. She's the director of the Ethics Center at Harvard. And she said, why don't you come down and give a public lecture? And I thought, oh, this would be good. The next time I write an NSF grant for the broadening impact, I can say, oh, computer scientists went and talked to the public. Uh, and then it kind of bloomed from there. Uh, Jack McDevitt, who's a criminologist, uh, who taught me a lot about Florida and the whole system there and how uh, when you are in, in a prison in Florida, they don't let you get a driver's license, at least in, in, in Broward County. When you get out, you don't have a valid driver's license. You're driving while not white and you're more likely to get stopped and that breaks the condition of your parole. Uh, Brandon Feitelson and Ron Sandler and countless other philosophers who have been educating me on ethics. And thank you for listening. My slides are up there and that's my contact information. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the interesting talk. We have time for questions. If you want to stand up at the microphones. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tina. That's a very interesting talk and uh, a very interesting topic of research. Um, so I really, uh, I was really intrigued by your uh, like idea of using apprenticeship and imitation learning for ethics ethics research. However, um, one issue I see there is that how would you ensure that uh, the apprentice neural network or like any machine learning model that you're learning, it's not just uh, reflecting the biases of the human exemplars from which it is learning, right? So do you, what are your thoughts on that? Right, so, so I guess on that, my punch would be that I'm okay with the biases of the human exemplar, right? So if I believe that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a good human exemplar for, as a judge, then I'm okay with the biases that she has. And so then I'm okay with the, uh, the imitation learner to imitate her biases, right? Uh, it, it, so a little bit more about imitation learning. Uh, what we are doing in, um, at Northeastern is through Debbie Ramirez, we have access to the courts in Massachusetts. Um, Debbie happens to be married to the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, uh, a big gavel. Uh, and, so, and so we will be able to interview the judges. 
and, and why they made these decisions, and we will be able to have access to the courtroom documents and so on and so forth. Because if you really want to do a good job, right, the interactions between the people in the court matters, uh, the body gestures, the tones of voice, all of that, that kind of thing, in terms of biases, right? Uh, and then interviewing them afterwards in terms of well, why did you make this decision? Uh, and perhaps sometimes the judges, their hands are tied behind their back and sometimes it is not. And so doing a more in-depth analysis of this than like 30 years worth of data and trying to figure out whether somebody is going to receive a date or not. Yeah, good question. Hi, yeah, so I guess my question is also along those lines a little bit. It does seem like for some of the things that you're doing, what you really have is a forecasting problem. You want to know this person who is in some ways very similar to these other people, uh, are they going to do X in the future? Uh, and I'm wondering if you've, you've talked about learning from human exemplars, but to me that kind of seems like equivalent to the sort of silly problem of saying, I really want a machine learner who's going to forecast the weather just as good as the best human forecaster, instead of just saying, well, I, I want the best machine learning algorithm who just predicted the actual weather correctly. Well, I guess... And so don't you have data on some of these people going? I'm just wondering how you how you take in some of these cases where there are human judgments, but then there are also factual statements from the past, right. how you incorporate those or if you incorporate them or what, what pitfalls there might be in doing that. So the question is, what is the alternative, right? So if I have 30 years worth of data or even 10 years or even one year worth of data, right? So, so where does that data come from, right? Uh, if, if the judge doesn't grant me uh, bail and I go to prison, then the judge is forecasting that I will do something Right, and so I'm not out to do it, and I don't have that kind of opportunity. So what I'm trying to do is pull the layer back once and not look at these kinds of trailings of data uh, that I'm seeing, but actually to see why the judge made this decision and learn from that so that when you come up there and they want to make a decision on you, to then say, okay, well, why did you make this decision on her? And then they can explain to me, well, this is the context, this is the law, this is the, the, uh, you know, the past cases, and this is why I'm making this decision. As opposed to 30 years worth of data that doesn't take any kind of policy changes or law changes into account, because where does that data come from? That data also is tainted with the decision that humans are making, right? If you think about the compass recidivism data, it is also tainted by the decisions that human beings are making. Because if I go to prison, then I'm not out, and you don't know what I could have done. Right? So what I'm trying to say is let's think about, and again, I'm not wedded to this particular task. I just want us to think more broadly about what data we do use and what the task definition is. Right? And this could be perhaps one thing. In fact, one of the aspects of it is that this is an extremely hard task. It is not one that you can write 100 papers right, in a span of five years. Because the question is, you and I can have the same argument diagram. Given a piece of text, I can extract argument diagrams from it. But you will have a different decision, and I will have a different decision. And so why is that? Right? So we're trying to understand why human beings make certain decisions, and then try to learn from those. Right? And it's not that I'm just learning, for example, from one judge, but a collection of judges and the, and the decisions that they're making. In a way, I'm trying to make a master judge, as in master algorithm, as in Pedro's book. Master race. No, that doesn't sound good at all. I'll stop there. An uber judge. Oh, no, that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> right. Hello, uh, my name is Amanda. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually working on the data science ethics course for the new applied master's degree here. That's a required course, so very much um, in line with your efforts. But one of the topics that we're um, going to be discussing in the class, and I would be curious how you're addressing it, is this um, there are well-documented issues with transparency, so improving literacy, improving notification. Um, you know, transparency doesn't necessarily make an actionable, and um, your discussion of, you know, we need to have societal conversations, and I, um, I hadn't heard about the FDA um, rule, so thank you for that. Um, but you, what is the role of government? I, I view these things as transnational issues, and so how you're thinking, again, one about transparency and 
where in society do you think that these conversations are best had? Yeah, so um, I think at all levels of society, you know, from uh, the... Whenever we can get it. <laughs> at all levels of society, you know, from like... In fact, I, I think that we should start... For example, this idea of algorithms that affect our lives should be taught in high schools, right? The same way with critical thinking and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so when, as soon as you start using these tools and, and, and approaches and, and apps that could affect your lives, you should know, okay, if I do this, what happens to me, right? Um, and so, uh, and I'm definitely on board in that this is, a, a, it's not just one nation, it's, it's across different nations. Um, the Europeans tend to be better than us so far on the regulations, right? Though people, um, there are certain people who are like, oh, GDPR hasn't done anything, right? If you go to Europe, you just say, okay, 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 to get around it, right? Um, and, uh, but this notion of, of uh, what, they are collecting from you and what service they are providing for you. So what Google collects on me and what kind of service does it provide to me and whether, it, you know, the, the risks and the benefits of it is very interesting. And just this notion of the risks and benefits of using machine learning for certain tasks is extremely in, in interesting and can generate discussion. A step in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah. Now it's on? Great. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned GDPR, and, and in that vein, thinking about how we regulate and write policies um, when, candidly, the tech is ahead of where our policies are. How do we think about making just policies in a world where the tech may already be beyond that? And then the counter of that is, how do we think about doing tech in a just way so that it can easily be regulated as just policies later on? Yeah, so I, um, I don't know how many of you know about Helen Nissenbaum. Uh, she's a philosopher, a professor at Cornell Tech now. Back in 1996, uh, she wrote an article with Friedman uh, on uh, biases in computer systems, right? And so she's very big on value and design. So from the very beginning, you need to think about, right, how am I going to treat my customers? What is important to me? Uh, a while back, there was this company in Dallas, I believe, I think it was like Java Mail or something like that, where the guy had promised, so he had this mail company, so a company that would do email, that was, had, had email servers and you could have an email account from him and so on and so forth. And he was like, and he had promised his customers that he would never, ever, ever give their data uh, to anybody, anybody, absolutely anybody. Then the U.S. government came calling. And, they, and he was like, you, and they were like, to him, you have to give the data to us. And he's like, no, I promised my customers that I'm not going to give out the data. He had to shut down his company. In the land of the free, he shut down the company that he worked on, that, that, that you know, blood, sweat, and tears, that was doing really, really well, because it was important to him in terms of the promise that he had made to his customers. And so as opposed to, like, giving the data out, he shut down the company which is actually, on the flip side, it's similar to what Cambridge Analytica has done, right? They shut down, <laughs> they're bankrupt, their servers are somewhere, you cannot get access to supposedly the 5,000 pieces of information that they had on every American voter, right? But in, in a way, it starts with individuals and then it bubbles up, I feel like, uh, and then the society perhaps will catch up. Maybe not, I mean, we're living in the world of capitalism, maybe like money is more important, but to this guy, I think he is, for example, an exemplar here, right? That it was more important to him to keep his promise to his people in terms of the value and design and whatever that he was providing um, than um, to keep his company going and break his promise to his customers. So. All right. So thanks again, Tina, for the thought-provoking talk. And Please go ahead if you want to clap. <laughs> uh, we'll move on now to the research presentations. Um, so I want to ask the first speaker to come over here while I'm setting up.
really appreciate it, your talk. Um, I was wondering, um, for the, the website, oh, no, I'm like, I'm hoping this is not all. So in this session, we have four research talks, and the first one is on quantitative assessment of people mobility and social behavior in public open spaces through deep learning. Sure. 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 All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin with just a little bit of motivation to frame the work that I'll be presenting. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm presenting is looking at the behavior of patrons within public spaces, and it's really grounded in how we use our cities and the public spaces that our cities present. And why this is critically important is because cities are the economic engine for much of our society. For example, over 85% of our national GDP is attributed in the United States to only 259 of the largest cities. And here in the state of Michigan, that would constitute the metropolitan area of Detroit, as well as Grand Rapids area. Now, cities are going through a dramatic transformation. Part of it is driven by technology, but part of it is driven by other factors. For example, we're seeing dramatic changes in populations and where people live. For example, in 2010, we saw for the first time cities tipping the scales with respect to the majority of our world's population living in cities. And that trend is likely to continue into this 21st century. And there's many different narratives that are associated with different cities, ranging from Detroit, which has a narrative over the past 60 years of being a shrinking city with dramatic population decline, versus cities like New York City and Shenzhen in China, which are seeing explosive growth patterns of people coming into these cities, rapid urbanization. We're also seeing new stressors imposing themselves on our habitat, ranging from natural hazards all the way to aging infrastructure that poses challenges and risks for our society. But we're also seeing the emergence of smart city technologies, which give unprecedented opportunities for citizens to engage with cities, engage with other citizens, as well as city services. And other examples are shown here, ranging from autonomy of infrastructure services all the way to technologies that facilitate citizen engagement with elected leaders. Now, I'm leading an effort associated with the Urban Collaboratory here at the University of Michigan, looking at essentially the intersection of those three trends, merging stressors with dramatic changes in our cities, all the way to the opportunity of smart city technologies. Now, the ultimate encapsulation of a smart city technology is best stipulated by this diagram from Sidewalk Labs that really talks about smart cities beginning with the physical infrastructure, which ranges from infrastructure systems to buildings, to the inclusion of sensing and data, giving us the ability to have insight and observe processes in cities that we never could observe before. But smart cities also constitute the resource flows that are moving through our cities, whether we're talking about mobility or energy networks. But the last domain or the last layer that's shown here is the social dimension. And this is one of the hardest dimension for us to observe from a smart city perspective. While we can see some social choice in many of the resource flows that are essentially moving through our society, it's more difficult to characterize how individuals and citizens within our communities are essentially interacting with their infrastructure and with themselves. So I'd like to highlight this particular facet of our work. One of the most active places where we see social engagement is in city parks. City parks are actually designed to essentially drive social interaction within our communities. For example, uh, Central Park, uh, which was designed in the late 1800s and put into place uh, in the early 1900s, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, basically was one of the first parks in the United States that looked to break down essential social barriers. Prior to Central Parks, parks were largely reserved for the aristocratic elements of society, whereas this park was designed from the ground up to drive more of a democratization of public space. It's also important to note that parks are a real driver for prosperity within our cities and our communities, looking at opportunities for economic growth, such as property valuations, as well as uh, 
uh, businesses that are associated with parks, all the way to the social dynamics that parks drive. Now, that introduces a challenge. How do we best understand how citizens use these type of public spaces such as city parks? And there are a number of different methods that are available for us to observe how our citizens essentially use public space. One is to do it the traditional way, which is to do visual counting, send out observers that can essentially look at how people use their spaces and essentially quantitatively count that or qualitatively uh, log that. The alternative is embedding sensing, putting sensors directly within our public spaces that are looking at counting how many patrons are in those spaces. Examples there include laser type sensors as well as passive IR sensors. Another are vision-based methods, a device-free approach, very scalable approach to observing how the public uses its spaces, all the way to wearable sensors, uh, such as technologies like Apple iWatch, what have you. In today's talk, I'll largely focus on the vision-based methods and our applications of essentially deep learning to vision-based uh, data sources. Now, the work that I'll be presenting today is largely based on an engagement that we have in downtown Detroit with the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy which in 2003 was established to essentially transform the historic uh, riverfront of Detroit, shown here on this map, uh, into a more hospitable public space, bringing essentially residents to the waterfront. One of its best assets in the city is this waterfront. So a picture shown here is a range of different uh, parts of that riverfront prior to the establishment of the Riverfront Conservancy. So you'll see, for example, Wren Center shown here, and the use of this uh, very precious property for parking lots, for example. Now, since the formation of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, they've really transformed this public space with essentially a very well-curated public space that essentially provides a very welcoming spot for the citizens of Detroit, as well as visitors of Detroit, to essentially enjoy the waterfront. One of the challenges, though, for the Riverfront Conservancy as it curates this space and manages the space is how to get more community engagement, how to get people into that waterfront. For example, there's a number of different neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to the perimeter of that uh, park space, including southwest Detroit and the east side. So one strategy there that the parks have used is essentially to develop cuts, such as the Deskinder Cut, which is a two-mile cut that tries to bring residents on the east side down to the waterfront. It's a very progressive public space that has many different design innovations associated with it, all designed to bring people to the waterfront. Now, one of the challenges is how do people utilize this space, and how does the park owner make crush, uh, precious decisions about the use of very scarce resources to curate that space, how best to do that, how to optimize that. One of the benefits with this space is that it has an extensive camera network that's largely used for security purposes. So it has over 100 security cameras, cameras located throughout the space. So there's cameras all along the three-mile waterfront, as well as along the two-mile Deskinder cut that cuts into the east side of Detroit. And you can see here some examples of the type of images that we can collect with these particular cameras. These cameras have historically been used for security purposes, but we've been working with the Riverfront Conservancy for the past two years to use them to essentially learn and characterize how patrons in the Detroit Riverfront are using these public spaces. We're using essentially uh, deep learning to perform that, and more specifically, we'll be looking at using mask RCNN uh, type uh, learning structures to essentially train detectors that can detect patrons and their activities. So we're using mask RCNN to essentially feed our imagery to perform classification of the different uh, patrons that we see and the type of public space use uh, that they're uh, using. And the output of these mass RCNN uh, networks are essentially classification of the patrons and their activities, as well as segmentation through bounding box and uh, body segmentation or instance segmentation of themselves. Uh, essentially, we're detecting uh, individuals in real time based on feeds of the imagery, so we're not logging that particular imagery once we've established an extensive library that we train our classifiers with. Uh, but it allows us to detect with very high accuracy and precision patrons and their uses of that public space. Part of our effort was the establishment of an extensive data set that we call OPUS, or Objects for Public Open Spaces. And you'll see here the 15 class categories that are associated with definition of patrons and what they're using the space for, whether they're pedestrians or scooters, sitters sitting on park benches or just dog walkers. 
We're also uh, curating a data set that essentially has exposure to all different weather and lighting conditions associated with the different seasons, different times of day within that space. And you'll see the number of objects that are associated with our Opus library that we then use to essentially train our mask RCNN uh, detectors. Shown here is just a comparison of Opus compared to other open data sets or libraries that are associated with the public domain and characterization of uh, patrons and behavior in that domain. And you'll see comparatively that we have a large number of classifications as well as a large number of instances associated with those particular uh, classifications. Uh, so in our training stage, uh, much of the mass RCNN is already pre-trained uh, using ImageNet and COCO. And then we do end-to-end -end training with Opus uh, for the full segmentation and classification stage associated with our mask RCNN. Shown here is just some performance features of what uh, essentially the detector is outputting, as well as the uh, average precision for the different intersections over union uh, thresholds uh, associated with the segmented uh, detection of patrons within that public space. But you'll see very high detection for most of the pedestrian-based uh, categories, which is one of the primary objects that the park owner is trying to understand, particularly on the Duskinder cut, as essentially the park owner is trying to get more pedestrians into that cut to come down to the riverfront. Shown here are just some of the uh, detected objects in their segmented uh, images associated. This is actually an image from the Deskinder cut where we're essentially detecting cyclists, uh, sitters, as well as pedestrians. Uh, here's more instances of it in different parts of that Deskinder cut. One of the things we're also doing is, is that we use this very standard pinhole camera model to begin to spatially realize once we have a detected object, where are they in space? And that's an important step toward developing both spatial and temporal models of the trajectory of patrons throughout this particular space. We also have a second stage associated with the detection that's a re-identification of those patrons as they're moving from field of view from the different uh, cameras. So the uh, spatial uh, detection of where those particular patrons are relative uh, to their environment is based on calibration and scene understanding. And once we have that, we have the ability to spatially map where those individuals are down onto graphical information system layers or GIS uh, layers, which is a primary visualization tool for the park owner. Uh, shown here is actually some of the things that we're actually mapping down to provide value uh, to the park owner, including uh, essentially heat maps associated with where patrons are and what are their uses of some of the uh, physical infrastructure associated with that particular uh, park space. So just a few words of conclusion. Uh, smart cities are rapidly a version. Uh, they do have the potential to transform cities, but an important part of smart cities going forward is better understanding how patrons within these cities are essentially using city services and infrastructure. Uh, also, deep understanding of the social dynamics associated with essentially citizens within our cities also requires inputs such as data and information that we're collecting in this study. Our vision-based assessment of public open spaces, uh, we were looking at essentially using computer vision as a very scalable approach to use a readily available data set, in this case security cameras in an existing park, to essentially classify patrons and their behavior within those public spaces. Some of our future work is improving the mass RCNN detection framework as a detector, uh, essentially using Bayesian inference between sequential detection and different frames of uh, particular imagery that we're collecting. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to those that have funded the work, including MIDAS as part of uh, their funding, uh, but also the National Science Foundation, the Knights Foundation, Urban Collaboratory, and we'd like to especially acknowledge the support and the guidance provided by the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Thank you. We have some time for a couple of questions while the next speaker is setting up down here. I guess I have a short question. Uh, have you looked into mining the different um, activities that you're classifying uh, to have a better understanding of activities that citizens are doing there? Yeah, so that's uh, some of the object classes that are there in Opus are very specific to try and understand what people are doing, uh, particularly utilization of some of the uh, things, uh, some of the furniture in the space, such as benches. Okay. Uh, we're trying to expand on that to better understand what people are doing in that space so that that park owner can invest strategically in improvements in that space. Uh, we also have a 
we're also beginning a collaboration of colleagues in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning looking at intervention strategies in that space using this kind of data to inform how we may uh, intervene from a design perspective to make the space more hospitable or to drive more social interaction in the space. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next talk is on pack reinforcement learning without real world feedback by Yuren Zhang. Thank you. Um, so, this work is a theoretical study of a setting in reinforcement learning uh, where we basically use simulators to train a good policy for a real world environment. And this is a joint work with Annika Dashmark and Clayton Scott. In reinforcement learning, what we mainly study is a sequential decision-making tasks in which an agent takes and uh, interacts with the environment. At every time step, the agent will visit a state and then take an action. The environment will generate a reward and in the next, uh, next uh, sta uh, state stochastically. And the mathematical model for the sequential decision-making task is usually the MDP, Markov Decision Process. Basically, in this mathematical model, it assumes that the reward and the next states generated by the environment only depends on the current state and the current action the agent chooses. It means that the agent does not need to maintain a history, the entire history of, of previous actions, states, and rewards. It can only decide which action is the best based on the current state. Therefore, we can define a policy as a function that maps the current state to the action. Meaning, uh, if an if a action, uh, sorry, if an agent is following an action, uh, following a policy, then it will take the action returned by the policy given the input equals to the current state. And because of the randomness in the MDP, any algorithm cannot guarantee to output an optimal policy or a good policy. Therefore, our goal is usually uh, framed by something called pack learning. Basically, it means that we want our algorithm to output a good policy with high probability, aiming to maximize the cumulative rewards, which is like in a episodic task, uh, the agent will terminate after a given number of steps, and the cumulative reward would be the summation of all the rewards at, at every step. And reinforced learning has achieved a lot of great, great success in many applications, like in computer games, in chess, in robotic controls, etc. However, there is always a problem uh, in reinforcement learning approaches. Most approaches require a huge number of samples to learn a good policy. However, and this is sometimes infeasible in real world tasks because in some real world tasks, collecting samples from the real world may be very expensive and time consuming, which makes it hard for the reinforcement learning methods. Therefore, people use an alternative, which is called seem to real. Basically, people build a bunch of simulators, which are similar or re related to the real-world environment. And then they train their agent first on those simulators before they deploy their agent into the real world. And they hope that uh, the simulators can help them to reduce the numbers required from the real world. For example, this is a self-controlled drone. Uh, in this example, the drone is first trained in a bunch of simulators uh, to learn how to avoid collision. And then the researchers just uh, test their, the policy learned from those simulators in the, re in the real-world environment without any further training. And our work here is to provide a formal formulation of the sim to real method, and also we proved a theoretical guarantee for this method. Uh, our formulation is based on a model called ROMDP, Rich Observation Markov Decision Process. In classic MDPs, this agent can actually see the state. However, in ROMDP, the agent cannot see the state. Instead, the agent will observe a feature vector which is associated with the state. And we usually call the feature vector an observation. Uh, more formally, a ROMDP can be fully characterized by a tuple of variables a finite state space, a finite, finite action space, and an observation space, which may be uncountable, and a horizon H, meaning that the agent will terminate 
uh, after taking exactly h steps. And there is a transition function t, which maps the current state and the current action the agent chooses to the next state. And there is a distribution of observation given the current state and a, and a distribution of the reward given the current state, observation, and action. And furthermore, we will assume that a ROM DP is parameterized by an unobservable environment parameter theta via parameterizing the reward distribution and the observation distribution. And we will still use the example of the self-control drone. In this example, uh, suppose we, the drone has only one sensor, which is a camera, and we want the drone to take good pictures using that camera automatically. So in this example, the state and the action and the transition functions can describe, uh, can be used to describe the underlying physics. For example, the state can encode information like the position of the objects, the position of the drone, the angle of the camera, etc. And the action would be whether the drone should take a picture right now, or it should fly to a different place, or it just should stay in the same place, something like that. And the environment parameter theta will encode other factors, like uh, the co uh, like the, the lighting conditions, like the color of the objects. Those factors do not influence the physics, but they will influence the observation of the the observation the drone collects from uh, via its camera and the quality of the picture. And in this case, the quality of the picture would be our reward. Uh, so with different environment environment parameter theta, we can have different environments as shown in this picture. And with the ROMDP in mind, we can further introduce our formulation. Uh, we suppose that we have B simulators and we have a real world. And the simulators and the real world are all associated with the environment parameter theta. And we assume all those theta are collected, uh, are sampled IID from some unknown distribution mu. And we define something called meta policy. It's uh, actually a function that maps a tuple of an environment parameter, a state, and an observation to an action. This means that if an action is follow, if, if an agent is follow a meta policy, it will choose the action based on the current environment and the current state and the current observation. If the parameter is, if the environment parameter theta is fixed, then the ROM DP is fixed. Then we can have some. Then we can define the cumulative reward uh, in a standard way, as in any classic ROM DP, uh, any classic MDP. We use v pi theta to denote the expected cumulative reward when the agent follows the meta policy pi in an environment with parameter theta, and we use v pi to denote the expectation of the v pi theta over the the unknown distribution mu and we use v star to denote the maximal value of v pi. And we say that a meta policy pi is epsilon optimal if v pi is larger than v star minus epsilon. I think there is something wrong with the notation, sorry about that. Uh, so this means that in, the, in, in terms of the expectation, the, when we follow a meta, uh, epsilon optimal meta policy pi, our cumulative rewards can only be at most epsilon, epsilon smaller than the optimum. And we use the learning scenario as seen in the drone example. The agent will be trained only on the simulators, and then it will be deployed into the real world without any feedback, meaning that the agent cannot observe any rewards in the real world. So if the agent cannot, cannot, observe, any, uh, cannot observe the rewards, the agent cannot modifies its meta policy. So the meta policy is fixed after the training phase on the simulators. Uh, so our goal is also framed in the pack learning style, which means that we want to find an algorithm such that the algorithm can return an epsilon optimal meta policy with high probability. And meanwhile, we want to reduce the sample complexity from the real world, which is our initial motivation of the system to real. And uh, our main contribution in our paper is we uh, provide an algorithm such that under certain assumptions, we showed that the algorithm can learn an epsilon optimal meta policy pi with probability at, at least one minus delta. And we also upper bounded the sample complexity from the real world where there are no feedback. 
uh, in this expression, H is the horizon, A is the cardinality of the action space, S is the cardinality of the state space. Epsilon and delta is shown uh, in this theorem also. And we want to compare, so for the sim real, uh, for, for the sim to real methods make sense, we want the sample com complexity to be smaller than learning directly in the real world. So a natural comparison is to compare existing algorithms that learn, a good, um, that learn an absolute optimal policy from the real world directly. And this is the, what we found. And sorry about the notation again. I don't know why is that. So um, it's, well, we can see that our sample complexity is much smaller than theirs. And more importantly, we moved the, uh, the cardinality of state space from the polynomial term to the log term using the simulators. Uh, however, we also want to point out that the, the comparison is not perfectly fair for two reasons. The first reason is that because they train their agent in the real world directly, so they need feedbacks from the real world because they, they need to know the reward to, uh, to find out a good policy. But, our, but our, in our setting, we do not assume that we have feedback from the real world. And the second thing is that the definition of the epsilon, po epsilon optimal policy is slightly different. Uh, in their setting, they assume that the ROM DP is fixed. There's a single fixed ROM DP, and they want to find a good policy for that specific ROM DP. So, it's so the, uh, the policy is guaranteed to act good in uh, in, in their setting with that, uh, in that specific ROM DP. However, in our setting, we assume that the real world can be changing because, of, because all those factors, like the lightning condition, like the weather, et cetera, can be changing. So we take the expectation of the cumulative reward over the, over the parameter, uh, sorry, over the on observation mu. So, so therefore, our policy is not guaranteed to act good in some small probability uh, environments. So because we take the expectation. So this is like a second difference between our setting and their setting. So this is not a fair comparison, but this is the best match we can find. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you. We have time for questions. Sorry, should we continue? In this case, let's continue with the next talk. Um, irreproducibility in large-scale drug sensitivity data. Thank you, and thanks to all of you guys for sticking with us so late in the day. Um, I'm going to be talking about work that I've been doing with my PhD advisor, Johan Gagnon Bartsch. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of drug sensitivity data and the two databases that we've been working with, then talk some about the measurement error that we found in this data um, and the new normalization method that we've developed to try to address that. So we've been working with data from large pharmacogenomic studies, and these are studies that are trying to better understand how the molecular and genetic features of cancer cells relate to the efficacy of anti-cancer drugs. Um, and they do this by screening um, large numbers of potential anti-cancer compounds against many very well understood cancer cell lines. And the ultimate goal of work like this is to better, um, to improve personalized cancer treatments. So we've been working specifically with data from two of these large pharmacogenomic studies. The first is the Genomics of Drug Sensitivity in Cancer Project, or GDSC, and the second is the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, or CCLE. Both of these studies have a really wide range of data in them, and we're going to be focusing um, specifically on the drug screening data from these two studies. So in drug screening experiments, each microplate is plated with a single cancer cell line, and several um, potential anti-cancer compounds. And those compounds are applied over a range of concentrations. Um, sorry. Um, okay, so um, 
Each plate is um, scanned during these experiments, um, and that scanning results in a single intensity measurement for each well on the plate. And that intensity measurement um, tells us, gives us information about how many cells are alive, which relates to drug efficacy. So for example, if um, a well has a very high intensity, that means there are lots of cells alive in that well, which indicates that the drug isn't working very well. Um, and so here's an example of a heat map from the um, GDSC study. This represents a single, a single one of these um, microplates. GDSC uses 384 well microplates um, and applied their drugs over a range of nine concentrations. Um, and each drug is applied over a set of nine wells horizontally on these plates. The gray wells indicate missing values, um, and every single plate in both GDSC and CCLE have missing values. So that's something we had to account for um, in our analysis. In addition to these drugged wells, each plate also contains control wells. Most importantly, untreated control wells. These are wells that contain cells but no drug, and they represent um, what a cell would look, or sorry, what a well would look like if the drug was completely ineffective. And this will be useful um, later on when I talk about the normalization process. Um, so both GDSC and CCLE were released in the early 2010s, and since their publication, there's been widespread discussion about the lack of consistency in drug sensitivity measures between these two studies. So there's been um, a lot of analysis done, and in general, um, researchers have found only moderate agreement at best between drug sensitivity measures in GDSC and CCLE. And it's been suggested that um, things like differences in experimental procedures and analytical decisions is contributing to this lack of consistency. And we wanted to continue along with this investigation of the, incons of the inconsistencies, and we decided to look at the raw data in GDSC and CCLE, and we're the first people who've done this. Um, so when we looked at this raw data, we found four different types of measurement error that we think are also contributing to the lack of consistency in drug sensitivity measures. And I'll talk about each of those over the next few slides. Um, so first we found widespread spatial effects um, on many of these plates. The first heat map um, on the left is a high quality plate. It actually doesn't have any apparent spatial effects in it, but I wanted to include it so you could see what effective drugs look like. So those small gradients across sets of nine wells horizontally is an effective drug. So that's actually the biology that we're interested in and isn't a problem. Um, the middle heat map though does show a spatial effect. This is what we're calling a checkerboard pattern. We have these alternating wells of high and low intensity um, across the entire plate. We don't know what is causing it, but it's fairly common in both GDSC and CCLE and um, is a spatial effect in this data. Um, in the last heat map, we see a gradient across the plate. We have higher intensities at the top, fading to lower intensities at the bottom of the plate, and that's unrelated to the biology, to the drugs applied to the cells. We can often see these plate-wide gradients very um, clearly in the untreated control wells. So the only wells that are plotted on this slide are untreated controls. Um, for two different plate formats within GDSC. The left-hand column shows a single plate from each of these plate formats, and the right-hand column shows the median across all plates of those formats. And so not only are these spatial effects fairly strong on individual plates, they're also consistent across hundreds of plates in these databases. Uh, we can also take this moment to look at the location of the control wells on these plates. Um, and see that it's not adequate to um, fully capture the non-biological variation across the entire plate. Um, and so that's um, a drawback to this experimental design. Um, we also found um, many replicated drug cell line combinations where the dose response observations for two replicates had very similar shapes, but one appears to be a vertical shift of the other. Um, and we hypothesize that this is related to the spatial effects that I just showed you. So if there are spatial effects on a plate, um, then using the untreated controls to represent 100% viability won't work for every single well on the rest of a plate. We'll have a mismatch between those untreated controls and the drug wells that we want to compare them to. And so that will lead to um, a shifting phenomenon that we see here. Um, so this is one drug cell line combination that was tested twice. And we can see a very similar shape between the red and the black replicate. We just have a small vertical shift um, for the red replicate. Um, and this behavior is what our new normalization method is going to try to address. Um, additionally, we found um, groups of plates in GDSC that all had the same very large 
um, technical errors. So had um, very large, uh, very high intensity wells or very low intensity wells in the same plate, place across all plates in this group. So for example, um, every plate scanned on November 9th, 2011 of this format in GDSC have the same two very low intensity wells. So I've picked out just three plates to show you here. There's a lot of them that look like this. But we can clearly see those um, same two low intensity wells, um, it, both in the heat maps and again in the dose response plots at the bottom. And as you might imagine, having those two, out, those two outliers will very much affect fitting dose response curves and determining drug efficacy. Um, and finally, we just have plates that are really noisy and noisy to the extent that it obscures the biology that we're actually interested in. So all of the example plates that I showed you were from GDSC, but the exact same types of measurement error are also present in CCLE, a study that was done completely separately. So for example, in that top heat map on the right, that's the same checkerboard pattern that we saw in GDSC. It's prevalent in CCLE as well. We see the same shift pattern, we see noise, and we even have the same type of batch technical errors. Um, so this goes to show how widespread these measurement error problems are, the present in both of these studies that were um, conducted by completely different labs. So now that we've noticed this type of measurement error, we want to do something about it. And so we decided to tackle that through relative viability normalization. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the result of these drug screening experiments is a single intensity measurement for each well on the plate. But to be able to do any sort of analysis with this data, we need to turn those raw intensities into relative viabilities. And we want to develop a method to do this that is better able to handle some of the measurement error that I just pointed out, and specifically those spatial effects. Um, so this is a common approach that's taken, to, that's taken for, um, for relative viability normalization. This is actually what's done in CCLE. They take the, in the intensity of each drugged well on the plate and divide by the median intensity of the untreated control wells for that plate. This is intuitive. Um, they use the assumption that the untreated controls represent 100% viability, and it makes sense to normalize our um, drugged intensities by 100% viability. GDSC does something similar um, with a few slight modifications, but we're going to focus on comparing to CCLE. So what we want to do with our normalization is compare the intensities of each drugged well to the intensities we would have seen if no drug had been applied. Um, we can call this a counterfactual, and we're going to say that the counterfactual for well, I, for well IJ on plate K is mu IJK. And if um, well IJ is a drug well, then the counterfactual is unobserved and we need to estimate it. And so we want to estimate it using a combination of information from the drug wells and from the untreated control wells. So first, if we think about estimating um, mu IJK, we can think about using the untreated controls. Um, these untreated control wells never had any drug applied, that, applied to them in the first place, so it makes sense to use them to estimate this counterfactual. But I just spent a long time talking about all of those types of measurement error and particularly the spatial effects that's present on these plates. And so um, the untreated controls aren't necessarily going to do a good job of estimating this counterfactual for every single well across the plate. So alternatively, we can think about using the intensities from the wells that were treated with the lowest drug concentration to estimate this counterfactual. So in these studies, many drugs, and maybe even most drugs, are not effective, and they're particularly not effective at low concentrations. So if a drug isn't effective at low concentrations, then the intensities in those lowest concentration drug wells will be similar to if no drug had been applied at all. And so we can use that as our estimate from UIJK. Our concern, of course, is if the drug actually is effective, then we really don't want to be using those intensities to do our normalization. So we can take these two ideas and combine them together to get intuition for our normalization method. So if the drug is ineffective at low concentrations, it's going to be better to use the intensities from the lowest concentration drug wells to estimate mu IJK. But if the drug is effective at low concentrations, it's going to be better to use the untreated control wells. We can make this a little bit more formal, and we're going to summarize um, the untreated control wells as CK and model CK as the counterfactual plus some error. Um, we can let LIJK be um, the intensities from those lowest concentration drug wells, and we're going to model LIJK as the counterfactual plus some different error term. Now, I'm not going to get into the details about this at all, but just say that we can estimate our two error distributions, F of epsilon and G of delta. And we estimate those from the data. 
Once we've estimated those distributions, we can assume that L and C are independent, and we can write down our likelihood function here. And our likelihood depends only on L and C, um, which are um, two pieces of information that are known for every drug cell line pair in these studies, and so therefore it's easy to maximize this likelihood. And we can get an MLE for this counterfactual, which is mu hat, and we'll normalize our relative viabilities just by dividing our intensities by this MLE. So we applied the MLE normalization as well as the CCLE normalization that I showed you earlier to all of the replicated drug cell line pairs in GDSC and CCLE, and we calculated the AUC for each of them. And we found that the median absolute difference in AUC is smaller when using the MLE normalization for all four of the replicated GDSC drugs and for 26 of the 27 replicated CCLE drugs. Um, we also found that the spread in these um, AUC absolute differences is smaller with our MLE normalization, which is what we were hoping for. Um, so I'm going to show you just this one example for the sake of time. So this is a single drug that we took from CCLE. And the scatter plots on the left um, show the replicated AUC values when using each of the two normalizations. Um, so on top is CCLE, on the bottom is MLE, and we can see that we have a tighter distribution there um, with our MLE normalization. I also picked out two points that I've highlighted in these scatter plots to show you some of the behavior of these two normalizations. So first you can look at the green plus, that's an outlier with the CCLE normalization, but is not for the MLE normalization. Um, and that cell line is displayed in those, that middle column, that first set of dose-response observations, where you can see that with this, this um, drug cell line combination, we get really poor agreement between the replicates with CCLE, but our MLE normalization is doing a really good job. And that's tackling that shift kind of phenomenon that we wanted to. Um, and we can also look at the orange X that remains an outlier with both of these um, normalization methods, and that corresponds to the cell line we see in the third column here where we have replicates whose dose response um, behavior is just completely different across those two replicates, and we wouldn't expect our normalization or want our normalization to try to force those replicates to look like each other because the behavior is just completely different. And so that actually leads me nicely into this um, one statement about biological differences. We actually found um, quite a large number of um, these drug cell line combinations where the replicated dose response relationships looked completely different. Um, and it seems like it must be related to the biological response of the cells to the drug, um, and maybe differences in something like cell seeding, uh, cell growth, culture media, something of that nature. But these are situations where no normalization um, and really no analysis method is going to give you good agreement between these replicates. So we would still expect to see outliers even with our normalization method. Um, so really just to wrap up, um, we found the same types of widespread measurement error in two of these very large pharmacogenomics, GDSC and CCLE. We developed a new normalization method that was aimed to better handle some of these types of measurement error, particularly spatial bias, but we still found that there were a number of drug cell line combinations um, where we couldn't reasonably expect any normalization method to improve agreement. Going forward, we want to advocate for some steps that can be taken um, to improve the quality of data coming out of some of these drug screening studies. So doing things like randomizing plate designs, building replication into the experimental procedure, and really publishing all the details about the experimental procedure with the final data would be really helpful for the analysis process of drug screening data going forward. Thank you. No. Okay. Um, I wonder, did you then look at um, or consider, I guess, recalculating the correlations between the two? I mean, to what extent do the, the drug results replicate between the two sets? Between GDSC and CCLE. Yes, yeah, once you have your method applied. That's the next step. Oh, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, we, we're working on this right now. Yeah, oh, so we haven't. Okay. I don't have those results to show. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Let's Thanks. thank the speaker again.
Get ready for some music. The last talk is on cadence and formal function in Mozart's music. Thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Yep, yeah, good. I will start this so I can tell how much time I've spoken for. I'm, I'm just dying to ask. Um, by a show of hands, has anyone been to a music theory talk before? Okay, well, oh, okay, good. Um, I was expecting less. Um, this is also a somewhat no, uh, novel forum for me. Like a lot of academics, music theorists, I think mostly, when we're not talking to reluctant sophomores, uh, are, mostly, are mostly talking to other music theorists. So I'm extremely curious to, to see what you make of all of this. And I will try to do this fairly efficiently to leave time for questions. I, I always say I'm looking forward to your questions and comments, but at this time it's actually true. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to try and uh, sketch out for you, somewhat informally and fairly, fairly briefly, some work I've been doing together with colleagues and students over the last few years about, about Mozart's music. Um, and I'll try also to, to sort of indicate uh, why music theorists might care about some of the things that were, the, some of the questions I'm, I'm asking on, on the way. Um, so this starts with a, an article that my colleague Judy Pedneau and I published back in 2015. Uh, both of us work on questions of musical form and, and are, are interested in, in Mozart. Um, we were both students of, of a theorist named William Kaplan who wrote a big book on, classical, on how to analyze classical form. And it turns out that one of the things you want to know um, if uh, you're trying to figure out what the parts of a piece by Mozart are is where the cadences are. Um, for those of you for whom that's, the word cadence is just kind of noise coming out of my mouth, um, you could think of this up to a kind of first approximation as it's a bit like scanning through a text and figuring out where the periods and the semicolons are. This is kind of musical punctuation. It tells us what the units are. Um, there are various kinds of cadences. A half cadence, the one that this is about, is kind of like a semicolon. Um, William Kaplan, for those of you who are following this stuff, uh, published uh, about a, you know, 20 years ago about a 50-page article on authentic cadences. Those are like the periods. Um, and then when he comes to half cadence, he just says, well, it's kind of like authentic cadences. So we felt there was more to say. What we did is we simply went by hand through, we picked a corpus, we, uh, the Mozart um, piano sonatas were to hand, so we had a convenience sample that we went through. Um, and we simply circled anything that we thought might be a half cadence. And then we did a kind of, I guess you could think of this as a sort of informal clustering and kind of hand done clustering problem. We just started putting them in, into groups that seemed similar to us according to fairly intuitive criteria. And what we ended up with was a, a, a list that I'll show you in just a moment um, uh, of four basic types. Uh, but the nice thing about music theory talks is no matter how bad the talk is, you at least get to hear some nice music. So let me hope the audio will work and play you. One example of a half cadence. Oops. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna, let's try this again. That's the cadence. Okay. So we're looking about things that, are, that sound like that. And um, if you'd spent a lot of time as a music theorist, you would have been able to hear that's a half cadence. Uh, if you'd spent some time, if you were a musically trained listener who'd spent some time studying our examples, you would have heard, heard that's what we call a converging half cadence. So it doesn't really matter too much what these are, although I'm happy to tell you in the, the question period if you're curious. We came up with four uh, types that we gave sort of arbitrary names, sometimes borrowing from the literature and just sort of making, sometimes just making up names for ourselves. Those were our, our four categories, and that's basically the result of the, the 2015 paper. We noticed, however, as we were going through and doing this, that some of our types seem to happen in some places in, in forms and not others. And so the question we then asked is, well, um, are, there, are there actually correlations between the, the half cadence type and where it happens in a, in a piece? Um, I happen to be married to a, a clinical epidemiologist, and we were out walking, and, and, and she sort of said at one point, well, you know that's, a, you know that's a, a testable hypothesis, right? And so I replied as, with what every good humanist would say to that, what's a testable hypothesis? <laughs> so the question we were asking basically is, is, do these have associations? If you heard something like this, and you knew a fair bit of the style, could you beat chance on guessing where it is in the piece? That was the case. So 
we um, did a little sort of back of the envelope power calculation to figure out how many pieces we had probably had to look at to get uh, enough uh, uh, cadences to be powered to detect the things we were interested in. That last one, by the way, was an example of a dopia cadence. Those are very, from the pilot data we had, we knew those were very, very rare. So the dopia cadences were the problem. That's why we had to look at 180 pieces by Mozart. That's about a third of what Mozart wrote. Um, we assembled a big team of human graders whose job was to do what we'd done uh, with the sonatas on a, on a uh, much larger scale. So we'd troll through these pieces, circle things they thought were half cadences, say what kind of half cadence they thought it was, and, where, and note where it happened in the form. And so what we got, you know, what we bought for that grant money was an enormous Excel spreadsheet that looked something like this. I've given you a few sample entries. Uh, there's just a, a unique identifier I can tell you how that works. That's just to keep track of where it is so I can go find it later. Um, which, what kind of cadence it is. P PAC in my world means perfect authentic cadence. Um, half cadence is HC. Uh, if it's a half cadence, what, sub, what subtype it was, some other information, where it happened, and, and a few other things. We've got this big mess of, 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 uh, of, of specimens of half cadences. Here are what the, I'm not sure you can read that. Here are the distributions. So the, our converging type was by far the most, uh, the most common. Uh, then the simple type is, is expanding and very few dopia cadences. Um, we sort of collapsed down the question of where does this happen? We figured we could get at that by just asking, does this happen at the end of some major formal unit or does it happen in the middle of something else and there's some bigger cadence coming at the end? Um, and so that's what the two bars are showing you. And just sort of looking at it, the converging cadences look like, well, maybe they're a little more likely to happen in the middle of something. The expanding ones really seem to happen at the ends of big things. The simple ones, maybe it's the other way. The dopia ones seem to only happen at the ends and so on. There's the, the same information in, in the form of a table. Uh, so the predicting variable on the right, the categorical variable is just our cadence type. And intra means it's in the middle of something. Inter means it's at the end of some major formal unit. And so we performed Fisher's exact test, and that made us really, that nice little p-value made us really happy. Uh, and that suggested that there's something going on, perhaps. Um, so I should say a little more formally what we, what we thought was, we were going to find. Um, we expected that our, our expanding in dopia types would happen in, um, at section boundaries. We expected that the simple types would happen within sections. And we thought that the, the last one, the converging, wouldn't, wouldn't buy us either way. That was the prediction we'd made. And so here's the subgroup analysis, and basically it all worked. Um, so this made us all very happy. Before we get too excited, I should be a little more honest about some of the problems underlying and what this data looks like. Um, we were originally going to have a training set for lots of reasons, complicated reasons I could tell you about in the, the, um, uh, the Q&A. That, that had to go a little by the wayside. We would have basically would have spent our whole budget on the training set. Um, so we've got problems, we've got a little, some real worries about iterator reliabilities. I, at the moment, don't have a way of calculating those from what I've got uh, because, we were, because uh, we've got a fairly incomplete work through this. The original idea was to have two independent graders go over everything. In the end, so far, I've been able, been able to hire one grader for each, for each part. We have, to figure, we have to figure out how to fix that. Uh, also, to be, continue, continue being honest, um, for the moment, I've left out, I've simply omitted those cases where the graders couldn't decide. Um, so I'll have to go back over and do some of those. And there, there are also some, some real ambiguity. There may be some real ambiguities where, where there, it simply will be very difficult to decide in a, difficult, in a, in a complicated case if it belongs under, under one of these categories at all. Nonetheless, I think it's, it's kind of an interesting, I hope it's an interesting result. It's interesting to music theorists who happen to care about, about cadences and form. Um, so the few, lots of few, uh, future work to do in, in cleaning up uh, some of the data we've got. Um, and then something I'll mention that I'm actually quite excited about. Um, our co my colleagues Marcus Neuwert and uh, Christoph Finkelzeep, Finkenzeep sorry, in Lausanne have started to get pretty good at finding certain kinds of contrapuntal patterns in corpora, large corpora of symbolic data. The Neue Mozart aus um, is starting to gradually release its XML files, so we will start to have, have things we can work on. When we started doing this, nobody knew how to find, how to find the patterns, that, how to search for the patterns that we were interested in, and nobody had XML files of, 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 uh, that, they, that they were willing to give us of this. Um, so going forward, we've got an interesting project in collaboration with Marcus trying to see whether we can find this. And of course, having spent all this time and energy, we've got, ni we've got nice ground truth. Uh, I'll say two very brief things. So here's just a couple of ver very brief slides about Marcus and uh, Christoph's algorithm. Um, 
So they're interested in finding patterns like this. Uh, so these are somewhat different from our, they're different kinds of patterns than our half cadence patterns, but they're not, they're not different in kind. They're, different, or they're not conceptually different, they just happen to be different uh, arrangements of notes in different verticalities. And they've got a, a, a fancy way of, of solving this uh, particular problem. I will be more than happy to, I, I can't explain every detail of this, this slide, but I will be more than happy to talk about what some of the problems are and why, why uh, we don't have good search, search algorithms for finding the kinds of patterns that music theorists are interested in, in if that's something you want to take up in the Q&A. And for now, I will simply say thank you. Thank you for your talk, very interesting. Um, I'm actually, I have done some work coding music. Yeah. I use Python uh, sure. for something I'm gonna present at the Michigan sure. IT Symposium okay. later this month. Um, one of the challenges I ran into is how do you actually code that? Um, what factors are you encoding? Uh, one of the pieces that I looked at was actually by Mozart, yeah. uh, his fantasy in D minor. Sure. And I just coded the frequent, uh, the, the pitch, the note, and then the duration and when it was all said and done, it sounded like an ice cream truck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what other features are you considering? People who do this kind of work fall into two camps. They're either working on popular music and then, then they really want to be working on sound files, or they tend to work on, naturally gravitate to working on sound files or sometimes MIDI files. Um, and people working on uh, you know, uh, concert repertory, European concert repertories who tend, who are likely to be music theorists and who then tend to be wanting to work on something that looks like a machine readable version of, of a musical score. Um, so we gravitate naturally towards symbolic data of that kind. Um, the two ways this is done, there's a, a, a kit uh, called Humdrum that David Huron developed many years ago at, at OSU. Those music theorists tend to like those humdrum files because they're basically just text files. You could, you could sight sing from them. Uh, you can read the file uh, and, and hear what the music sounds like if you know how to look at something and know what it sounds like and you know how humdrum works. It's basically a kind of tablature. So we like that. Um, you can't do that with music XML files. Um, you, you have to use something else to get it into a form you can read and we tend to like that less. But, they, but you can extract from an XML file uh, in Python the kinds of things we want. Most, so mostly, um, it, it really, the short answer is it really depends on what your question is. Um, for, the, for a question like this one, if I've got pitch including, inclu so I don't want MIDI because I lose enharmonic information, C sharp and D flat are the same thing in a MIDI file. I don't want to lose that. But I want, so I want note names, I want pitch height, I, so I don't want pitch class, I want, I want pitch. Uh, so middle C and, and the C above, an octave above it, I want to be different, not the same. Um, and I want, Duration, probably up to rhythmic duration. I want to know if it's a quarter note or, I want, or an eighth note or so on. Uh, and that's, that's probably enough for most of the questions I'm interested in asking. On the other hand, I have other colleagues who are interested in studying musical performance and are doing micro timings in, in sound files. And they want something different. So part, part of the problem in this, this work is figuring out what the, the best practices for encoding these things are so that someone else can use your, your, your digitized cor corpus that you've built. And that's often, you know, it's all over the map right now. Hi, I also really liked your talk. I do want to ask you about that slide that you lost over at the end, but I'm fascinated that someone would be in your field. <laughs> we, 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 get that, we get that a lot. We should get out well, more. Well, <laughs> I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about it. How does somebody folk who is obviously so into music also so into data science? I'm, I mean, I love it. I just want to understand more. Sure. Um, so I, I, as probably will have been painfully obvious uh, to many of you at various points in this, I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I go. Um, there's, uh, music theorists are, are an interestingly um, heterogeneous bunch. Um, we've got, there are people in the field, there's, there's a subfield of mathematical music theory which is often interested in, this comes out of uh, Milton Babbitt's work, some of you may know uh, some of Milton Babbitt's music, uh, American composer of the immediate post-war period and also a major figure in the, the history of the discipline in the United, the history of dis, the discipline of music theory in the United States. It turns out that um, uh, 
abstract algebra is really nice, nice for talking about patterns of that kind of music. So people, so the sorts of things that happen in, in a 12-tone composition are nicely captured by uh, actions of, of, of uh, the dihedral group of order 24. And there's that kind of, so there are people who do that. There are people who, who are really interested in, in music cognition and have, have backgrounds in, in uh, empirical psychology and things like that. And we all kind of get together and do the best we can learning from each other. My, I'm actually a historian of music theory, um, so I do things, you know, when I'm not doing this sort of, uh, to me this is a bit of a sideline, I kind of wanted to do it to see what we'd get. Um, what I usually do is, is sit down and read things like, like uh, Rameau's Traité de l'Harmonie and ask, well, what does Rameau mean by supposition? Uh, how does, uh, try to re sort of resurrect the, the conceptual world of these, these old theory books. Um, the field sometimes, so maybe one thing to say if the question is, is so uh, what on earth do music theorists do? Uh, a lot, lots of different things. Sometimes we look a lot like the English department. Part of what we might do is, is um, write analytical papers on Schubert songs that would look familiar to some, in, to some kinds of, 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 of critics over in the English departments. Sometimes we look a bit like the linguistics department. Uh, we're interested, we talk a lot about musical syntax, that's, that's obviously an analogy, rather, uh, but, but you, know, you can find music theory papers with tree, dry, tree diagrams in them. And Ray Jackendorf, the linguist, uh, co-authored with Fred Lerdahl, one of the foundational texts in that, that area. Um, sometimes we look a bit like the philology department, sometimes we look like the classicists, sometimes we look like, a bit like the art historians. Um, and those kinds of somewhat more humanistic projects are probably where the discipline in the U.S. anyway has largely been. But we also have a curious pedagogical uh, uh, role because part of our bread and butter, you know, I have a job at Michigan because Michigan has a great big conservatory that has a bunch of students who, who want to uh, play clarinet in an orchestra somewhere. And someone thought they should know some music theory too. Um, so f the connection is maybe not obvious. Maybe it's more obvious if you want to be a composer or you want to be um, uh, even a pianist. Um, so you know, if you're sitting in my sophomore class, partly what I'm doing is giving you chorale harmonies, uh, chorale melodies to harmonize, and teaching you how to do that in a way that'll make it sound like Bach. So there's also a kind of very practical. Uh, component to the discipline. And it sort of does all of these things, which I think anyway is one of the reasons it's kind of an interesting place to be. All right, so let's thank all the speakers again. And, and I guess if you have more questions, you can catch them during the reception. Jane, do you want to say more? All right, just a quick thing. Um, the reception is down the hall in the assembly hall, uh, starting about even about five minutes from now. Um, then um, all, all are welcome. There is um, alcoholic drinks will be served, and the bartender will card you guys. <laughs> all right, so uh, enjoy, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>